Chapter One of How I Found Livingstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingstone. By Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter One Introductory my instructions to find and relieve Livingstone. On the sixteenth day of October, in the year of our Lord, one thousand eight hundred and sixty-nine, I was in Madrid, fresh from the carnage at Valencia. At ten a.m. Jacopo, at number blank, Calle de la Cruz, handed me a telegram. It read, Come to Paris on important business. The telegram was from Mr. James Gordon Bennett, Jr., the young manager of the New York Herald. Down came my pictures from the walls of my apartments on the second floor. Into my trunks swept my books and souvenirs. My clothes were hastily collected, some half washed, some from the clothesline half dry, and after a couple of hours of hasty hard work, my portmanteaus were strapped up and labelled Paris. At three p.m. I was on my way, and being obliged to stop at Bayonne a few hours, did not arrive at Paris until the following night. I went straight to the Grand Hotel, and knocked at the door of Mr. Bennett's room. "'Come in,' I heard a voice say. Entering, I found Mr. Bennett in bed. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'My name is Stanley,' I answered. "'Ah, yes, sit down. I have important business on hand for you.' After throwing over his shoulders his robe de chambre, Mr. Bennett asked, "'Where do you think Livingstone is?' "'I really do not know, sir. "'Do you think he is alive?' "'He may be, and he may not be,' I answered. "'Well, I think he is alive, and that he can be found, "'and I am going to send you to find him.' "'What?' said I. "'Do you really think I can find Dr. Livingstone? "'Do you mean me to go to Central Africa?' "'Yes, I mean that you shall go and find him "'wherever you hear that he is, "'and to get what news of him you can, "'and perhaps, delivering himself thoughtfully and deliberately, the old man may be in want. Take enough with you to help him, should he require it. Of course you will act according to your own plans, and do what you think best. But find Livingstone, said I, wondering at the cool order of sending one to Central Africa to search for a man whom I, in common with almost all other men, believe to be dead. Have you considered seriously the great expense you are likely to incur on account of this little journey? What will it cost? he asked abruptly. Burke and Speke's journey to Central Africa cost between three thousand and five thousand pounds, and I fear it cannot be done under twenty-five hundred pounds. Well, I will tell you what you will do. Draw a thousand pounds now, and when you have gone through that, draw another thousand, and when that is spent, draw another thousand, and when you have finished that, draw another thousand, and so on, but find Livingstone. Surprised, but not confused at the order, for I knew that Mr. Bennett, when once he had made up his mind, was not easily drawn aside from his purpose, I yet thought, seeing it was such a gigantic scheme, that he had not quite considered in his own mind the pros and cons of the case. I said, I have heard that should your father die, you will sell the Herald and retire from business. Whoever told you that is wrong, for there is not money enough in New York City to buy the New York Herald. My father has made it a great paper, but I mean to make it greater. I mean that it shall be a newspaper in the true sense of the word. I mean that it shall publish whatever news will be interesting to the world, at no matter what cost. After that, said I, I have nothing more to say. Do you mean me to go straight on to Africa to search for Dr. Livingstone? No, I wish you to go to the inauguration of the Suez Canal first, and then proceed up the Nile. I hear Baker is about starting for Upper Egypt. Find out what you can about his expedition, and as you go up, describe as well as possible whatever is interesting for tourists, and then write up a guide, a practical one, for Lower Egypt. Tell us about whatever is worth seeing, and how to see it. Then you might as well go to Jerusalem. I hear Captain Warren is making some interesting discoveries there. Then visit Constantinople, and find out about that trouble between the Khedive and the Sultan. Then, let me see, you might as well visit the Crimea and those old battlegrounds, then go across the Caucasus to the Caspian Sea. I hear there is a Russian expedition bound for Kiva. From thence you may get through Persia to India. You could write an interesting letter from Persepolis. 
Baghdad will be close on your way to India. Suppose you go there and write up something about the Euphrates Valley Railway. Then, when you have come to India, you can go after Livingstone. Probably you will hear by that time that Livingstone is on his way to Zanzibar, but if not, go into the interior and find him. If alive, get what news of his discoveries you can, and if you find he is dead, bring all possible proofs of his being dead. That is all. Good night, and God be with you. Good night, sir, I said. What it is in the power of human nature to do, I will do, and on such an errand as I go upon, God will be with me. I lodged with young Edward King, who is making such a name in New England. He was just the man who would have delighted to tell the journal he was engaged upon, what young Mr. Bennett was doing, and what errand I was bound upon. I should have liked to exchange opinions with him upon the probable results of my journey, but I dared not do so. Though oppressed with the great task before me, I had to appear as if only going to be present at the Suez Canal. Young King followed me to the express train bound for Marseilles, and at the station we parted, he to go and read the newspapers at Bowles' reading room, I to Central Africa, and who knows? There is no need to recapitulate what I did before going to Central Africa. I went up the Nile and saw Mr. Higginbotham, chief engineer in Baker's expedition at Philae, and was the means of preventing a duel between him and a mad young Frenchman who wanted to fight Mr. Higginbotham with pistols, because that gentleman resented the idea of being taken for an Egyptian through wearing a fez cap. I had a talk with Captain Warren at Jerusalem, and descended one of the pits with a sergeant of engineers to see the marks of the Tyrian workmen on the foundation stones of the Temple of Solomon. I visited the mosques of Stambul with the minister resident of the United States and the American consul general. I travelled over the Crimean battlegrounds with King Lake's glorious books for reference in my hand. I dined with the widow of General Leprandi at Odessa. I saw the Arabian traveller Palgrave at Trebizond, and Baron Nicolay, the civil governor of the Caucasus, at Tiflis. I lived with the Russian ambassador while at Tehran, and wherever I went through Persia I received the most hospitable welcome from the gentlemen of the Indo-European Telegraph Company and following the examples of many illustrious men, I wrote my name upon one of the Persepolitan monuments. In the month of August, 1870, I arrived in India. On the 12th of October I sailed on the bark Polly from Bombay to Mauritius. As the Polly was a slow sailor, the passage lasted thirty-seven days. On board this bark was a William Lawrence Farquhar, hailing from Leith, Scotland, in the capacity of first mate. He was an excellent navigator, and thinking he might be useful to me, I employed him, his pay to begin from the date we should leave Zanzibar for Bergamayo. As there was no opportunity for getting to Zanzibar direct, I took ship to Seychelles. Three or four days after arriving at Mahi, one of the Seychelles group, I was fortunate enough to get a passage for myself, William Lawrence Farquhar, and an Arab boy from Jerusalem who was to act as interpreter, on board an American whaling vessel bound for Zanzibar, at which port we arrived on the 6th of January, 1871. I have skimmed over my travels thus far, because these do not concern the reader. They led over many lands, but this book is only a narrative of my search after Livingstone, the great African traveller. It is an Icarian flight of journalism, I confess. Some even have called it chaotic. But this is a word I can now refute, as will be seen before the reader arrives at the Fini. I have used the word soldiers in this book. The armed escort a traveller engages to accompany him into East Africa is composed of free black men, natives of Zanzibar, or freed slaves from the interior, who call themselves Askeri, an Indian name which translated means soldiers. They are armed and equipped like soldiers, though they engage themselves also as servants, but it would be more pretentious in me to call them servants than to use the word soldiers, and as I have been more in the habit of calling them soldiers than my Watuma, servants, this habit has proved too much to be overcome. I have therefore allowed the word soldiers to appear, accompanied, however, with this apology. But it must be remembered that I am writing a narrative of my own adventures and travels, and that until I meet Livingstone I presume the greatest interest is attached to myself, my marches, my troubles, my thoughts, and my expressions. 
yet though I may sometimes write my expedition, or my caravan, it by no means follows that I arrogate myself to this right. For it must be distinctly understood that it is the New York Herald's expedition, and that I am only charged with its command by Mr. James Gordon Bennett, the proprietor of the New York Herald, as a salaried employee of that gentleman. One thing more. I have adopted the narrative form of relating the story of the search, on account of the greater interest it appears to possess over the diary form, and I think that in this manner I avoid the great fault of repetition for which some travellers have been severely criticised. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of How I Found Livingston This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingston Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, Including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingston By Sir Henry M. Stanley Chapter 2 Zanzibar On the morning of the 6th January, 1871, we were sailing through the channel that separates the fruitful island of Zanzibar from Africa. The highlands of the continent loomed like the lengthening shadow in the grey of dawn. The island lay on our left, distant but a mile, coming out of its shroud of foggy folds, bit by bit as the day advanced, until it finally rose clearly into view, as fair in appearance as the fairest of the gems of creation. It appeared low, but not flat. There were gentle elevations cropping hither and yon above the languid but graceful tops of the cocoa trees that lined the margin of the island, and there were depressions visible at agreeable intervals, to indicate where a cool gloom might be found by those who sought relief from a hot sun, over which the sap-green water rolled itself with a constant murmur and moan, the island seemed buried under one deep stratum of verdure. The noble bosom of the strait bore several dows speeding in and out of the bay of Zanzibar with bellying sails. Towards the south, above the sea-line of the horizon, there appeared the naked masts of several large ships, and to the east of these a dense mass of white, flap-topped houses. This was Zanzibar, the capital of the island, which soon resolved itself into a pretty large and compact city, with all the characteristics of Arab architecture. Above some of the largest houses lining the bay-front of the city streamed the blood-red banner of the Sultan, Said Berghash, and the flags of the American, English, North German Confederation, and French consulates. In the harbour were thirteen large ships, four Zanzibar men-of-war, one English man-of-war, the Nymph, two American, one French, one Portuguese, two English, and two German merchantmen, besides numerous dows hailing from Johanna and Mayotte of the Comoro Islands, dows from Muscat and Kutch traders between India, the Persian Gulf, and Zanzibar. It was with the spirit of true hospitality and courtesy that Captain Francis R. Webb, United States Consul, formerly of the United States Navy, received me. Had this gentleman not rendered me such needful service, I must have condescended to take board and lodging at a house known as Charlie's, called after the proprietor, a Frenchman, who has won considerable local notoriety for harbouring penniless itinerants, and manifesting a kindly spirit always, though hidden under such a rugged front, or I should have been obliged to pitch my double-clothed American drill-tent on the sand-beach of this tropical island, which was by no means a desirable thing." But Captain Webb's opportune proposal to make his commodious and comfortable house my own, to enjoy myself, with the request that I would call for whatever I might require, obviated all unpleasant alternatives. One day's life at Zanzibar made me thoroughly conscious of my ignorance respecting African people and things in general. I imagined I had read Burton and Speak through fairly well, and that consequently I had penetrated the meaning, the full importance and grandeur, of the work I was about to be engaged upon. But my estimates, for instance, based upon book information, were simply ridiculous. Fanciful images of African attractions were soon dissipated, anticipated pleasures vanished, and all crude ideas began to resolve themselves into shape. I strolled through the city. My general impressions are of crooked, narrow lanes, whitewashed houses, mortar-plastered streets in the clean quarter, of seeing alcoves on each side, with deep recesses, with a foreground of red-turbaned banyans, and a background of flimsy cottons, prints, calicoes, domestics, and what not, or of floors crowded with ivory tusks, or of dark corners with a pile of unginned and loose cotton, or of stores of crockery, nails, cheap rummagen ware, tools, etc., in what I call the banyan quarter, 
of streets smelling very strong, in fact exceedingly malodorous, with steaming yellow and black bodies and woolly heads sitting at the doors of miserable huts, chatting, laughing, bargaining, scolding, with a compound smell of hides, tar, filth, and vegetable refuse, in the negro quarter, of streets lined with tall, solid-looking houses, flat-roofed, of great carved doors with large brass knockers, with bobs sitting cross-legged watching the dark entrance to their master's houses, of a shallow sea inlet, with some dows, canoes, canoes, boats, an odd steam-tub or two, leaning over on their sides in a sea of mud which the tide has just left behind it, of a place called Mazani Moya, one cocoa-tree, whither Europeans wend on evenings with most languid steps, to inhale the sweet air that glides over the sea, while the day is dying and the red sun is sinking westward, of a few graves of dead sailors, who paid the forfeit of their lives upon their arrival in this land, of a tall house wherein lives Dr. Tozor, missionary bishop of Central Africa, and his school of little Africans, and of many other things, which got together into such a tangle that I had to go to sleep, lest I should never be able to separate the moving images, the Arab from the African, the African from the Banyan, the Banyan from the Hindi, the Hindi from the European, etc. Zanzibar is the Baghdad, the Isafan, the Stambul, if you like, of East Africa. It is the great mart which invites the ivory traders from the African interior. To this market come the gum copal, the hides, the orchilla weed, the timber, and the black slaves from Africa. Baghdad had great silk bazaars, Zanzibar has her ivory bazaars. Baghdad once traded in jewels, Zanzibar trades in gum copal. Stambul imported Circassian and Georgian slaves. Zanzibar imports black beauties from Ihayao, Ugindi, Ugogo, Unyamwezi, and Gala. The same mode of commerce obtains here as in all Mohammedan countries. Nay, the mode was in vogue long before Moses was born. The Arab never changes. He brought the custom of his forefathers with him when he came to live on this island. He is as much of an Arab here as at Muscat or Baghdad. Wherever he goes to live he carries with him his harem, his religion, his long robe, his shirt, his slippers, and his dagger. If he penetrates Africa, not all the ridicule of the negroes can make him change his modes of life. Yet the land has not become oriental. The Arab has not been able to change the atmosphere. The land is semi-African in aspect. The city is but semi-Arabian. To a newcomer into Africa, the Muscat Arabs of Zanzibar are studies. There is a certain impressment about them which we must admire. They are mostly all travellers. There are but a few of them who have not been in many dangerous positions, as they penetrated Central Africa in search of the precious ivory, and their various experiences have given their features a certain unmistakable air of self-reliance, or of self-sufficiency. There is a calm, resolute, defiant, independent air about them, which wins unconsciously one's respect. The stories that some of these men could tell, I have often thought, would fill many a book of thrilling adventures. For the half-case I have great contempt. They are neither black nor white, neither good nor bad, neither to be admired nor hated. They are all things at all times, they are always fawning on the great Arabs, and always cruel to those unfortunates brought under their yoke. If I saw a miserable, half-starved negro, I was always sure to be told he belonged to a half-caste. Cringing and hypocritical, cowardly and debased, treacherous and mean, I have always found him. He seems to be forever ready to fall down and worship a rich Arab, but is relentless to a poor black slave. When he swears most, you may be sure he lies most, and yet this is the breed which is multiplied most at Zanzibar. The Banyan is a born trader, the beau ideal of a sharp money-making man. Money flows to his pockets as naturally as water down a steep. No pang of conscience will prevent him from cheating his fellow man. He excels a Jew, and his only rival in a market is a Farsi. An Arab is a babe to him. It is worth money to see him labor with all his energy, soul and body, to get advantage by the smallest fraction of a coin over a native. Possibly the native has a tusk, and it may weigh a couple of frazilas, but though the scales indicate the weight, and the native declares solemnly that it must be more than two frazilas, Yet our banyan will asservate and vow that the native knows nothing whatever about it, and that the scales are wrong. He musters up a courage to lift it. It is a mere song, not much more than a frisila. Come, he will say, close, man, take the money and go thy way. Art thou mad? If the native hesitates, he will scream in a fury. He pushes him about, spurns the ivory with contemptuous indifference. Never was such an ado about nothing. But, though he tells the astounded native to be up and going, he never intends the ivory shall leave his shop. 
the Banyans exercise, of all other classes, most influence on the trade of Central Africa. With the exception of a very few rich Arabs, almost all other traders are subject to the pains and penalties which usury imposes. A trader desirous to make a journey into the interior, whether for slaves or ivory, gum copal or orkila weed, proposes to a Banyan to advance him five thousand dollars, at a fifty, sixty, or seventy per cent interest. The Banyan is safe enough not to lose, whether the speculation the trader is engaged upon pays or not. An experienced trader seldom loses, or if he has been unfortunate, through no deed of his own, he does not lose credit. With the help of the Banyan he is easily set on his feet again. We will suppose for the sake of illustrating how trade with the interior is managed, that the Arab conveys by his caravan five thousand dollars worth of goods into the interior. At Unyamwebe the goods are worth ten thousand dollars, at Ujiji they are worth fifteen thousand dollars. They have trebled in price. Five doti, or seven dollars and fifty cents, will purchase a slave in the markets of Ujiji that will fetch in Zanzibar thirty dollars. Ordinary men-slaves may be purchased for six dollars, which would sell for twenty-five on the coast. We will say he purchases slaves to the full extent of his means, after deducting fifteen hundred dollars expenses of carriage to Ujiji and back, viz. three thousand five hundred dollars, the slaves, four hundred and sixty-four in number, at seven dollars and fifty per head, would realize thirteen thousand nine hundred and twenty at Zanzibar. Again, let us illustrate trade in ivory. A merchant takes five thousand dollars to Ujiji, and after deducting fifteen hundred dollars for expenses to Ujiji and back to Zanzibar, has still remaining thirty-five hundred in cloth and beads, with which he purchases ivory. At Ujiji ivory is bought at twenty dollars the frazilla, or thirty-five pounds, by which he is enabled, with thirty-five hundred dollars, to collect one hundred and seventy-five frazillas, which, if good ivory, is worth about sixty dollars per frazilla at Zanzibar. The merchant thus finds that he has realized ten thousand five hundred dollars net profit. Arab traders have often done better than this, but they almost always have come back with an enormous margin of profit. The next people to the Banyans in power in Zanzibar are the Mohammedan Hindis. Really, it has been a debatable subject in my mind whether the Hindis are not as wickedly determined to cheat in trade as the Banyans. But if I have conceded the palm to the latter, it has been done very reluctantly. This tribe of Indians can produce scores of unconscionable rascals where they can show but one honest merchant. One of the honestest among men, white or black, red or yellow, is a Mohammedan Hindi called Toria Topan. Amongst the Europeans at Zanzibar he has become a proverb for honesty and strict business integrity. He is enormously wealthy, owns several ships and dows, and is a prominent man in the councils of Said Berghash. Tarya has many children, two or three of whom are grown-up sons, whom he has reared up even as he is himself. But Tarya is but a representative of an exceedingly small minority. The Arabs, the Banyans, and the Mohammedan Hindis represent the higher and the middle classes. These classes own the estates, the ships, and the trade. To these classes bow the half-caste and the negro. The next most important people who go to make up the mixed population of this island are the negroes. They consist of the aborigines, Wasawahili, Somalis, Comorines, Wanyamwenze, and a host of tribal representatives of inner Africa. To a white stranger about penetrating Africa, it is a most interesting walk through the negro quarters of the Wanyamwenze and the Waswahili. For here he begins to learn the necessity of admitting that negroes are men, like himself, though of a different color, that they have passions and prejudices, likes and dislikes, sympathies and antipathies, tastes and feelings, in common with all human nature. The sooner he perceives this fact, and adapts himself accordingly, the easier will be his journey among the several races of the interior. The more plastic his nature, the more prosperous will be his travels. Though I had lived some time among the negroes of our southern states, my education was northern, and I had met in the United States black men whom I was proud to call friends. I was thus prepared to admit any black man, possessing the attributes of a true manhood or any good qualities, to my friendship even to a brotherhood with myself, and to respect him for such, as if he were of my own colour and race. Neither his colour, nor any peculiarities of physiognomy, should debar him with me from any rights he should fairly claim as a man. Have these men, these black savages from pagan Africa, I asked myself, the qualities which make man lovable among his fellows? Can these men, these barbarians, appreciate kindness or feel real resentment like myself? was my mental question as I travelled through their quarters and observed their actions. 
need I say that I was much comforted in observing that they were as ready to be influenced by passions, by loves and hates, as I was myself, that the keenest observation failed to detect any great difference between their nature and my own? The negroes of the island probably number two-thirds of the entire population. They compose the working class, whether enslaved or free. Those enslaved perform the work required on the plantations, the estates and gardens of the landed proprietors, or perform the work of carriers, whether in the country or in the city. Outside the city they may be seen carrying huge loads on their heads, as happy as possible, not because they are kindly treated, or that their work is light, but because it is their nature to be gay and light-hearted, because they have conceived neither joys nor hopes which may not be gratified at will, nor cherished any ambition beyond their reach, and therefore have not been baffled in their hopes, nor known disappointment. Within the city, negro carriers may be heard at all hours, in couples, engaged in the transportation of clove-bags, boxes of merchandise, etc., from store to go down, and from go down to the beach, singing a kind of monotone chant for the encouragement of each other, and for the guiding of their pace as they shuffle through the streets with bare feet. You may recognize these men readily, before long, as old acquaintances, by the consistency with which they sing the tunes they have adopted. Several times during a day I have heard the same couple pass beneath the windows of the consulate, delivering themselves of the same invariable tune and words. Some might possibly deem the songs foolish and silly, but they had a certain attraction for me, and I considered that they were as useful as anything else for the purposes that they were intended. The town of Zanzibar, situate on the southwestern shore of the island, contains a population of nearly one hundred thousand inhabitants. That of the island altogether I would estimate at not more than two hundred thousand inhabitants, including all races. The greatest number of foreign vessels trading with this port are American, principally from New York and Salem. After the American come the German, then come the French and English. They arrive loaded with American sheeting, brandy, gunpowder, muskets, beads, English cotton, brass wire, china ware, and other notions, and depart with ivory, gum copal, cloves, hides, cowries, sesamum, pepper, and coconut oil. The value of the exports from this port is estimated at three million dollars, and the imports from all countries at three million five hundred thousand dollars. The Europeans and Americans residing in the town of Zanzibar are either government officials, independent merchants, or agents for a few great mercantile houses in Europe and America. The climate of Zanzibar is not the most agreeable in the world. I have heard Americans and Europeans condemn it most heartily. I have also seen nearly one half of the white colony laid up in one day from sickness. A noxious malaria is exhaled from the shallow inlet of Malagash, and the undrained filth, the garbage, offal, dead mollusks, dead pariah dogs, dead cats, all species of carrion, remains of men and beasts unburied, assist to make Zanzibar a most unhealthy city, and considering that it ought to be most healthy, nature having pointed out to man the means, and having assisted him so far, it is most wonderful that the ruling prince does not obey the dictates of reason." The Bay of Zanzibar is in the form of a crescent, and on the southwestern horn of it is built the city. On the east, Zanzibar is bounded almost entirely by the Malagash Lagoon, an inlet of the sea. It penetrates to at least two hundred and fifty yards of the sea behind or south of Shangani Point. Were these two hundred and fifty yards cut through by a ten-foot ditch, and the inlet deepened slightly, Zanzibar would become an island of itself, and what wonders would it not affect to health and salubrity? I have never heard this suggestion made, but it struck me that the foreign consuls resident at Zanzibar might suggest this work to the Sultan, and so get the credit of having made it as healthy a place to live in as any near the equator. But apropos of this, I remember what Captain Webb, the American consul, told me on my first arrival, when I expressed to him my wonder at the apathy and inertness of men born with the indomitable energy which characterizes Europeans and Americans, of men imbued with the progressive and stirring instincts of the white people, who yet allow themselves to dwindle into pallid phantoms of their kind, into hypochondriacal invalids, into hopeless believers in the deadliness of the climate, with hardly a trace of that daring and invincible spirit which rules the world. "'Oh,' said Captain Webb, "'it is all very well for you to talk about energy, and all that kind of thing. But I assure you that a residence of four or five years on this island, among such people as are here, would make you feel that it was a hopeless task to resist the influence of the example by which the most energetic spirits are subdued, and to which they must submit a time, sooner or later. 
We were all terribly energetic when we first came here, and struggled bravely to make things go on as we were accustomed to have them at home. But we have found that we were knocking our heads against granite walls to no purpose whatever. These fellows, the Arabs, the Banyans, and the Hindis, you can't make them go faster by ever so much scolding and praying, and in a very short time you see the folly of fighting against the unconquerable. Be patient, and don't fret. That is my advice, or you won't live long here." There were three or four intensely busy men, though at Zanzibar, who were out at all hours of the day. I know one, an American, I fancy I hear the quick pit-pat of his feet on the pavement beneath the consulate, his cheery voice ringing the salutation, Yambo, to every one he met, and he had lived at Zanzibar twelve years. I know another, one of the sturdiest of Scotchmen, a most pleasant-mannered and unaffected man, sincere in whatever he did or said, who has lived at Zanzibar several years, subject to the infructuosities of the business he has been engaged in, as well as to the calor and ennui of the climate, who yet presents as formidable a front as ever to the apathetic native of Zanzibar. No man can charge Captain H. C. Fraser, formerly of the Indian Navy, with being apathetic. I might with ease give evidence of the industry of others, but they are all my friends, and they are all good. The American, English, German, and French residents have ever treated me with a courtesy and kindness I am not disposed to forget. Taken as a body, it would be hard to find a more generous or hospitable colony of white men in any part of the world. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of How I Found Livingstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone by Sir Henry M. Stanley Chapter 3. Organization of the Expedition I was totally ignorant of the interior, and it was difficult at first to know what I needed in order to take an expedition into Central Africa. Time was precious also, and much of it could not be devoted to inquiry and investigation. In a case like this, it would have been a godsend, I thought, had either of the three gentlemen, Captains Burton, Speak, or Grant, given some information on these points, had they devoted a chapter upon how to get ready for an expedition for Central Africa. The purpose of this chapter, then, is to relate how I said about it, that other travellers coming after me may have the benefit of my experience. These are some of the questions I asked myself as I tossed on my bed at night. How much money is required? How many pagazis or carriers? How many soldiers? How much cloth? How many beads? How much wire? What kinds of cloth are required for the different tribes? Ever so many questions to myself brought me no clearer the exact point I wished to arrive at. I scribbled over scores of sheets of paper, made estimates, drew out lists of material, calculated the cost of keeping one hundred men for one year, at so many yards of different kinds of cloth, etc. I studied Burton, Speak, and Grant in vain. A good deal of geographical, ethnological, and other information appertaining to the study of Inner Africa was obtainable, but information respecting the organization of an expedition requisite before proceeding to Africa was not in any book. The Europeans at Zanzibar knew as little as possible about this particular point. There was not one white man at Zanzibar who could tell how many dotis a day a force of one hundred men required to buy food for one day on the road. Neither, indeed, was it their business to know but what should I do at all? This was a grand question. I decided it were best to hunt up an Arab merchant, who had been engaged in the ivory trade, or who was fresh from the interior. Sheikh Hasid was a man of note and of wealth in Zanzibar. He himself dispatched several caravans into the interior, and was necessarily acquainted with several prominent traders who came to his house to gossip about their adventures and gains. He was also the proprietor of the large house Captain Webb occupied, Besides, he lived across the narrow street, which separated his house from the consulate. Of all men, Sheikh Hashid was the man to be consulted, and he was accordingly invited to visit me at the consulate. From the grey-bearded and venerable-looking Sheikh, I elicited more information about African currency, the mode of procedure, the quantity and quality of stuffs I required, than I had obtained from three months' study of books upon Central Africa, and from other Arab merchants to whom the ancient Sheikh introduced me. I received most valuable suggestions and hints, which enabled me at last to organize an expedition. The reader must bear in mind that a traveler requires only that which is sufficient for travel and exploration, 
that a superfluity of goods or means will prove as fatal to him as poverty of supplies. It is on this question of quality and quantity that the traveller has first to exercise his judgment and discretion. My informants gave me to understand that for one hundred men ten doti, or forty yards of cloth per diem, would suffice for food. The proper course to pursue, I found, was to purchase two thousand doti of American sheeting, one thousand doti of kaniki, and six hundred and fifty doti of the coloured cloths, such as brosati, a great favourite in the Unamwezi, Sahari, taken in Ugogo, Ishmahili, Tajiri, Joho, Shas, Rahani, Jamdini, or Kanguru Kutch, blue and pink. These were deemed amply sufficient for the subsistence of one hundred men for twelve months. Two years at this rate would require four thousand doti equal to sixteen thousand yards of American sheeting, two thousand doti equal to eight thousand yards of kaniki, one thousand three hundred doti equal to five thousand two hundred yards of mixed colored cloths. This was definite and valuable information to me, and excepting the lack of some suggestions as to the quality of the sheeting, kaniki and colored cloths, I had obtained all I desired upon this point. Second in importance to the amount of cloth required was the quantity and quality of the beads necessary. Beads, I was told, took the place of cloth currency among some tribes of the interior. One tribe preferred white to black beads, brown to yellow, red to green, green to white, and so on. Thus, in Unhamwezi, red, sami-sami beads would readily be taken, where all other kinds would be refused. Black, bubu beads, though currency in Ugogo, were positively worthless with all other tribes. The egg, sungumasi beads, though valuable in Ujiji and Ugaha, would be refused in all other countries. The white, Marikani beads, though good in Ufipa and some parts of Usagara and Ugogo, would certainly be despised in Usaguha and Uganango. Such being the case, I was obliged to study closely and calculate the probable stay of an expedition in the several countries, so as to be sure to provide a sufficiency of each kind, and guard against any great overplus. Burton and Speke, for instance, were obliged to throw away as worthless several hundred fundo of beads. For example, supposing the several nations of Europe had each its own currency, without the means of exchange, and supposing a man was about to travel through Europe on foot, before starting he would be apt to calculate how many days it would take him to travel through France, how many through Prussia, Austria, and Russia, then to reckon the expense he would be likely to incur per day. If the expense be set down at a Napoleon per day, and his journey through France would occupy thirty days, the sum required for going and returning might be properly set down at sixty Napoleons, in which case, Napoleons not being current money in Prussia, Austria, or Russia, it would be utterly useless for him to burden himself with the weight of a couple thousand Napoleons in gold. My anxiety on this point was most excruciating. Over and over I studied the hard names and measures, conned again and again the polysyllables, hoping to be able to arrive some time at an intelligible definition of the terms. I revolved in my mind the words Muganguro, Gulabio, Sungomazi, Kadanduguru, Matunda, Sami Sami, Bubu, Merikani, Hafta, Lunghio Riga, and Lakio, until I was fairly beside myself. Finally, however, I came to the conclusion that if I reckoned my requirements at fifty kahit or five fundo per day for two years, and if I purchased only eleven varieties, I might consider myself safe enough. The purchase was accordingly made, and twenty-two sacks of the best species were packed and brought to Captain Webb's house, ready for transportation to Bagamoyo. After the beads came the wire question. I discovered, after considerable trouble, that numbers five and six, almost the thickness of telegraph wire, were considered the best numbers for trading purposes. While beads stand for copper coins in Africa, cloth measures for silver, wire is reckoned as gold in the countries beyond the Tanganyika. Ten frashala, or three hundred and fifty pounds, of brass wire, my Arab adviser thought, would be ample. Having purchased the cloth, the beads, and the wire, it was with no little pride that I surveyed the comely bales and packages lying piled up, row above row, in Captain Webb's capacious storeroom. Yet my work was not ended, it was but beginning. There were provisions, cooking utensils, boats, rope, twine, tents, donkeys, saddles, bagging, canvas, tar, needles, tools, ammunition, guns, equipments, hatchets, medicines, bedding, presents for chiefs, in short a thousand things not yet purchased. The ordeal of chaffering and haggling with steel-hearted banyans, Hindis, Arabs, and half-castes was most trying. 
For instance, I purchased twenty-two donkeys at Zanzibar. Forty and fifty dollars were asked, which I had to reduce to fifteen or twenty dollars by an infinite amount of argument, worthy, I think, of a nobler cause. As was my experience with the ass-dealers, so it was with the petty merchants. Even a paper of pins was not purchased without a five per cent reduction from the price demanded, involving, of course, a loss of time and patience. After collecting the donkeys, I discovered there were no pack-saddles to be obtained in Zanzibar. Donkeys without pack-saddles were of no use whatever. I invented a saddle to be manufactured by myself and my white man, Farquhar, wholly from canvas, rope, and cotton. Three or four frasillas of cotton and ten bolts of canvas were required for the saddles. A specimen saddle was made by myself in order to test its efficiency. A donkey was taken and saddled, and a load of 140 pounds was fastened to it. And though the animal, a wild creature of Onyamwesi, struggled and reared frantically, not a particle gave way. After this experiment, Farquhar was set to work to manufacture twenty-one more after the same pattern. Woolen pads were also purchased to protect the animals from being galled. It ought to be mentioned here, perhaps, that the idea of such a saddle as I manufactured was first derived from the Otago saddle, in use among the transport trains of the English army in Abyssinia. A man named John William Shaw, a native of London, England, lately third mate of the American ship Nevada, applied to me for work. Though his discharge from the Nevada was rather suspicious, yet he possessed all the requirements of such a man as I needed, and was an experienced hand with the palm and needle, could cut canvas to fit anything, was a pretty good navigator, ready and willing, so far as his professions went. I saw no reason to refuse his services, and he was accordingly engaged, at three hundred dollars per annum, to rank second to William L. Farquhar. Farquhar was a capital navigator and excellent mathematician, was strong, energetic, and clever. The next thing I was engaged upon was to enlist, arm, and equip a faithful escort of twenty men for the road. Jahari, the chief dragoman of the American consulate, informed me that he knew where certain of Speke's faithfuls were yet to be found. The idea had struck me before that if I could obtain the services of a few men acquainted with the ways of white men, and who could induce other good men to join the expedition I was organizing, I might consider myself fortunate. More especially had I thought of Sidi Mubarak Mumbai, commonly called Bombay, who, though his head was woodeny and his hands clumsy, was considered to be the faithfulest of the faithfuls. With the aid of the dragoman Jahari, I secured in a few hours the services of Ulidi, Captain Grant's former valet, Ulamengo, Barudi, Ambari, Mabruki, Munyi Mabruki, bull-headed Mabruki, Captain Burton's former unhappy valet, five of Speke's faithfuls. When I asked them if they were willing to join another white man's expeditions to Ujiji, they replied very readily that they were willing to join any brother of Speke's. Dr. John Kirk, Her Majesty's Counsel at Zanzibar, who was present, told him that though I was no brother of Speke's, I spoke his language. This distinction mattered little to them, and I heard them, with great delight, declare their readiness to go anywhere with me, or to do anything I wished. Mombay, as they called him, or Bombay, as we know him, had gone to Pemba, an island lying north of Zanzibar. Ulidi was sure Mombay would jump with joy at the prospect of another expedition. Jahari was therefore commissioned to write to him at Pemba, to inform him of the good fortune in store for him. On the fourth morning after the letter had been dispatched, the famous Bombay made his appearance, followed in decent order and due rank by the faithfuls of Speak. I looked in vain for the woodeny head and alligator teeth with which his former master had endowed him. I saw a slender short man of fifty or thereabouts, with a grizzled head, an uncommonly high narrow forehead, with a very large mouth showing teeth very irregular and wide apart. An ugly rent in the upper front row of Bombay's teeth was made with the clenched fist of Captain Speak in Uganda, when his master's patience was worn out, and prompt punishment became necessary. That Captain Speak had spoiled him with kindness was evident, from the fact that Bombay had the audacity to stand up for a boxing match with him. But these things I only found out when, months afterwards, I was called upon to administer punishment to him myself but at his first appearance I was favorably impressed with Bombay, though his face was rugged, his mouth large, his eyes small, and his nose flat. "'Salam alikikam,' were the words he greeted me with. "'Alikikam salam,' I replied, with all the gravity I could muster. I then informed him I required him as captain of my soldiers to Ujiji. His reply was that he was ready to do whatever I told him, go wherever I like, in short, be a pattern to servants and a model to soldiers. 
he hoped I would give him a uniform and a good gun, both of which were promised. Upon inquiring for the rest of the faithfuls who accompanied Speak into Egypt, I was told that at Zanzibar there were but six. Faraji, Maktab, Sadiq, Sanguru, Manyu, Matajari, Makata, and Almas were dead. Ulidi and Matamani were in Anyanyembi, Hassan had gone to Kilwa, and Farahan was supposed to be in Ujiji. Out of the six faithfuls, each of whom still retained his medal for assisting in the discovery of the sources of the Nile, one, poor Mabruki, had met with a sad misfortune, which I feared would incapacitate him from active usefulness. Mabruki, the bull-headed, owned a shamba, or a house with a garden attached to it, of which he was very proud. Close to him lived a neighbor in similar circumstances, who was a soldier of Said Majid, with whom Mabruki, who was of a quarrelsome disposition, had a feud, which culminated in the soldier inducing two or three of his comrades to assist him in punishing the malevolent Mabruki, and this was done in a manner that only the heart of an African could conceive. They tied the unfortunate fellow by his wrist to a branch of a tree, and after indulging their brutal appetite for revenge in torturing him, left him to hang in that position for two days. At the expiration of the second day he was accidentally discovered in a most pitiable condition. His hands had swollen to an immense size, and the veins of one hand had been ruptured. He had lost its use. It is needless to say that, when the affair came to Said Majid's ears, the miscreants were severely punished. Dr. Kirk, who attended the poor fellow, succeeded in restoring one hand to something of a semblance of its former shape, but the other hand is sadly marred, and its former usefulness gone forever. However, I engaged Mabruki, despite his deformed hands, his ugliness and vanity, because he was one of Speke's faithfuls. For if he but wagged his tongue in my service, kept his eyes open, and opened his mouth at the proper time, I assured myself I could make him useful. Bombay, my captain of escort, succeeded in getting eighteen more free men to volunteer as Oscari, soldiers, men whom he knew would not desert, and for whom he declared himself responsible. They were an exceedingly fine-looking body of men, far more intelligent in appearance than I could ever have believed African barbarians could be. They hailed principally from Yuhuyo, others from Unamwisi, some came from Yusaguha and Yugindo. Their wages were set down at thirty-six dollars each man per annum, or three dollars each per month. Each soldier was provided with a flintlock musket, powder horn, bullet pouch, knife, and hatchet, besides enough powder and ball for two hundred rounds. Bombay, in consideration of his rank and previous faithful services to Burton, Speak, and Grant, was engaged at eighty dollars a year, half that sum in advance. A good muzzle-loading rifle besides a pistol, knife, and hatchet were given to him, while the other five faithfuls, Ambari, Mabruki, Ulamengo, Baruti, and Yulida were engaged at forty dollars a year, with proper equipments as soldiers. Having studied fairly well all the East African travelers' books regarding Eastern and Central Africa, my mind had conceived the difficulties which would present themselves during the prosecution of my search after Dr. Livingstone. To obviate all of these, as well as human wit could suggest, was my constant thought and aim. Shall I permit myself, while looking from Ujiji over the waters of the Tanganyika Lake to the other side, to be balked on the threshold of success by the insolence of a King Kanina, or the caprice of a Hamid bin Sulayam? was a question I asked myself. To guard against such a contingency, I determined to carry my own boats. Then, I thought, if I hear of Livingstone being on the Tanganyika, I can launch my boat and proceed after him. I procured one large boat, capable of carrying twenty persons, with stores and goods sufficient for a cruise from the American consul for the sum of eighty dollars, and a smaller one from another American gentleman for forty dollars. The latter would hold comfortably six men with suitable stores. I did not intend to carry the boats whole or bodily, but to strip them of their boards and carry the timbers and thwarts only. As a substitute for the boards I proposed to cover each boat with a double canvas skin well tarred. The work of stripping them and taking them to pieces fell to me. This little job occupied me five days. I also packed them up for the pagazis. Each load was carefully weighed, and none exceeded sixty-eight pounds in weight. John Shaw excelled himself in the workmanship displayed on the canvas boats. When finished, they fitted their frames admirably. The canvas, six bolts of English hemp number three, was procured from Ludha Damji, who furnished it from the Sultan's storeroom. An insuperable obstacle to rapid transit in Africa is the want of carriers and as speed was the main object of the expedition under my command, 
my duty was to lessen this difficulty as much as possible. My carriers could only be engaged after arriving at Bagamoyo on the mainland. I had over twenty good donkeys ready, and I thought a cart adapted for the footpaths of Africa might prove an advantage. Accordingly, I had a cart constructed, eighteen inches wide and five feet long, supplied with two four-wheels of a light American wagon, more for the purpose of conveying the narrow ammunition boxes. I estimated that if a donkey could carry to Yunanyembe a load of four frezzolas, or one hundred forty pounds, he ought to be able to draw eight frezzolas on such a cart, which would be equal to the carrying capacity of four stout pagasis or carriers. Events will prove how my theories were borne out in practice. When my purchases were completed, and I beheld them piled up, tier after tier, row upon row, here a mass of cooking utensils, there bundles of rope, tents, saddles, a pile of portmanteaus and boxes, containing every imaginable thing, I confess I was rather abashed at my own temerity. Here were at least six tons of material. How will it ever be possible, I thought, to move all this inert mass across the wilderness stretching between the sea and the great lakes of Africa? Bah! Cast all doubts away, man, and have at them. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof, without borrowing from the morrow. The traveller must needs make his way into the African interior after a fashion very different from that to which he has been accustomed in other countries. He requires to take with him just what a ship must have when about to sail on a long voyage. He must have his slop chest, his little store of canned dainties, and his medicines, besides which he must have enough guns, powder, and ball to be able to make a series of good fights if necessary. He must have men to convey these miscellaneous articles, and as a man's maximum load does not exceed seventy pounds, to convey eleven thousand pounds requires nearly one hundred and sixty men. Europe and the Orient, even Arabia and Turkestan, have royal ways of travelling compared to Africa. Specie is received in all those countries by which a traveller may carry his means about him on his own person. Eastern and Central Africa, however, demand a necklace instead of a cent. Two yards of American sheeting instead of half a dollar or a florin, and a contindy of thick brass wire in place of a gold piece. The African traveller can hire neither wagons nor camels, neither horses nor mules, to proceed with him into the interior. His means of conveyance are limited to black and naked men, who demand at least fifteen dollars a head for every seventy pounds weight carried only as far as Yuhanyembe. One thing amongst others my predecessors omitted to inform men bound for Africa, which is of importance, and that is, that no traveller should ever think of coming to Zanzibar with his money in any other shape than gold coin. Letters of credit, circular notes, and such civilized things I have found to be a century ahead of Zanzibar people. Twenty and twenty-five cents deducted out of every dollar I drew on paper is one of the unpleasant, if not unpleasantest, things I have committed to lasting memory. For Zanzibar is a spot far removed from all avenues of European commerce, and coin is at a high premium. A man may talk and entreat, but though he may have drafts, checks, circular notes, letters of credit, a carte blanche to get what he wants, out of every dollar must be deducted twenty-five and thirty cents, so I was told, and so was my experience. What a pity there is no branch bank here! I had intended to have gone into Africa incognito. But the fact that a white man, even an American, was about to enter Africa was soon known all over Zanzibar. This fact was repeated a thousand times in the streets, proclaimed in all the shop alcoves, and at the custom house. The native bazaar laid hold of it, and agitated it day and night until my departure. The foreigners, including the Europeans, wished to know the pros and cons of my coming in and going out. My answer to all questions, pertinent and impertinent, was, I am going to Africa, Though my card bore the words, Henry M. Stanley, New York Herald, very few, I believe, ever coupled the words, New York Herald, with a search after Dr. Livingstone. It was not my fault, was it? Ah, me! What hard work it is to start an expedition alone! What with hurrying through the baking heat of the fierce, relentless sun from shop to shop, strengthening myself with far-reaching and enduring patience for the haggling contest with the livid-faced Hindi, summoning courage and wit to browbeat the villainous Goanese, and matched the foxy banyan, talking volumes throughout the day, correcting estimates, making up accounts, superintending the delivery of purchased articles, measuring and weighing them, to see that everything was of full measure and weight, overseeing the white men, Fakahar and Shaw, who were busy on donkey saddles, sails, tents, and boats for the expedition, I felt, when the day was over, 
as though limbs and brain well deserved their rest. Such labors were mine unremittingly for a month. Having bartered drafts on Mr. James Gordon Bennett to the amount of several thousand dollars for cloth, beads, wire, donkeys, and a thousand necessaries, having advanced pay to the white men and black escort of the expedition, having fretted Captain Webb and his family more than enough with the din of preparation, and filled his house with my goods, there was nothing further to do but to leave my formal adieus with the Europeans, and thank the Sultan and those gentlemen who had assisted me, before embarking for Bagamoyo. The day before my departure from Sanzibar, the American consul, having just habited himself in his black coat, and taking with him an extra black hat, in order to be in state apparel, proceeded with me to the Sultan's palace. The prince had been generous to me. He had presented me with an Arab horse, had furnished me with letters of introduction to his agents, his chief men, and representatives in the interior, and in many other ways had shown himself well disposed towards me. The palace is a large, roomy, lofty square house, close to the fort, built of coral, and plastered thickly with lime mortar. In appearance it is half Arabic and half Italian. The shutters are Venetian blinds painted a vivid green, and presenting a striking contrast to the whitewashed walls. Before the great, lofty, wide door were ranged in two crescents, several Baluk and Persian mercenaries, armed with curved swords and targes of rhinoceros hide. Their dress consisted of a muddy white cotton shirt reaching to the ankles, girdled with a leather belt thickly studded with silver bosses. As we came in sight a signal was passed to some person inside the entrance. When within twenty yards of the door, the sultan, who was standing waiting, came down the steps, and passing through the ranks advanced toward us, with his right hand stretched out and a genial smile of welcome on his face. On our side we raised our hats and shook hands with him, after which, doing according as he bade us, we passed forward and arrived on the highest step near the entrance door. He pointed forward, we bowed and arrived at the foot of an unpainted and narrow staircase, to turn once more to the sultan. The consul, I perceived, was ascending sideways, a mode of progression which I saw was intended for a compromise with decency and dignity. At the top of the stairs we waited, with our faces towards the upcoming prince. Again we were waved magnanimously forward, for before us was the reception hall and throne room. I noticed as I marched forward to the furthest end that the room was high and painted in the Arabic style, that the carpet was thick and of Persian fabric, that the furniture consisted of a dozen gilt chairs and a chandelier. We were seated. Ludha Damshi, the Banyan collector of customs, a venerable-looking old man, with a shrewd, intelligent face, sat on the right of the sultan. Next to him was the great Mohammedan merchant, Tarya Tapan, who had come to be present at the interview, not only because he was one of the counsellors of his highness, but because he also took a lively interest in this American expedition. Opposite to Ludha sat Captain Webb, and next to him I was seated, opposite Tarya Tapan. The sultan sat in a gilt chair between the Americans and the counsellors. Jahari the dragoman stood humbly before the sultan, expectant and ready to interpret what we had to communicate to the prince. The sultan, so far as dress goes, might be taken for a Mingrelian gentleman, excepting, indeed, for the turban, whose ample folds in alternate colors of red, yellow, brown, and white encircled his head. His long robe was of dark cloth, cinctured round the waist with his rich sword-belt, from which was suspended a gold-hilted scimitar, encased in a scabbard also enriched with gold. His legs and feet were bare, and had a ponderous look about them, since he suffered from that strange curse of Zanzibar, elephantiasis. His feet were slipped into a pair of wada, Arabic for slippers, with thick soles and a strong leathern band over the instep. His light complexion and his correct features, which are intelligent and regular, bespeak the Arab patrician. They indicate, however, nothing except his high descent and blood. No traits of character are visible, unless there is just a trace of amiability, and perfect contentment with himself and all around. Such is Prince, or Sayed Burgash, Sultan of Zanzibar and Pemba, and the east coast of Africa, from Somaliland to the Mozambique, as he appeared to me. Coffee was served in cups supported by golden finjas, also some coconut milk, and rich sweet sherbet. The conversation began with the question addressed to the Council. Are you well? Council. Yes, thank you. How is His Highness? Highness, quite well. Highness to me, are you well? Answer, quite well, thanks. The council now introduces business, 
and questions about my travels follow from his highness how do you like persia have you seen karbela baghdad messer stamboul have the turks many soldiers how many has persia is persia fertile how do you like zanzibar having answered each question to his highness's satisfaction he handed me letters of introduction to his officers at bagamoyo and kaoli and a general introductory letter to all arab merchants whom i might meet on the road and concluded his remarks to me with the expressed hope that on whatever mission i was bound i should be perfectly successful we bowed ourselves out of his presence in much the same manner that we had bowed ourselves in he accompanying us to the great entrance door mr goodhue of salem an american merchant long resident in zanzibar presented me as i gave him my adieu with a blooded bay horse imported from the cape of good hope and worth at least at zanzibar five hundred dollars february four by the fourth of february twenty-eight days from the date of my arrival at zanzibar the organization and equipment of the new york herald expedition was complete tents and saddles had been manufactured boats and sails were ready the donkeys brayed and the horses neighed impatiently for the road etiquette demanded that i should once more present my card to the european and american consuls at zanzibar and the word farewell was said to everybody on the fifth day four dows were anchored before the american consulate into one were lifted the two horses into two others the donkeys into the fourth the largest the black escort and bulky monies of the expedition a little before noon we set sail the american flag a present to the expedition by that kind-hearted lady mrs webb was raised to the masthead the consul his lady and exuberant little children mary and charlie were on the housetop waving the starry banner hats and handkerchiefs a token of farewell to me and mine happy people and good may their course and ours be prosperous and may god's blessing rest on us all end of chapter three chapter four part one of how i found livingstone this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by tim mckenzie how i found livingstone Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 4, Part 1. Life at Bagamoyo The Isle of Zanzibar, with its groves of coconut, mango, clove, and cinnamon, and its sentinel islets of chumbi and French, with its whitewashed city and jackfruit odour, with its harbour and ships that tread the deep, faded slowly from view, and looking westward, the African continent rose, a similar bank of green verdure to that which had just receded till it was a mere sinuous line above the horizon, looming in a northerly direction to the sublimity of a mountain chain. The distance across from Zanzibar to Bagamoyo may be about twenty-five miles, yet it took the dull and lazy dows ten hours before they dropped anchor on the top of the coral reef plainly visible a few feet below the surface of the water within a hundred yards of the beach the newly enlisted soldiers fond of noise and excitement discharged repeated salvos by way of a salute to the mixed crowd of arabs bunyans and wasawahili who stood on the beach to receive the musungu white man which they did with a general stare and a chorus of Yambo Bana, how are you, master? In our own land, the meeting with a large crowd is rather a tedious operation, as our independent citizens insist on an interlacing of fingers and a vigorous shaking thereof before their pride is satisfied and the peaceful manifestation endorsed. But on this beach, well lined with spectators, a response of Yambo Bana sufficed except with one who of all there was acknowledged the greatest and who claiming like all great men individual attention came forward to exchange another yambo on his own behalf and to shake hands this personage with a long trailing turban was jemadar esau commander of the zanzibar force of soldiers police or baluch gendarmes stationed at bagamoyo 
He had accompanied Speke and Grant a good distance into the interior, and they had rewarded him liberally. He took upon himself the responsibility of assisting in the debarkation of the expedition, and unworthy as was his appearance, disgraceful as he was in his filth, I here commend him for his influence over the rabble to all future East African travellers. Foremost among those who welcomed us was a father of the Society of Saint-Esprit, who, with other Jesuits, under Father Superior Horner, have established a missionary post of considerable influence and merit at Bagamoyo. We were invited to partake of the hospitality of the mission, to take our meals there, and, should we desire it, to pitch our camp on their grounds. But however strong the geniality of the welcome and sincere the heartiness of the invitation, I am one of those who prefer independence to dependence, if it is possible. Besides, my sense of the obligation between host and guest had just had a fine edge put upon it by the delicate forbearance of my kind host at Zanzibar, who had betrayed no sign of impatience at the trouble I was only too conscious of having caused him. I therefore informed the hospitable padre that only for one night could I suffer myself to be enticed from my camp. I selected a house near the western outskirts of the town, where there is a large open square through which the road from Unyayembe enters. Had I been at Bagamoyo a month, I could not have bettered my location. My tents were pitched fronting the tembe, house I had chosen, enclosing a small square where business could be transacted, bales looked over, examined and marked, free from the intrusion of curious sightseers. After driving the twenty-seven animals of the expedition into the enclosure in the rear of the house, storing the bales of goods, and placing a cordon of soldiers round, I proceeded to the Jesuit mission, to a late dinner, being tired and ravenous, leaving the newly formed camp in charge of the white men and Captain Bombay. The mission is distant from the town a good half-mile, to the north of it. It is quite a village of itself, numbering some fifteen or sixteen houses. There are more than ten padres engaged in the establishment, and as many sisters, and all find plenty of occupation in inducing from native crania the fire of intelligence. Truth compels me to state that they are very successful, having over two hundred pupils, boys and girls, in the mission, and, from the youngest to the oldest, they show the impress of the useful education they have received. The dinner furnished to the padres and their guests consisted of as many plates as a first-class hotel in Paris usually supplies, and cooked with nearly as much skill, though the surroundings were by no means equal. I feel assured also that the padres, besides being tasteful in their potages and entrees, do not stultify their ideas for lack of that element which Horace, Hafiz, and Byron have praised so much. The champagne, think of Champagne Clicquot in East Africa. Lafitte, La Rose, Burgundy, and Bordeaux were of first-rate quality, and the meek and lowly eyes of the fathers were not a little brightened under the vinous influence. Ah, those fathers understand life and appreciate its duration. Their festive board drives the African jungle fever from their doors, while it soothes the gloom and isolation which strike one with awe, as one emerges from the lighted room and plunges into the depths of the darkness of an African night, enlivened only by the wearying monotone of the frogs and crickets, and the distant ululation of the hyena. It requires somewhat above human effort, unaided by the ruby liquid that cheers, to be always suave and polite amid the dismalities of native life in Africa. After the evening meal, which replenished my failing strength, and for which I felt the intensest gratitude, the most advanced of the pupils came forward, to the number of twenty, with brass instruments, thus forming a full band of music. It rather astonished me to hear instrumental sounds issue forth in harmony from such woolly-headed youngsters, to hear well-known French music at this isolated port, 
to hear negro boys that a few months ago knew nothing beyond the traditions of their ignorant mothers stand forth and chant parisian songs about french valour and glory with all the sang froid of gamin from the purlieu of saint antoine i had a most refreshing night's rest and at dawn i sought out my camp with a will to enjoy the new life now commencing on counting the animals two donkeys were missing and on taking notes of my African monies, one coil of number six wire was not to be found. Everybody had evidently fallen on the ground to sleep, oblivious of the fact that on the coast there are many dishonest prowlers at night. Soldiers were dispatched to search through the town and neighborhood, and Jemadar Esau was apprised of our loss, and stimulated to discover the animals by the promise of a reward. Before night, one of the missing donkeys was found outside the town nibbling at manioc leaves, but the other animal and the coil of wire were never found. Among my visitors this first day at Bagamoyo was Ali bin Salim, a brother of the famous Said bin Salim, formerly Ras Kafila to Burton and Speak, and subsequently to Speak and Grant. His salams were very profuse, and moreover, his brother was to be my agent in Unyamwezi, so that I did not hesitate to accept his offer of assistance. But alas, for my white face and too trustful nature, this Ali bin Salim turned out to be a snake in the grass and a very sore thorn in my side. I was invited to his comfortable house to partake of coffee. I went there. The coffee was good, though sugarless. His promises were many, but they proved valueless. He said to me, I am your friend, I wish to serve you, what can I do for you? Replied I, I am obliged to you, I need a good friend who, knowing the language and customs of the Wanyamwezi, can procure me the pagazis I need and send me off quickly. Your brother is acquainted with the Wasungu, white men, and knows that what they promise they make good. Get me a hundred and forty pagazis and I will pay you your price. With unctuous courtesy, the reptile I was now warmly nourishing, said, I do not want anything from you, my friend. For such a slight service, rest content and quiet. You shall not stop here fifteen days. Tomorrow morning I will come and overhaul your bales to see what is needed. I bade him good morning, elated with the happy thought that I was soon to tread the Unyayembe road. The reader must be made acquainted with two good and sufficient reasons why I was to devote all my energy to lead the expedition as quickly as possible from Bagamoyo. First, I wished to reach Ujiji before the news reached Livingston that I was in search of him, for my impression of him was that he was a man who would try to put as much distance as possible between us, rather than make an effort to shorten it, and I should have my long journey for nothing. Second, the Masika, or rainy season, would soon be on me, which, if it caught me at Bagamoyo, would prevent my departure until it was over, which meant a delay of forty days, and exaggerated as the rains were by all men with whom I came in contact, it rained every day for forty days without intermission. This, I knew, was a thing to dread, for I had my memory stored with all kinds of rainy unpleasantnesses. For instance, there was the reign of Virginia and its concomitant horrors, wetness, mildew, agues, rheumatics, and such like. Then there were the English rains, a miserable drizzle causing the blue devils. Then the rainy season of Abyssinia with the floodgates of the firmament opened, and an universal downpour of rain, enough to submerge half a continent in a few hours. Lastly, there was the pelting monsoon of India, a steady shut-in-house kind of rain. To which of these rains should I compare this dreadful Masika of East Africa? Did not Burton write much about black mud in Uzaramo? Well, a country whose surface soil is called black mud in fine weather, what can it be called when forty days rain beat on it, and feet of pagazis and donkeys made paste of it? These were natural reflections induced by the circumstances of the hour, and I found myself much exercised in mind in consequence. 
Ali bin Salim, true to his promise, visited my camp on the morrow with a very important air, and after looking at the pile of cloth bales, informed me that I must have them covered with mat bags. He said he would send a man to have them measured, but he enjoined me not to make any bargain for the bags, as he would make it all right. While awaiting with commendable patience the hundred and forty pagazis promised by Ali bin Salim, we were all employed upon everything that thought could suggest needful for crossing the sickly maritime region, so that we might make the transit before the terrible fever could unnerve us and make us joyless. A short experience at Bagamoya showed us what we lacked, what was superfluous and what was necessary. We were visited one night by a squall, accompanied by furious rain. I had one thousand five hundred dollars worth of pagazi cloth in my tent. In the morning I looked, and lo, the drilling had let in rain like a sieve, and every yard of cloth was wet. It occupied two days afterwards to dry the cloths and fold them again. The drill tent was condemned, and a number five hemp canvas tent at on two prepared. After which I felt convinced that my cloth bales and one year's ammunition were safe, and that I could defy the Masika. In the hurry of departure from Zanzibar, and in my ignorance of how bales should be made, I had submitted to the better judgment and ripe experience of one Jetta, a commission merchant, to prepare my bales for carriage. Jetta did not weigh the bales as he made them up, but piled the Merikani, Kaniki, Barsati, Jamdani, Joho, Ismahili in alternate layers, and roped the same into bales. One or two pagazis came to my camp and began to chaffer. They wished to see the bales first, before they would make a final bargain. They tried to raise them up. Ugh! Ugh! It was of no use, and withdrew. A fine salter's spring balance was hung up, and a bale suspended to the hook. The finger indicated a hundred and five pounds, or three frasila, which was just thirty-five pounds or one frasila overweight. Upon putting all the bales to this test, I perceived that Jetta's guesswork, with all his experience, had caused considerable trouble to me. The soldiers were set to work to reopen and repack, which latter task is performed in the following manner. We cut a doti, or four yards of merikani, ordinarily sold at Zanzibar for two dollars and seventy-five cents the piece of thirty yards, and spread out. We take a piece or bolt of good Merikani, and instead of the double fold given it by the Nashua and Salem mills, we fold it into three parts, by which the folds have a breadth of a foot. This piece forms the first layer, and will weigh nine pounds. The second layer consists of six pieces of Kaniki, a blue stuff similar to the blouse stuff of France, and the blue jeans of America, though much lighter. The third layer is formed of the second piece of Merikani, the fourth of six more pieces of Kaniki, the fifth of Merikani, the sixth of Kaniki as before, and the seventh and last of Merikani. We have thus four pieces of Merikani, which weigh thirty-six pounds, and eighteen pieces of Kaniki, weighing also thirty-six pounds, making a total of seventy-two pounds, or a little more than two frasilas. The cloth is then folded singly over these layers, each corner tied to another. A bundle of coir rope is then brought, and two men, provided with a wooden mallet for beating and pressing the bale, proceed to tie it up with as much nicety as sailors serve down rigging. When complete, a bale is a solid mass three feet and a half long, a foot deep and a foot wide. Of these bales I had to convey eighty-two to Unyayembe, forty of which consisted solely of the Merikani and Kaniki. The other forty-two contained the Merikani and coloured cloths, which latter were to serve as honga or tribute cloths, and to engage another set of pagazis from Unyayembe to Ujiji, and from Ujiji to the regions beyond. The fifteenth day asked of me by Ali bin Salim for the procuring of the pagazis passed by, 
and there was not the ghost of a pagazi in my camp. I sent Mabruki the bullhead to Ali bin Salim to convey my salams and express a hope that he had kept his word. In half an hour's time Mabruki returned with the reply of the Arab, that in a few days he would be able to collect them all. But, added Mabruki slyly, Bana, I don't believe him. He said aloud to himself in my hearing, Why should I get the Musungu pagazis? Said Burgash did not send a letter to me, but to the Jemadar. Why should I trouble myself about him? Let Said Burgash write me a letter to that purpose, and I will procure them within two days. To my mind this was a time for action. Ali bin Salim should see that it was ill trifling with a white man in earnest to start. I rode down to his house to ask him what he meant. His reply was, Mabruki had told a lie as black as his face. He had never said anything approaching to such a thing. He was willing to become my slave, to become a pagazi himself. But here I stopped the voluble Ali, and informed him that I could not think of employing him in the capacity of a pagazi, neither could I find it in my heart to trouble Said Burgash to write a direct letter to him, or to require of a man who had deceived me once, as Ali bin Salim had, any service of any nature whatsoever. It would be better, therefore, if Ali bin Salim would stay away from my camp, and not enter it either in person or by proxy. I had lost fifteen days for Jemadar Sadur at Kaole, and had never stirred from his fortified house in that village in my service, save to pay a visit, after the receipt of the Sultan's letter. Naranji, custom-house agent at Kaole, solely under the thumb of the great Luda Damji, had not responded to Luda's worded request that he would procure pagazis, except with winks, nods, and promises, and it is but just stated how I fared at the hands of Ali bin Salim. In this extremity I remembered the promise made to me by the great merchant of Zanzibar, Tariya Topan, a Mohammedan Hindi, that he would furnish me with a letter to a young man named Sur Haji Palu, who was said to be the best man in Bagamoyo to procure a supply of pagazis. I dispatched my Arab interpreter by a dhow to Zanzibar, with a very earnest request to Captain Webb that he would procure from Tarya Topan the introductory letter so long delayed. It was the last card in my hand. On the third day the Arab returned, bringing with him not only the letter to Sur Haji Palu, but an abundance of good things from the ever-hospitable house of Mr. Webb. In a very short time after the receipt of his letter, the eminent young man Sur Haji Palu came to visit me, and informed me that he had been requested by Tarya Topan to hire for me one hundred and forty pagazis to Unyayembe in the shortest time possible. This, he said, would be very expensive, for there were scores of Arabs and Wasawabili merchants on the lookout for every caravan that came in from the interior, and they paid twenty doti, or eighty yards of cloth, to each pagazi. Not willing or able to pay more, many of these merchants had been waiting as long as six months before they could get their quota. If you, continued he, desire to depart quickly, you must pay from twenty-five to forty doti, and I can send you off before one month has ended. In reply, I said, Here are my cloths for pagazis to the amount of one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars, or three thousand five hundred doti, sufficient to give one hundred and forty men twenty-five doti each. The most I am willing to pay is twenty-five doti. Send one hundred and forty pagazis to Unyayembe with my cloth and wire, and I will make your heart glad with the richest present you have ever received. With a refreshing naivete, the young man said he did not want any present, but he would get me in my quota of pagazis, and then I could tell the Wasungu what a good young man he was, and consequently the benefit he would receive would be an increase of business. 
he closed his reply with the astounding remark that he had ten pagazis at his house already and if i would be good enough to have four bales of cloth two bags of beads and twenty coils of wire carried to his house the pagazis could leave bagamoyo the next day under charge of three soldiers for he remarked it is much better and cheaper to send many small caravans than one large one large caravans invite attack or are delayed by avaricious chiefs upon the most trivial pretexts while small ones pass by without notice the bales and the beads were duly carried to sur haji palu's house and the day passed with me in mentally congratulating myself upon my good fortune in complimenting the young hindi's talents for business the greatness and influence of taria topan and the goodness of mr webb in thus hastening my departure from bagamoyo i mentally vowed a handsome present and a great puff in my book to sur haji palu and it was with a glad heart that i prepared these soldiers for their march to unyayembe the task of preparing the first caravan for the unyayembe road informed me upon several things that have escaped the notice of my predecessors in east africa a timely knowledge of which would have been of infinite service to me at zanzibar in the purchase and selection of sufficient and proper cloth end of chapter four Part 1、Chapter 4, Part 2 of How I Found Livingston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beth Ann. How I Found Livingston Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 4 Part 2 Life at Bagamoyo The setting out of the first caravan enlightened me also on the subject of Honga, or tribute. Tribute had to be packed by itself. All of choice cloth, for the chiefs, besides being avaricious, are also very fastidious. They will not accept the flimsy cloth of the pagazi, but a royal and exceedingly high priced dabwani, ismahali, rahini, or sahari, or dodis of crimson broadcloth. The tribute for the first caravan cost twenty five dollars. Having more than one hundred and forty pagazis to dispatch, This tribute money would finally amount to three hundred and thirty dollars gold, with a minimum of twenty five cents on each dollar. Ponder on this, O traveller. I lay bare these facts for your special instruction. But before my first caravan was destined to part company with me, Sir Haja Palo, worthy young man, and I were to come to a definite understanding about money matters. The morning appointed for departure, Sor Haji Palo came to my hut and presented his bill, with all the gravity of innocence, for supplying the Bagazis with twenty five doti each as their hire to Unyanyembe, begging immediate payment in money. Words fail to express the astonishment I naturally felt that this sharp looking young man should so soon have forgotten the verbal contract entered into between him and myself the morning previous which was to the effect that out of the three thousand doti stored in my tent and bought expressly for pagazi hire each and every man hired for me as carriers from bagamoyo to unyanyembe should be paid out of the store there in my tent when i asked if he remembered the contract He replied in the affirmative. His reasons for breaking it so soon were that he wished to sell his cloth, not mine, and for his cloth he should want money, not an exchange. But I gave him to comprehend that as he was procuring pagazis for me, he was to pay my pagazis with my cloth, that all the money I expected to pay him should be just such a sum I thought adequate for his trouble as my agent. 
and that only on these terms should he act for me in this or any other matter, and that the Musunga was not accustomed to eat his words. The preceding paragraph embodies many more words than are contained in it. It embodies a dialogue of an hour, an angry altercation of half an hour's duration, a vow taken on the part of Sir Haiji Palo, that if I did not take his claws he should not touch my business, many tears, entreaties, woeful penance, and much else, all of which were responded to with, Do as I want you to do, or do nothing. Finally came relief and a happy ending. Sir Haiji Polo went away with a bright face, taking with him three soldiers' posha, food, and hanga, tribute, for the caravan. Well for me that it had ended so, and that subsequent quarrels of a similar nature terminated so peaceably. Otherwise I doubt whether my departure from Bagamoyo would have happened so early as it did. While I am on this theme, as it early engrossed every moment of my time at Bagamoyo, I may as well be more explicit regarding Bor Haji Polo and his connection with my business. Sir Haji Palo was a smart young man of business, energetic, quick of mental calculation, and seemed to be born for a successful salesman. His eyes were never idle. They wandered over every part of my person, over the tent, the bed, the guns, the clothes, and having swung clear round, began the silent circle over again. His fingers were never at rest. They had a fidgety, nervous action at their tips, constantly in the act of feeling something. While in the act of talking to me, he would lean over and feel the texture of the cloth of my trousers, my coat or my shoes, or socks. Then he would feel his own light Jamandani shirt, or Dabwain loincloth. Then he would feel his own light Jamandi shirt, or Dabwanic loincloth, until his eyes casually resting upon a novelty, his body would lean forward and his arm would stretch out with the willing fingers. His jaws also were in perpetual motion, caused by vile habits he had acquired of chewing betel nut and lime, and sometimes tobacco and lime. They gave out the sound similar to that of a young shoat in the act of sucking. He was a pious Mohammedan, and observed the external courtesies and ceremonies of the true believers. He would affably greet me, take off his shoes, entering my tent, protesting he was not fit to sit in my presence, and, after being seated, would begin his ever-crooked errand. Of honesty, literal and practical honesty, this youth knew nothing. To the pure truth, he was an utter stranger, the falsehoods he had uttered during his short life seemed already to have quenched the bold gaze of innocence from his eyes, to have banished the color of truthfulness from his features, to have transformed him, yet a stripling of twenty, into a most accomplished rascal and consummate expert in dishonesty. During the six weeks I encamped at Bagamoyo waiting for my quota of men, this lad of twenty gave me very much trouble. He was found out half a dozen times a day in dishonesty, yet was in no way abashed by it. He would send in his account of the cloths supplied to the Bagazis, stating them to be twenty-five paid to each. On sending a man to inquire, I would find the greatest number to have been twenty and the smallest twelve. Sir Haji Palo described the cloths to be of first-class quality. Uyila cloths, worth in the market four times more than the ordinary quality given to the Pagazis. Yet a personal examination would prove them to be the flimsiest goods sold, such as American sheeting two and a half feet broad, and worth two dollars and seventy-five cents per thirty yards apiece at Zanzibar, or the most inferior kanaki, which is generally sold at nine dollars per score. He would personally come to my camp and demand forty pounds of sami sami, marunka, and buba beads for pasho, or caravan rations. 
an inspection of their store before departure from their first camp from Bagamoyo would show a deficiency ranging from five to thirty pounds. Moreover, he cheated in cash money, such as demanding four dollars for crossing the Kangani ferry for every ten pagazis, when the fare was two dollars for the same number, and an unconscionable number of pice, copper coins equal in value to three quarters of a cent were acquired for Pasho. It was every day for four weeks that this system of roguery was carried out. Each day conceived a dozen new schemes. Every instant of his time seemed to be devising how to plunder, until I was fairly at my wit's end how to thwart him. Exposure before a crowd of his fellows brought no blush of shame to his sallow cheeks. He would listen with a mere shrug of the shoulders, and that was all which I might interpret any way it pleased me. A threat to reduce his present had no effect. A bird in the hand was certainly worth two in the bush for him, so ten dollars' worth of goods stolen and in his actual possession was of more intrinsic value than the promise of twenty in a few days, though it was that of a white man. Readers will, of course, ask themselves why I did not, after the first discovery of these shameless proceedings, closed my business with him, to which I make reply that I could not do without him unless his equal were forthcoming, that I never felt so thoroughly dependent on any one man as I did upon him. Without his or his duplicate's aid, I must have stayed at Bagamoyo at least six months, at the end of which time the expedition would have become valueless, the rumor of it having been blown abroad to the four winds. It was immediate departure that was essential to my success, departure from Bagamoyo, after which it might be possible for me to control my own future in a great measure. These troubles were the greatest that I could at this time imagine. I have already stated that I had $1,750 worth of Pagazi's cloths, or 3,500 doti stored in my tent, and above what my bales contained. Calculating 140 pagazis at 25 doti each, I supposed I had enough. Yet, though I had been trying to teach the young Hindu that the Masunga was not a fool, nor blind to his pilfering tricks, though the 3,500 doti were all spent, though I had only obtained 130 pagazis at 25 doti each, which in the aggregate amounted to 3,200 doti. Sir Haji Paolo's bill was 1,400 cash extra. His plea was that he had furnished Uyilla cloths for Mahungu, 240 doti, each in value to 960 of my doti, that the money was spent in fairy pice, in presents to chiefs of caravans of tents, guns, red broadcloth, in presents to the people on the Marimba coast, to induce them to hunt up pagazis. Upon this exhibition of most ruthless cheating, I waxed indignant, and declared to him that if he would not run over his bill, and correct it, he should go without a pice. But before the bill could be put into proper shape, my words, threats, and promises, falling heedlessly on a stony brain, a man, Kanji by name, from the store of Tayara Topan of Zanzibar, had to come over when the bill was finally reduced to 738. Without any disrespect to Tayara Topan, I am unable to decide which is the most accomplished rascal, Kanji or young Sor Haji Palo. In the words of a white man who knows them both, there is not the splitting of a stroll between them. Kanji is deep and sly, Sor Haji Palo is bold and incorrigible. But peace be to them both. May their shaven heads never be covered with the troublous crown I wore at Bagamoyo. My dear friendly reader, do not think if I speak out my mind in this or in any other chapter upon matters seemingly trivial and unimportant, that seeming such they should be left unmentioned. Every tittle related is a fact, and to know facts is to receive knowledge. How could I ever recite my experience to you if I did not enter upon these miserable details, 
which sorely distract the stranger upon his first arrival. Had I been a government official, I had but wagged my finger, and my quota of pagazis had been furnished me within a week. But as an individual arriving without the graces of official recognition, armed with no government influence, I had to be patient, bide my time, and chew the cud of irritation quietly. But the bread I ate was not all sour, as this was. The white men, Fakwahar and Shaw, were kept steadily at work upon waterproof tents of hemp canvas, for I perceived, by the premonitory showers of rain that marked the approach of the Masika, that an ordinary tent of light cloth would subject myself to damp my goods to mildew, and while there was time to rectify all errors that had crept into my plans through ignorance or over-haste, I thought it was not wise to permit things to rectify themselves. Now that I have returned uninjured in health, though I have suffered the attacks of twenty-three fevers within the short space of thirteen months, I must confess I owe my life first to the mercy of God, secondly to the enthusiasm for my work, which animated me from the beginning to the end, thirdly, to have never ruined my constitution by indulgence in vice and intemperance, fourthly, to the energy of my nature, fifthly, to a native hopefulness which never died, and sixthly, to having furnished myself with a capacious water and damp-proof canvas house. And here, if my experience may be of value, I would suggest that travelers, instead of submitting their better judgment to the capricious of a tent-maker, who will endeavor to pass off a handsomely made fabric of his own, which is unsuited to all climes, to use his own judgment, and get the best and strongest that money will buy. In the end it will prove the cheapest, and perhaps be the means of saving his life. On one point I failed, and lest new and young travellers fall into the same error which marred much of my enjoyment, this paragraph is written. One must be extremely careful in his choice of weapons, whether for sport or defence. A traveller should have at least three different kinds of guns. One should be a fowling piece, the second should be a double-barreled rifle, number 10 or 12, the third should be a magazine rifle for defence. For the fowling piece, I would suggest number 12 bore, with barrels at least 4 feet in length. For the rifle, for larger game, I would point out, with due deference to old sportsmen, of course, that the best guns for African game are the English Lancaster and Riley rifles. And for a fighting weapon, I maintain that the best yet invented is the American Winchester repeating rifle, or the 16-shooter, as it is called supply with a London allays ammunition. If I suggest as a fighting weapon the American Winchester, I do not mean that the traveler need take it for the purpose of offense, but as the best means of efficient defense to save his own life against African banditti when attacked, a thing likely to happen any time. I met a young man soon after returning from the interior who declared his conviction that the express rival was the most perfect weapon ever invented to destroy African game. Very possibly the young man may be right, and that the express rifle is all he declares it to be, but he had never practiced with it against African game, and as I had never tried it, I could not combat his assertion, but I could relate my experience with weapons having all the penetrating powers of the express, and could inform him that though the bullets penetrated through the animals, they almost always failed to bring down the game at the first fire. On the other hand, I could inform him that during the time I traveled with Dr. Livingston, the doctor lent me his heavy Riley rifle, with which I seldom failed to bring an animal or two home to the camp and that I found the Fraser shell answer all purposes for which it was intended. The feats related by Captain Speke and Sir Samuel Baker are no longer matters of wonderment to the young sportsman when he has a Lancaster or a Rayleigh in his hand. After a very few trials he can imitate them, if not excel their leads, provided he has a steady hand, and it is to forward this end 
that this paragraph is written. African game require bone crushers, for any ordinary carbine possesses sufficient penetrating qualities, yet has not the disabling qualities which a gun must possess to be useful in the hands of an African explorer. I had not been long at Bagamoyo before I went over to Masawadi's camp to visit the Livingston caravan, which the British consul had dispatched on the first day of November, 1870, to the relief of Livingston. The number of packages was 35, which required as many men to convey them to Unyanyembe. The men chosen to escort this caravan were composed of Johannes and Waihayo, seven in number. Out of the seven, four were slaves. They lived in clover here, thoughtless of the errand they had been sent upon, and careless of the consequences. What these men were doing at Bagamoyo all this time I never could conceive, except indulging their own vicious propensities. It would be nonsense to say that there were no pagazis, because I know there were at least fifteen caravans which had started for the interior since the Ramadan, December fifteenth, 1870. Yet Livingston's caravan had arrived at this little town of Bagamoyo, November 2nd, and here it had been lying until the 10th of February, in all 100 days, for lack of the limited number of 35 pagazis, a number that might be procured within two days through consular influence. Bagamoyo has a most enjoyable climate. It is far preferable in every sense to that of Zanzibar. We were able to sleep in the open air, and rose refreshed and healthy each morning, to enjoy our matutinal bath in the sea, and by the time the sun had risen we were engaged in various preparations for our departure for the interior. Our days were enlivened by visits from the Arabs, who were also bound for Unyamyembe, by comical scenes in the camp, sometimes by court-martials held on the refractory, by a boxing match between Fakwarhar and Shah, necessitating my prudent interference when they waxed too wroth by a hunting excursion now and then to the Kirangani plain and river, by social conversation with the old Jamander and his band of Baluches, who were never tired of warning me that the Masika was at hand, and of advising me that my best course was to hurry on before the season of traveling expired. Among the employees with the expedition were two Hindu and two Gonis. They had conceived the idea that the African interior was an El Dorado, the ground of which was strewn over with ivory tusks, and they had clubbed together while their imaginations were thus heated to embark in a little enterprise of their own. Their names were Jaco, Abdul Kader, Bundar Salam, and Aran Sealer. Jaco engaged in my service as carpenter and general help, Abdul Kadar as a tailor, and Bundar Salam as cook and Arensiller as chief butler. But Arensiller, with an intuitive eye, foresaw that I was likely to prove a vigorous employer, and while there was yet time, he had devoted most of it to conceive how it was possible to withdraw from the engagement. He received permission upon asking for it to go to Zanzibar to visit his friends. Two days afterwards I was informed that he had blown his right eye out, and received a medical confirmation of the fact and note of the extent of the injury from Dr. Christie, the physician to His Highness Seed Burgosh. His compatriots, I imagined, were about planning the same thing, but a peremptory command to abstain from such folly issued after they had received their advance pay sufficed to check any sinister designs they may have formed. A groom was caught stealing from the bales one night, and the chase after him into the country until he vanished out of sight into the jungle was one of the most agreeable diversions which occurred to wear away the interval employed in preparing for the march. I had now dispatched four caravans into the interior, and the fifth, which was to carry the boats and the boxes, personal luggage, and a few cloths and bead loads, was ready to be led by myself. The following is the order of departure of the caravans. 1871, February 6th. Expedition arrived at Bagamoyo. 1871, February 18th. First caravan departs with 24 pagazis and 3 soldiers. 1871, February 21st. 
second caravan departs with twenty-eight pagazis, two chiefs, and two soldiers. 1871, February 25th. Third caravan departs with twenty-two pagazis, ten donkeys, one white man, one cook, and three soldiers. 1871, March 11th. Fourth caravan departs with fifty-five pagazis, two chiefs, and three soldiers. 1871, March 21st. Fifth caravan departs with twenty-eight pagazis, twelve soldiers, two white men, one tailor, one cook, one interpreter, one gun-bearer, seventeen asses, two horses, and one dog. Total number inclusive of all souls comprised in caravans connected with the New York Herald Expedition, 192. End of chapter 4, part 2. Chapter 5, part 1 of How I Found Livingstone this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. How I Found Livingstone Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingstone. By Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 5, Part 1 through Ukwe, Ukami, and Udo, to Usegua. On the 21st of March, exactly seventy-three days after my arrival at Zanzibar, the fifth caravan, led by myself, left the town of Bagamoa for our first journey westward, with forward for its motto go. As the Kirangosian rolled the American flag, and put himself at the head of the caravan, and the pagazis, animals, soldiers, and idlers were lined for the march, we bade a long farewell to the dulce far niente of civilized life, to the blue ocean, and to its open road to home, to the hundreds of dusky spectators who were there to celebrate our departure with repeated salvos of musketry. Our caravan is composed of twenty-eight pagazis, including the kirangosi, or guide, Twelve soldiers, under Captain Embarak Bombay, in charge of seventeen donkeys and their loads. Selim, my interpreter, in charge of the donkey and cart and its load. One cook and sub, who is also to be tailor and ready hand for all, and leads the grey horse. Shaw, once mate of a ship, now transformed into rear guard and overseer for the caravan, who is mounted on a good riding donkey and wearing a canoe-like teepee and sea-boots. And lastly, on the splendid bay horse presented to me by Mr. Goodhu, myself, called Bana Makuba, the big master, by my people, the vanguard, the reporter, the thinker, and leader of the expedition. Altogether, the expedition numbers on the day of departure, three white men, twenty-three soldiers, four supernumeraries, four chiefs, and one hundred and fifty-three pagazis, twenty-seven donkeys, and one cart, conveying cloth, beads, and wire, boat fixings, tents, cooking utensils and dishes, medicine, powder, small shot, musket balls, and metallic cartridges, instruments and small necessaries, such as soap, sugar, tea, coffee, Liebig's extract of meat, pemmican, candles, etc., which make a total of a hundred and fifty-three loads. The weapons of defence which the expedition possesses consist of one double-barrel breech-loading gun, smooth-bore, one American Winchester rifle, or sixteen-shooter, one Henry rifle, or sixteen-shooter, two stars breech-loaders, one Jocelyn breech-loader, one elephant rifle, carrying balls eight to the pound, six single-barrelled pistols, one battle-axe, two swords, two daggers, Persian kamars, purchased at Shiraz by myself, one boat-spear, two American axes, four pounds each, twenty-four hatchets, and twenty-four butcher-knives. The expedition had been fitted with care. Whatever it needed was not stinted. Everything was provided. 
Nothing was done too hurriedly, yet everything was purchased, manufactured, collected, and compounded with the utmost dispatch, consistent with efficiency and means. Should it fail of success in its errand of rapid transit, to Ujiji and back, it must simply happen from an accident which could not be controlled. So much for the personnel of the expedition and its purpose. Until its point de mer be reached. We left Bagamo, the attraction of all the curious, with much eclat, and defiled up a narrow lane shaded almost to twilight by the dense umbrage of two parallel hedges of mimosa. We were all in the highest spirits. The soldiers sang. The Kirangozi lifted his voice into a loud bellowing note, and fluttered the American flag, which told all onlookers, Lo, a Musungu's caravan! And my heart, I thought, palpitated much too quickly for the sober face of a leader. But I could not check it. The enthusiasm of youth still clung to me, despite my travels. My pulses bounded with the full glow of staple health. Behind me were the troubles which had harassed me for over two months. With that dishonest son of a Hindi, Saw Haji Palu, I had said my last word. Of the blatant rabble of Arabs, Banyans, and Balushis, I had taken my last look. With the Jesuits of the French mission, I had exchanged farewells, and before me beamed the sun of promise, as he sped towards the Occident. Loveliness glowed around me. I saw fertile fields, riant vegetation, strange trees. I heard the cry of cricket and peewit, and sibilant sound of many insects, all of which seemed to tell me, at least you are started. What could I do but lift my face towards the pure glowing sky and cry, God be thanked? The first camp, Shambag on Era, we arrived at in one hour thirty minutes equal to three and a quarter miles. This first, or little journey, was performed very well, considering, as the Irishman says, the boy Salim upset the cart not more than three times. Zaidai, the soldier, only once let his donkey, which carried one bag of my clothes and a box of ammunition, lie in a puddle of black water. The clothes have to be rewashed, the ammunition box, thanks to my provision, was waterproof. Kamna perhaps knew the art of donkey driving, overjoyful at the departure, had sung himself into oblivion of the difficulties with which an animal of the pure asinine breed has naturally to contend against, such as not knowing the right road, and inability to resist the temptation of straying into the depths of a manioc field. And the donkey, ignorant of the custom in vogue amongst ass-drivers of flourishing sticks before an animal's nose, and, misunderstanding the direction in which he was required to go, ran off at full speed along an opposite road, until his pack got unbalanced, and he was fain to come to the earth. But these incidents were trivial, of no importance, and natural to the first little journey in East Africa. The soldier's point of character leaked out just a little, Bombay turned out to be honest and trusty, but slightly disposed to be dilatory. Oledai did more talking than work, while the runaway Faraji and the useless-handed Mabrukai Burton turned out to be true men and staunch, carrying loads the sight of which would have caused the strong-limbed hamels of Stambol to sigh. The saddles were excellent, surpassing expectation, the strong hemp canvas bore its one hundred and fifty pounds burden with the strength of a bull-hide, and the loading and unloading of miscellaneous baggage was performed with systematic dispatch. In brief, there was nothing to regret. The success of the journey proved our departure to be anything but premature. The next three days were employed in putting the finishing touches to our preparations for the long land journey, and our precautions against the Masaika, which was now ominously near, and in settling accounts. Shamba Gonra means Gonra's field. Gonra is a wealthy Indian widow, well disposed towards the Wasangu, whites. She exports much cloth, 
beads and wire into the far interior, and imports in return much ivory. Her house is after the model of the town-houses, with long sloping roof and projecting eaves, affording a cool shade, under which the Pagazis love to loiter. On its southern and eastern side stretch the cultivated fields, which supply Bagamo with the staple grain, Matama, of East Africa. On the left grow Indian corn, and Mohogo, a yam-like root of whitish colour, called by some manioc. When dry, it is ground and compounded into cakes, similar to army slapjacks. On the north, just behind the house, winds a black quagmire, a sinuous hollow, which in its deepest part always contains water. The muddy home of the brake and rush-loving, kiboko, or hippopotamus. Its banks, crowded with dwarf fan-palm, tall water-reeds, acacias, and tiger-grass, afforded shelter to numerous aquatic birds, pelicans, etc. After following a course northeasterly, it conflows with the Kingani, which, at distance of four miles from Gonra's country-house, bends eastward into the sea. To the west, after a mile of cultivation, fall and recede in succession the sea-beach of old in lengthy parallel waves, overgrown densely with forest grass and marsh-reeds. On the spines of these land-swells flourish ebony, calabash, and mango. Safari, Safari, Leo! Pakia, Pakia! A journey, a journey to-day, set out, set out! rang the cheery voice of the Kirangozi, echoed by that of my servant Selim, on the morning of the fourth day, which was fixed for our departure in earnest. As I hurried my men to their work, and lent a hand with energy to drop the tents, I mentally resolved that, if my caravan should give me clear space, Unyanyembe should be our resting-place before three months expired. By six a.m. our early breakfast was dispatched, and the donkeys and bagazis were defiling from Camp Gonra. Even at this early hour, and in this country place, there was quite a collection of curious natives, to whom I gave the parting, quarry, with sincerity. My bay horse was found to be invaluable for the service of a quartermaster of a transport train, for to such was I compelled to compare myself. I could stay behind until the last donkey had quitted the camp, and, by a few minutes' gallop, I could put myself at their head, leaving Shaw to bring up the rear. The road was a mere footpath, and led over a soil which, though sandy, was of surprising fertility, producing grain and vegetables a hundredfold, the sowing and planting of which was done in the most unskilful manner. In their fields, at heedless labour, were men and women in the scantiest costumes, compared to which Adam and Eve, in their fig-tree apparel, must have been on grand tenue. We passed them with serious faces, while they laughed and giggled, and pointed their index fingers at this and that, which to them seemed so strange and bizarre. In about half an hour we had left the Tormatama, and fields of watermelons, cucumbers, and manioc, and, crossing a reedy slough, were in an open forest of ebony and calabash. In its depths a deer in plentiful numbers, and at night it is visited by the hippopotami of the Kingangi, for the sake of its grass. In another hour we had emerged from the woods, and were looking down upon the broad valley of the Kingangi, and a scene presented itself, so utterly different from what my foolish imagination had drawn, that I felt quite relieved by the pleasing disappointment. Here was a valley stretching four miles east and west, and about eight miles north and south, left with the richest soil to its own wild growth of grass, which in civilization would have been a most valuable meadow for the rearing of cattle. Invested as it was by dense forests, darkening the horizon at all points of the compass, and folded in by tree-clad ridges, at the sound of our caravan, the red antelope bounded away to our right and the left, and frogs hushed their croak. The sun shone hot, and while traversing the valley, 
we experienced a little of its real African fervour. About halfway across we came to a sluice of stagnant water which, directly in the road of the caravan, had settled down into an oozy pond. The Pagazis crossed a hastily constructed bridge, thrown up a long time ago by some Washenzi Samaritans. It was an extraordinary affair, rugged tree limbs resting on very unsteady forked piles, and it had evidently tested the patience of many a loaded Manayamwezi, as it did those porters of our caravan. A weaker animals were unloaded, the puddle between Bagamoo and Genera having taught us prudence. But this did not occasion much delay. The men worked smartly under sure supervision. The turbid Kingani, famous for its hippopotami, was reached in a short time, and we began to thread the jungle along its right bank, until we were halted point-blank, by a narrow sluice having an immeasurable depth of black mud. The difficulty presented by this was very grave, though its breadth was barely eight feet. The donkeys, and least of all the horses, could not be made to traverse two poles like our biped carriers. Neither could they be driven into the sluice, where they would quickly founder. The only available way of crossing it in safety was by means of a bridge. To endure in this conservative land for generations, as the handiwork of the Wasengu. So we set to work, there being no help for it, with American axes, the first of their kind, the strokes of which ever rang in this part of the world, to build a bridge. Be sure it was made quickly, for where the civilized white is found, a difficulty must vanish. The bridge was composed of six stout trees thrown across. Over these were laid crosswise, fifteen pack-saddles, covered again with a thick layer of grass. All the animals crossed it safely, and then, for a third time that morning, the process of wading was performed. The Kingani flowed northerly here, and our course lay down its right bank. A half a mile in that direction, through a jungle of giant reeds and extravagant climbers, brought us to the ferry, where the animals had to be again unloaded. Verily, I wished when I saw its deep muddy waters that I possessed the power of Moses with his magic rod, or, what would have answered my purpose as well, Aladdin's ring, for then I could have found myself and party on the opposite side without further trouble. But, not having either of these gifts, I issued orders for an immediate crossing, for it was ill-wishing sublime things before this most mundane prospect. King Ware, the canoe paddler, espying us from his break covert on the opposite side, civilly responded to our halloos, and brought his huge hollowwood tree skilfully over the whirling eddies of the river to where we stood waiting for him. While one party loaded the canoe with our goods, others got ready a long rape to fasten around the animals' necks, wherewith to haul them through the river to the other bank. After seeing the work properly commenced, I sat down on a condemned canoe to amuse myself with the hippopotami, by peppering their thick skulls with my number twelve smoothbore. The Winchester rifle, calibre forty-four, a present from the Honourable Edward J. Morris, our minister at Constantinople, did no more than slightly tap them, causing about as much injury as a boy's sling. It was perfect in its accuracy of fire, for ten times in succession I struck the tops of their heads between the ears. One old fellow, with the look of a sage, was tapped close to the right ear by one of these bullets. Instead of submerging himself as others had done, he coolly turned round his head as if to ask, Why this waste of valuable cartridges on us? The response to the mute inquiry of his sageship was an ounce and a quarter bullet from the smooth bore which made him bellow with pain, and in a few moments he rose up again, tumbling in his death agonies. As his groans were so piteous, I refrained from a useless sacrifice of life, and left the amphibious horde in peace. A little knowledge concerning these uncouth inmates of the African waters was gained even during the few minutes we were delayed at the ferry. 
when undisturbed by foreign sounds, they congregate in shallow water on the sandbars, with the fore half of their bodies exposed to the warm sunshine. When thus somnolently reposing, very like a herd of enormous swine, when startled by the noise of an intruder, they plunge hastily into the depths, lashing the waters into a yellowish foam, and scatter themselves below the surface, when presently the heads of a few reappear, snorting the water from their nostrils, to take a fresh breath and a cautious scrutiny around them. When thus we see but their ears, forehead, eyes, and nostrils, and as they hastily submerge again, it requires a steady wrist and a quick hand to shoot them. I have heard several comparisons made of their appearance while floating in this manner. Some Arabs told me before I had seen them that they looked like dead trees carried down the river. Others, who in some country had seen hogs, thought that they resembled them. But to my mind they looked more like horses. When swimming, their curved necks and pointed ears, their wide eyes and expanded nostrils, favour greatly this comparison. At night they seek the shore, and wander several miles over the country, luxuriating among its rank grasses. To within four miles of the town of Bagamoyo, the Kingani is eight miles distance, their wide tracks are seen. Frequently, if not disturbed by the startling human voice, they make a raid on the rich corn stalks of the native cultivators, and a dozen of them will, in a few minutes, make a frightful havoc in a large field of this plant. Consequently, we were not surprised, while delayed at the ferry, to hear the owners of the corn venting loud halloos, like the rosy-cheeked farmer boys in England, when scaring the crows away from the young wheat. The caravan, in the meanwhile, had crossed safely. Bales, baggage, donkeys, and men. I had thought to have camped on the bank, so as to amuse myself with shooting antelope, and also for the sake of procuring their meat, in order to save my goats, of which I had a number constituting my livestock of provisions. But, thanks to the awe and dread which my men entertained of the hippopotami, I was hurried on to the outpost of the Belouche garrison, at Bagamoyo, a small village called Kikoka, distant four miles from the river. The western side of the river was a considerable improvement upon the eastern. The plain, slowly heaving upwards, as smoothly as the beach of a watering place for the distance of a mile, until it culminated in a gentle and round ridge, presented none of those difficulties which troubled us on the other side. There were none of those cataclysms of mire and sloughs of black mud and over tall grasses, none of that miasmatic jungle with its noxious emissions. It was just such a scene as one may find before an English mansion, a noble expanse of lawn and sword, with boscage sufficient to arguably diversify it. After traversing the open plain, the road led through a grove of young ebony trees, where guinea fowls and a heart beast were seen. It then wound, with all the characteristic eccentric curves of a goat path, up and down a succession of land waves crested by the dark green foliage of the mango, and the scantier and light-coloured leaves of the enormous calabash. The depressions were filled with jungle of more or less density, while here and there opened glades, shadowed even during noon by thin groves of towering trees. At our approach fled in terror flocks of green pigeons, jays, ibis, turtle-doves, golden pheasants, quails, and moor-hens, with crows and hawks, while now and then a solitary pelican winged its way to the distance. Nor was this enlivening prospect without its pairs of antelope and monkeys which hopped away like Australian kangaroos. These latter were of good size, with round bullet heads, white breasts, and long tails tufted at the end. We arrived at Kikoka by 5 p.m., having loaded and unloaded our pack animals four times, crossing one deep puddle, a mud sluice, and a river, and performed a journey of eleven miles. The settlement of Kikoka is a collection of straw huts, not built after any architectural style, 
but after a bastard form, invented by indolent settlers, from the Mimra and Zanzibar, for the purpose of excluding as much sunshine as possible from the eaves and interior. A sluice and some wells provide them with water, which, though sweet, is not particularly wholesome or appetizing, owing to the large quantities of decayed matter which is washed into it by the rains, and is then left to corrupt in it. A weak effort has been made to clear their neighbourhood, for providing a place for cultivation, but to the dire task of wood-chopping and jungle-clearing, the settlers prefer occupying an open glade, which they clear of grass, so as to be able to hoe up two or three inches of soil, into which they cast their seed, confident of return. The next day was a halt at Kikoka. The fourth caravan, consisting solely of Wamyamwezi, proving a sore obstacle to a rapid advance. Maganga, its chief, devised several methods of extorting more cloth and presents from me, he having cost already more than any three chiefs together. But his efforts were of no avail further than obtaining promises of reward if he would hurry on to Arne and Embi, so that I might find my road clear. On the 27th, the Wanyamwezi having started, we broke camp soon after at 7 a.m. The country was of the same nature as that lying between the Kingani and Kikoka Parkland, attractive and beautiful in every feature. I rode in advance to secure meat, should a chance present itself. But not the shadow of vert or venison did I see. Ever in our front, westerly, rolled the land waves, now rising, now subsiding, parallel one with the other, like a ploughed field many times magnified. Each ridge had its knot of jungle or its thin combing of heavily foliaged trees, until we arrived close to Rosako, our next halting place, when the monotonous waver of the land underwent a change, breaking into independent hammocks clad with dense jungle. On one of these, veiled by an impenetrable jungle of thorny acacia, rested Rosako, girt round by its natural fortification, neighbouring another village to the north of it, similarly protected. Between them sank a valley extremely fertile and bountiful in its productions, bisected by a small stream, which serves as a drain to the valley or low hills surrounding it. Rosako is the frontier village of Ukwe, while Kikaro is the northwesterly extremity of Uzaramo. We entered this village and occupied its central portion with our tents and animals. A kitanda, or square light bedstead, without valance, fringe, or any superfluity whatever, but nevertheless quite as comfortable as with them, was brought to my tent for my use by the village chief. The animals were, immediately after being unloaded, driven out to feed, and the soldiers to a man set to work to pile the baggage up, lest the rain, which during the Masika season always appears imminent, might cause irreparable damage. Among other experiments which I was about to try in Africa was that of a good watchdog on an unmannerly people who would insist upon coming into my tent at untimely hours and endangering valuables. Especially did I wish to try the effect of its bark on the mighty Wagogu, who, I was told by certain Arabs, would lift the door of the tent and enter whether you wished them or not who would chuckle at the fear they inspired, and say to you, "'Hi, hi, white man, I never saw the like of you before. Are there many more like you? Where do you come from?' Also would they take hold of your watch, and ask you with a cheerful curiosity, "'What is this for, white man?' To which, of course, you would reply that it was to tell you the hour and the minute. But the Mogogo, proud of his prowess, and more unmannerly than a brute, would answer you with a snort of insult. I thought of a watchdog, and procured a good one at Bombay, not only as a faithful companion, but to threaten the heels of just such gentry. But soon after our arrival at Rosoko, it was found that the dog, whose name was Omar, given him from his Turkish origin, was missing. He had strayed away from the soldiers during a rain squall, and had got lost. 
I dispatched Mabrukai Burton back to Kikoka to search for him. On the following morning, just as we were about to leave Rosako, the faithful fellow returned with the lost dog, having found him at Kikoka. End of chapter 5, part 1 Chapter 5, part 2 of How I Found Livingstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver How I Found Livingstone Travels, Adventures and Discoveries in Central Africa Including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingstone By Sir Henry M. Stanley Chapter 5, Part 2 Through Ukwe, Ukami, and Udoi to Yuskua Previous to our departure on the morning after this, Maganga, chief of the fourth caravan, brought me the unhappy report that three of his pagazis were sick, and he would like to have some doa, medicine. Though not a doctor, or in any way connected with the profession, I had a well-supplied medicine chest, without which no traveller in Africa could live, for just such a contingency as was now present. On visiting Maganga's sick men, I found one suffering from inflammation of the lungs, another from the Makungaroo, African intermittent. They all imagined themselves about to die, and called loudly for Mama, Mama, though they were all grown men. It was evident that the fourth caravan could not stir that day, so leaving word with Maganga to hurry after me as soon as possible, I issued orders for the march of my own. Excepting in the neighbourhood of the villages which we have passed, there were no traces of cultivation. The country extending between the several stations is as much a wilderness as the desert of Sahara, though it possesses a far more pleasing aspect. Indeed, had the first man, at the time of the creation, gazed at his world, and perceived it of the beauty which belongs to this part of Africa, he would have had no cause of complaint. In the deep thickets, set like islets amid a sea of grassy verdure, he would have found shelter from the noonday heat, and a safe retirement for himself and spouse during the awesome darkness. In the morning he could have walked forth on the sloping sward, enjoyed its freshness, and performed his abulations in one of the many small streams flowing at its foot. His garden of fruit trees is all that is required. The noble forests, deep and cool, are round about him, and in their shade walk as many animals as one could desire. For days and days let a man walk in any direction, north, south, east, and west, and he will behold the same scene. Earnestly as I wish to hurry on to Yunan Embi, still a heartfelt anxiety about the rival of my goods, carried by the fourth caravan, served as a drag upon me, and before my caravan had marched nine miles, my anxiety had risen to the highest pitch, and caused me to order a camp there and then. The place selected for it was near a long struggling sluice, having an abundance of water during the rainy season draining as it does two extensive slopes. No sooner had we pitched our camp, built a boma of thorny acacia, and other tree branches, by stacking them round our camp, and driven our animals to grass, than we were made aware of the formidable number and variety of the insect tribe, which, for a time, was another source of anxiety, until a diligent examination of the several species dispelled it. As it was the most interesting hunt which I instituted for the several specimens of the insects, I here append the record of it, for what it is worth. My object in obtaining these specimens was to determine whether the genus Glossina morsitans of the naturalist, or the tetsi, sometimes called setsi, of Lewingstone, Varden, and Gumming, said to be deadly to horses, was amongst them. Up to this date, I had been nearly two months in East Africa, and had yet a seen no tetsi, and my horses, instead of becoming emaciated, for such is one of the symptoms of the tetsi bite, 
had considerably improved in condition. There were three different species of flies which sought shelter in my tent, which, unitedly, kept up a continual chorus of sounds. One performed the basso profondo, another a tenor, and the third a weak contralto. The first emanated from a ferocious and fierce fly, an inch long, having a ventral capacity for blood quite astonishing. This larger fly was the one chosen for the first inspection, which was of the intensest. I permitted one to alight on my flannel pyjamas, which I wore in Dashabil in camp. No sooner had he alighted than his posterior was raised, his head lowered, and his weapons, consisting of four hair-like styles, unsheathed from the proboscis-like bag which concealed them, and immediately I felt pain, like that caused by a dexterous lancet-cut, or the probe of a fine needle. I permitted him to gorge himself, though my patience and naturalistic interest was sorely tried. I saw his abdominal parts distend with the plenitude of the repast, until it had swollen to three times its former shrunken girth, when he flew away of his own accord, laden with blood. On rolling up my flannel pyjamas, to see the fountain whence the fly had drawn the fluid, I discovered it to be a little above the left knee, by a crimson bead resting over the insertion. After wiping the blood, the wound was similar to that caused by a deep thrust of a fine needle, but all pain vanished with the departure of the fly. Having caught a specimen of this fly, I next proceeded to institute a comparison between it and the tetsi, as described by Dr. Livingston on page 56 to 57, Missionary Travels and Researches in South Africa, Murray's edition of 1868. The points of disagreement are many, and such as to make it entirely improbable that this fly is a true tetsi. Though my men unanimously stated that its bite was fatal to horses as well as to donkeys. A descriptive abstract of the tetsi would read thus. Not much larger than a common housefly, nearly of the same brown colour as the honeybee. After part of the body has yellow bars across it. It has a peculiar buzz, and its bite is death to the horse, ox, and dog. On man the bite has no effect, neither has it on wild animals. When allowed to feed on the hand, it inserts the middle prong of three portions, into which the proboscis divides. It then draws the prong out a little way, and it assumes a crimson colour as the mandibles come into brisk operation. A slight itching irritation follows the bite. The fly which I had under inspection is called Mabunga, by the natives. It is much larger than the common housefly, fully a third larger than the common honeybee, and its colour more distinctly marked. Its head is black with a greenish gloss to it. The outer part of the body is marked by a white line running lengthwise, from its junction with the trunk, and on each side of this white line are two other lines, one of a crimson colour, the other of a light brown. As for its buzz, there is no peculiarity in it. It might be mistaken for that of a honey-bee. When caught, it made desperate efforts to get away, but never attempted to bite. This fly, along with a score of others, attacked my grey horse, and bit it so sorely in the legs that they appeared as if bathed in blood. Hence, I might have been a little vengeful if, with more than the zeal of an entomologist, I caused it to disclose whatever peculiarities its biting parts possessed. In order to bring this fly as lifelike as possible before my readers, I may compare its head to most tiny miniature of an elephant's, because it had a black proboscis and a pair of horny antennae, which in colour and curve resembled tusks. The black proboscis, however, there's simply a hollow sheath, which encloses, when not in the act of biting, four reddish and sharp lancets. Under the microscope, these four lancets differ in thickness. Two are very thick, the third is slender, but the fourth, of an opal colour and almost transparent, is exceedingly fine. 
this last must be the sucker. When the fly is about to wound, the two horny antennae are made to embrace the part, the lancets are unsheathed, and in an instant the incision is performed. This I consider to be the African horsefly. The second fly, which sang the tenor notes, more nearly resembled in size and description the tetsi. It was exceedingly nimble, and it occupied three soldiers nearly an hour to capture a specimen. And, when it was finally caught, it stung most ravenously the hand, and never ceased its efforts to attack until it was pinned through. It had three or four white marks across the after part of its body, but the biting parts of this fly consisted of two black antennae, and an opal-coloured style, which folded away under the neck. When about to bite, this style was shot out straight, and the antenna embraced it closely. After death, the fly lost its distinctive white marks. Only one of this species did we see at the camp. The third fly, called Chafwa, pitched a weak alto crescendo note, was a third larger than the house fly, and had long wings. If this insect sang the feeblest note, it certainly did the most work, and inflicted the most injury. Horses and donkeys streamed with blood, and reared and kicked through the pain. So determined was it, not to be driven before it obtained its fill, that it was easily dispatched. But this dreadful enemy to cattle constantly increased in numbers. The three species above named, are, according to natives, fatal to cattle, and this may perhaps be the reason why such a vast expanse of first-class pasture is without domestic cattle of any kind, a few goats only being kept by the villagers. This fly I subsequently found to be the tetsi. On the second morning, instead of proceeding, I deemed it more prudent to await the fourth caravan. Burton experimented sufficiently for me on the promised word of the Banyans of Kaoli and Zanzibar, and waited eleven months before he received the promised articles. As I did not expect to be much over that time on my errand altogether, it would be ruin, absolute and irredeemable, should I be detained at Unyanyembe so long a time by my caravan. Pending its arrival, I sought the pleasures of the chase. I was but a tyro in hunting, I confess, though I had shot a little on the plains of America and Persia. Yet I considered myself a fair shot, and on game ground, and within a reasonable proximity to game, I doubted not but I could bring some to camp. After a march of a mile through the tall grass of the open, we gained the glades between the jungles. Unsuccessful here, after ever so much prying into fine hiding-places and lurking corners, I struck a trail well traversed by small antelope and herd beast, which we followed. It led me into a jungle, and down a watercourse bisecting it. But, after following it for an hour, I lost it, and, in endeavouring to retrace it, lost my way. However, my pocket compass stood me in good stead, and by it I steered for the open plain, in the centre of which stood the camp. But it was terribly hard work, this of plunging through an African jungle, ruinous to clothes, and trying to the cuticle. In order to travel quickly, I had donned a pair of flannel pyjamas, and my feet were encased in canvas shoes. As might be expected, before I had gone a few paces, a branch of the acacia horrida, only one of a hundred such annoyances, caught the right leg of my pyjamas at the knee, and ripped it almost clean off, succeeding which, a stumpy colquoil caught me by the shoulder, and another rip was the inevitable consequence. And a few yards further on, a prickly aloetic plant disfigured by a wide tear the other leg of my pyjamas. And almost immediately, I tripped against a convolvulus, strong as rattling, and was made to measure my length on a bed of thorns. It was on all fours, like a hound on a scent, that I was compelled to travel my solar topi getting the worse for wear every minute, my skin getting more and more wounded, my clothes at each stage becoming more and more tattered. 
Besides these discomforts, there was a pungent, acrid plant, which, apart from its strong odorous emissions, struck me smartly on the face, leaving a burning effect similar to cayenne. And the atmosphere, pent in by the density of the jungle, was hot and stifling, and the perspiration transuded through every pore, making my flannel tatters feel as if I had been through a shower. When I had finally regained the plain, and could breathe free, I mentally vowed that the penetralia of an African jungle should not be visited by me again, save under most urgent necessity. The second and third day passed without any news of Maganga. Accordingly, Shaw and Bombay were sent to hurry him up by all means. On the fourth morning, Shaw and Bombay returned, followed by the procrastinating Maganga and his laggard people. Questions only elicited an excuse that his men had been too sick, and he had feared to tax their strength before they were quite equal to stand the fatigue. Moreover, he suggested that as they would be compelled to stay one more day at the camp, I might push on to Kingaroo and camp there until his arrival. Acting upon which suggestion, I broke camp and started for Kingaroo, distant five miles. On this march the land was more broken, and the caravan first encountered jungle, which gave considerable trouble to our cart. Pisolitic limestone cropped out in boulders and sheets, and we began to imagine ourselves approaching healthy highlands, and as if to give confirmation to the thought, to the north and northwest loomed the purple cones of Udoi, and topmost of all Delemi Peak, about one thousand five hundred feet in height above the sea level. But soon after, sinking into a bowl like valley green with tall corn, the road slightly deviated from northwest to west, the country still rolling before us in wavy undulations. In one of the depressions between these lengthy land swells stood the village of Kingaroo, with surroundings sufficient in their aspect of ague and fever. Perhaps the clouds surcharged with rain, and the overhanging ridges and their dense forests, dulled by the gloom, made the place more than usually disagreeable. But my first impressions of the sodden hollow, pent in by those dull woods, with the deep gully close by containing pools of stagnant water, were by no means agreeable. Before we could arrange our camp and set the tents up, down poured the furious harbinger of the Masaki season, in torrents sufficient to damp the ardour and newborn love for East Africa I had lately manifested. However, despite rain, we worked on until our camp was finished, and the property was safely stored from weather and thieves, and we could regard with resignation the raindrops beating the soil into mud of a very tenacious kind, and forming lakelets and rivers of our camping ground. Towards night, the scene having reached its acme of unpleasantness, the rain ceased, and the natives poured into camp from the villages, in the woods with their vendables. Foremost amongst these, as if in duty bound, came the village sultan, lord, chief, or head, bearing three measures of matama and half a measure of rice, of which he begged, with paternal smiles, my acceptance. But under his smiling mask, blearied eyes, and wrinkled front, was the visible soul of trickery, which was of the cunningest kind. Responding under the same mask adopted in this knavish elder, I said, The chief of Kingaroo has called me a rich sultan. If I am a rich sultan, why comes not the chief with a rich present to me, that he might get a rich return? Said he, with another leer of his wrinkled visage, Kingaroo is poor, there is no matama in the village. To which I replied, that since there was no matama in the village, I would pay him half a shaka, or a yard of cloth, which would be exactly equivalent to his present, that if he preferred to call his small basketful a present, I should be content to call my yard of cloth a present. With which logic he was fain to be satisfied. April 1st. Today the expedition suffered a loss in the death of the grey Arab horse presented by Said Burgasha, Sultan of Zanzibar. 
The night previous I had noticed that the horse was suffering. Bearing in mind what has been so frequently asserted, namely, that no horses could live in the interior of Africa because of the tetsi, I had him opened, and the stomach, which I believed to be diseased, examined. Besides much undigested matama and grass, there were found twenty-five short, thick, white worms, sticking like leeches into the coating of the stomach, while the intestines were almost alive with the number of long, white worms. I was satisfied that neither man nor beast could long exist with such a mass of corrupting life within him. In order that the dead carcass might not taint the valley, I had it buried deep in the ground, about a score of yards from the encampment. From such a slight cause ensued a tremendous uproar from Kingaroo, chief of the village, who, with his brother chiefs of the neighbouring villages, numbering in the aggregate two dozen wattle huts, had taken counsel upon the best means of marketing the Musungu of a full dotai, or two of Merikani, and finally had arrived at the conviction that the act of burying a dead horse in their soil, without, by your leave, sir, was a grievous and finable fault. Affecting great indignation at the unpardonable omission, he, Kingaroo, concluded to send the Musangi, four of his young men, to say to him that, Since you have buried your horse in my ground, it is well. Let him remain there, but you must pay me two dotai of Makani. For reply the messengers were told to say to the chief, that I would prefer talking the matter over with himself face to face, if he would condescend to visit me in my tent once again, as the village was but a stone's throw from our encampment. Before many minutes had elapsed, the wrinkled elder made his appearance at the door of my tent, with about half the village behind him. The following dialogue which took place will serve to illustrate the tempers of the people with whom I was about to have a year's trading intercourse. White man, are you the great chief of the Kingaroo? Kingaroo, aha, uh -huh, yes. White man, the great, great chief? Kingaroo, aha, uh -huh, yes. White man, how many soldiers have you? Kingaroo, why? White man, how many fighting men have you? Kingaroo, none. White man, Oh, I thought you might have a thousand men with you, but you're going to fine a strong white man, who has plenty of guns and soldiers, two dot high for burying a dead horse. Kingaroo, rather perplexed, No, I have no soldiers, I have only a few young men. White man, Why do you come and make trouble, then? Kingaroo, It was not I, it was my brothers who said to me, Come here, come here, Kingaroo, see what the white man has done. He has not taken possession of your soil, in that he has put his horse into your ground without your permission. Come, go to him, and see by what right. Therefore have I come to ask you, who gave you permission to use my soil for a burying ground? White man, I want no man's permission to do what is right. My horse died. Had I left him to fester and stink in your valley, sickness would visit your village. Your water would become unwholesome and caravans would not stop here for trade. For they would say, This is an unlucky spot, let us go away. But enough said. I understand you to say that you do not want him buried in your ground. The error I have fallen into is easily put right. This minute my soldiers shall dig him out again, and cover up the soil as it was before, and the horse shall be left where he died. Then, shouting to Bombay, Ho, Bombay, take soldiers with jembers, to dig my horse out of the ground, drag him to where he died, and make everything ready for a march to-morrow morning. Kingaroo, his voice considerably higher, and his head moving to and fro with emotion, cries out, Aquana, Aquana, Bana! No, no, master. Let not the white man get angry. The horse is dead, and now lies buried. Let him remain so, since he is already there, and let us be friends again. The sheikh of Kingaroo being thus brought to his senses, we bid each other the friendly quarry, and I was left alone to ruminate over my loss. Barely half an hour had elapsed, it was nine p.m., the camp was in a semi-doze, 
when I heard deep groans issuing from one of the animals. Upon inquiry as to what animal was suffering, I was surprised to hear that it was my bay horse. With the bull's-eye lantern I visited him, and perceived that the pain was located in the stomach. But whether it was from some poisonous plant he had eaten while out grazing, or from some equine disease, I did not know. He discharged copious quantities of loose matter, but there was nothing peculiar in its colour. The pain was evidently very great, for his struggles were very violent. I was up all night, hoping that it was but a temporary effect of some strange and noxious plant. But at six o'clock the next morning, after a short period of great agony, he also died, exactly fifteen hours after his companion. When the stomach was opened, it was found that death was caused by the internal rupture of a large cancer, which had affected the larger half of the coating of his stomach, and had extended an inch or two up the larynx. The contents of the stomach and intestines were deluged with the yellow viscous efflux from the cancer. I was thus deprived of both my horses, and that within the short space of fifteen hours. With my limited knowledge of veterinary science, however, strengthened by the actual and positive proofs obtained by the dissection of the two stomachs, I can scarcely state that horses can live to reach Unanyambi, or that they can travel with ease through this part of East Africa. But should I have occasion at some future day, I should not hesitate to take four horses with me, though I should certainly endeavour to ascertain previous to purchase whether they were perfectly sound and healthy, and to those travellers who cherish a good horse, I would say, try one, and be not discouraged by my unfortunate experiences. End of chapter 5, part 2 Chapter 5, part 3 of How I Found Livingstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. How I Found Livingstone Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingstone, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 5, Part 3 Through Ukwe, Ukami, and Udoi to Usagoa. The first, second, and third of April passed, and nothing had we heard or seen of the ever-lagging fourth caravan. In the meanwhile the list of casualties was being augmented. Besides the loss of this precious time, through the perverseness of the chief of the other caravan, and the loss of my two horses, a pagazi, carrying boat fixtures, improved the opportunity and deserted. Selim was struck down with a severe attack of ague and fever, and was soon after followed by the cook, then by the assistant cook and tailor, Abdul Kader. Finally, before the third day was over, Bombay had rheumatism, Oledi, Grant's old valet, had a swollen throat, Zaidi had the flux, Kingaroo had the makonguru, Kamizi, a pagazi, suffered from a weakness of the loins, Vajala had a bilious fever, and before night closed, Makoviga was very ill. Out of a force of twenty-five men, one had deserted, and ten were on the sick list, and the presentment that the ill-looking neighbourhood of Kingaroo would prove calamitous to me was verified. On the 4th of April, Maganga and his people appeared, after being heralded by musketry shots and horn-blowing, the usual signs of an approaching caravan in this land. His sick men were considerably improved, but they required one more day of rest at Kingaroo. In the afternoon he came to lay siege to my generosity, by giving details of sore Haji Palu's heartless cheats upon him. But I informed him that since I had left Bagamoyo, I could no longer be generous. We were now in a land where cloth was at a high premium, that I had no more cloth than I should need to furnish food for myself and men that he and his caravan had cost me more money and trouble than any three caravans I had, as indeed was the case. 
With this counter-statement he was obliged to be content. But I again solved his pecuniary doubts by promising that, if he hurried his caravan on to Unyanyembe, he should have no more cause of complaint. The 5th of April saw the 4th caravan vanish for once in our front, with a fair promise that, however fast we should follow, we should not see them on the hither side of Sinbam Weni. The following morning, in order to rouse my people from the sickened torpitude they had lapsed into, I beat an exhilarating alarm on a tin pan with an iron ladle, intimating that a safari was about to be undertaken. This had a very good effect, judging from the extraordinary alacrity with which it was responded to. Before the sun rose we started. The kangaroo villagers were out with the velocity of hawks, for any rags or refuse left behind us. The long march to Imbiki, fifteen miles, proved that our protracted stay at Kingaroo had completely demoralized my soldiers and pagazis. Only a few of them had strength enough to reach Imbiki before night. The others, attending the laden donkeys, put in an appearance next morning, in a lamentable state of mind and body. Kamizi, the pagazi with the weak loins, had deserted, taking with him two goats, the property tent, and the whole of Uledai's personal wealth, consisting of his visiting dish dashe, a long shirt of the Arabic pattern, ten pounds of beads, and a few fine cloths, which Uledai, in a generous fit, had entrusted to him while he carried the Pagazi's load, seventy pounds of booboo beads. This defalcation was not to be overlooked, nor should Kamizi be permitted to return, without an effort to apprehend him. Accordingly, Uledai and Faraji were dispatched in pursuit while we rested at Imbiki, in order to give the dilapidated soldiers and animals time to recruit. On the 8th we continued our journey, and arrived at Masua. This march will be remembered by our caravan as the most fatiguing of all though the distance was but ten miles. It was one continuous jungle, except three interjacent glades of narrow limits, which gave us three breathing pauses in the dire task of jungle travelling. The odour emitted from its fell plants was so rank, so pungently acrid, and the miasma from its decayed vegetation so dense, that I expected every moment to see myself and men drop down in paroxysms of acute fever. Happily this evil was not added to that of loading and unloading the frequently falling packs. Seven soldiers to attend seventeen laden donkeys was entirely too small a number while passing through a jungle. For while the path is but a foot wide, with a wall of thorny plants and creepers bristling on each side, and projecting branches darting across it, with knots of spiky twigs stiff as spike-nails, ready to catch and hold anything above four feet in height, it is but reasonable to suppose that donkeys standing four feet high, with loads measuring across from bale to bale four feet, would come to grief. This grief was of frequent reoccurrence here, causing us to pause every few minutes for rearrangements. So often had this task to be performed, that the men got perfectly discouraged, and had to be spoken to sharply before they set to work. By the time I reached Masua, there was nobody with me and the ten donkeys I drove, but Mabruk the Little, who, though generally stolid, stood to his work like a man. Bombay and Uledi were far behind, with the most jaded donkeys. Shaw was in charge of the cart, and his experiences were most bitter, as he informed me he had expanded a whole vocabulary of stormy abuse known to sailors and a new one which he had invented ex tempore. He did not arrive until two o'clock next morning, and was completely worn out. Another halt was fixed at Musawa, that we and our animals might recuperate. The chief of the village, a white man in everything but colour, sent me and mine the fattest broad-tailed sheep of his flock, with five measures of matatma grain. The mutton was excellent, unapproachable. For his timely and needful present I gave him two dotai, 
and amused him with an exhibition of the wonderful mechanism of the Winchester rifle and my breech-loading revolvers. He and his people were intelligent enough to comprehend the utility of these weapons at an emergency, and illustrated in expressive pantomime the powers they possessed against numbers of people armed only with spears and bows, by extending their arms with an imaginary gun and describing a clear circle. Verily, said they, the Wasungu are far wiser than the Washenzi. What heads they have, what wonderful things they make. Look at their tents, their guns, their timepieces, their clothes, and that little rolling thing, the cart, which carries more than five men. Key. On the tenth, recovered from the excessive strain of the last march, the caravan marched out of the Musua, accompanied by the hospitable villagers as far as their stake defence. Receiving the unanimous Quaheris. Outside the village, the march promised to be less arduous than between Imbaki and Musawa. After crossing a beautiful little plain, interceded by a dry gully or matonai, the route led by a few cultivated fields, where the tillers greeted us with one grand, unwinking stare, as if fascinated. Soon after, we met one of those sights common in part of the world to wit a chain slave gang bound east the slaves did not appear to be in any way downhearted on the contrary they seemed imbued with the philosophic jollity of the jolly servant of martin chuzzlewit were it not for their chains it would have been difficult to discover master from slave the physiognomic traits were alike the mild benignity with which we regarded was equally visible on all faces the chains were ponderous. They might have held elephants captive. But as the slaves carried nothing but themselves, their weight could not have been insupportable. The jungle was scant on this march, and though in some places the packs met with accidents, they were not such as seriously to retard progress. By 10 a.m. we were in camp in the midst of an imposing view of green sward and forest, domed by a cloudless sky. We had again pitched our camp in the wilderness, and, as is the custom of caravans, fired two shots to warn any Washenzi, having grain to sell, that we were willing to trade. Our next halting place was Kizimo, distant but eleven miles from Musawa, a village situated in a populous district, having in its vicinity no less than five other villages, each fortified by stakes and thornia betis with as much fierce independence as if their petty lords were so many Perses and Douglases. Each topped a ridge, or a low hummock, with an assumption of his own defiance of the cock on its own dunghill type. Between these humble eminences and low ridges of land wind narrow vales which are favoured with the cultivation of matama and Indian corn. Behind the village flows the Ungarangari River, an impetuous stream during the Masika season, capable of overflowing its steep banks. But in the dry season it subsides into its proper status, which is that of a small stream of very clear, sweet water. Its course from Kizimo is southwest, then easterly. It is the main feeder of the Kingani River. The bells of Kizimo are noted for their vanity in brass wire, which is wound in spiral rings round their wrists and ankles, and the varieties of style which their hispid heads exhibit, while their poor lords, obliged to be contented with dingy torn clouts and split ears, shows what wide sway Asmodeus holds over this terrestrial sphere. For it must have been an unhappy time when the harsh besieged husbands finally give way before their spouses. Besides these brassy ornaments on their extremities, and the various hair-dressing styles, the women of Kizimo frequently wear lengthy necklaces, which run in rivers of colours down their bodies. A more comical picture is seldom presented than that of one of these highly dressed females, engaged in the homely and necessary task of grinding corn for herself and family. 
The grinding apparatus consists of two portions. One, a thick pole of hard wood about six feet long, answering for a pestle. The other, a capacious wooden mortar, three feet in height. While engaged in setting his tent, Shaw was obliged to move a small flat stone to drive a peg into the ground. The village chief, who saw him do it, rushed up in a breathless fashion and replaced the stone instantly, then stood on it in an impressive manner, indicative of the great importance attached to that stone and location. Bombay, seeing Shaw standing in silent wonder at the act, volunteered to ask the chief what was the matter. This sheikh solemnly answered, with a finger pointing downwards, a ganga, whereupon I implored him to let me see what was under the stone. With a graciousness quite affecting, he complied. My curiosity was gratified with the sight of a small whittled stick, which pinned fast to the ground an insect, the cause of a miscarriage to a young female of the village. During the afternoon, a ledi and Faraji, who had been dispatched after the truant Kamizi, returned with him and all the missing articles. Kamizi, soon after leaving the road and plunging into the jungle, where he was mentally trumphing in his booty, was met by some of the plundering Washenzi, who were always on the quivive for stragglers, and unceremoniously taken to their village in the woods, and bound to a tree, preparatory to being killed. Kamizi said that he had asked them why they tied him up, to which they answered that they were about to kill him, because he was a Maguana, whom they were accustomed to kill as soon as they were caught. But Iledai and Faraji, shortly after coming upon the scene, both well armed, put an end to the debates upon Kamizi's fate, by claiming him as an absconding Pagazi from the Musongu's camp, as well as all the articles he possessed at the time of capture. The robbers did not dispute the claim for the Pagazi, goats, tent, or any other valuable found with him, but intimated that they deserved a reward for apprehending him. The demand being considered just, a reward to the extent of two doti and a fundo, or ten necklaces of beads, was given. Kamizi, for his desertion and attempted robbery, could not be pardoned without first suffering punishment. He had asked at Bagamoyo, before enlisting in my service, an advance of five dollars, in money, and had received it, and a load of booby beads, no heavier than a pagazi's load, had been given him to carry. He had, therefore, no excuse for desertion. Lest I should overstep prudence, however, in punishing him, I convened a court of eight pagazis and four soldiers to sit in judgment, and asked them to give me their decision as to what should be done. Their unanimous verdict was that he was guilty of a crime almost unknown among the Wanyamwezi Pagazis, and as it was likely to give a bad repute to the Wanyamwezi carriers, they therefore sentenced him to be flogged with the great master's donkey whip, which was accordingly carried out to poor Kamizi's crying sorrow. On the twelfth the caravan reached Masoadai, on the Ungarangari River. Happily for our patient donkeys, this march was free from all the annoying troubles of the jungle. Happily for ourselves also, for we had no more the care of the packs and the anxiety about arriving at camp before night. The packs, once put firmly on the backs of our good donkeys, they marched into camp, the road being excellent, without a single displacement or cause for one impatient word, soon after leaving Kizimo. A beautiful prospect, glorious in its wild nature, fragrant with its numerous flowers and variety of sweetly smelling shrubs, among which I recognized the wild sage, the indigo plant, etc., terminated only at the foot of Kira Peak and Sister Cones, which marked the boundaries between Adoe and Akami, yet distant twenty miles. Those distant mountains formed a not unfit background to this magnificent picture of open plain, forest patches, and sloping lawns. 
there was enough of picturesqueness and sublimity in the blue mountains to render it one complete whole. Suppose a Byron saw some of these scenes. He would be inclined to poetize in this manner. Morn dawns, and with its stern Edoe's hills, dark Uragum's rocks, and Kira's peak, robed in half a mist, bedewed with various rills, arrayed in many a dune and purple streak. When drawing near the valley of the Ungarangari, granite knobs and protuberances of dazzling quartz showed their heads above the reddish soil. Descending the ridge where these rocks were prominent, we found ourselves in the sable loam deposit of the Ungarangari, and in the midst of teeming fields of sugar cane and matama, Indian corn, mahogany, and gardens of curry, egg, and cucumber plants. On the banks of the Ungarangari flourished the banana, and overtopping it by seventy feet and more, shot up the stately Mapramusai, the rival in beauty of the Persian Shinar and Abyssinian plain. Its trunk is straight and calmly enough for the mainmast of a first-class frigate, while its expanding crown of leafage is distinguished from all others by its density and vivid greenness. There was a score of varieties of the larger kind of trees, whose far-extending branches embraced across the narrow but swift river. The depressions of the valley and the immediate neighbourhood of the river were choked with young forests of tiger-grass and stiff reeds. Masaudai is situated on a higher elevation than the average level of the village, and consequently looks down upon its neighbours, which number a hundred and more. It is the western extremity of Ukwer, on the western bank of the Ungarangari. The territory of the Wakami commences. We had to halt one day at Musaudai, because the poverty of the people prevented us from procuring the needful amount of grain. The cause of this scantiness in such a fertile and populous valley was that the number of caravans which had preceded us had drawn heavily from their stores for the upmarches. On the 14th we crossed the Ungarangari, which here flows southerly to the southern extremity of the valley, where it bends easterly as far as Kisimo. After crossing the river here, fordable at all times and only twenty yards in breadth, we had another mile of the valley with its excessively moist soil and rank growth of grass. It then ascended into a higher elevation, and led through a forest of Maparamusai, tamarind, tamarisk, acacia, and the blooming mimosa. This ascent was continued for two hours, when we stood upon the spine of the largest ridge, where we could obtain free views of the wooded plain below, and the distant ridges of Kisimo, which we had but lately left. The descent of a few hundred feet terminated, in a deep but dry matonai with a sandy bed, on the other side of which we had to regain the elevation we had lost, and a similar country opened into view until we found a newly made boma with well-built huts of grass near a pool of water, which we at once occupied as a halting place for the night. The cart gave us considerable trouble. Not even our strongest donkey, though it carried with ease on its back a hundred and ninety-six pounds, could draw the cart with a load of only two hundred and twenty-five pounds weight. Early on the morning of the fifteenth we broke camp and started for Makesh. By eight-thirty a.m. we were ascending the southern face of the Kira Peak. When we had gained the height of two hundred feet above the level of the surrounding country, we were gratified with a magnificent view of a land whose soil knows no Sabbath. After travelling the spine of a ridge abutting against the southern slope of Kira, we again descended into the little valley of Kirwima, the first settlement we meet in Udoi, where there is always an abundant supply of water. Two miles west of Kirwima is Makish. On the 16th we reached Ulagala, after a few hours' march. Ulagala is the name of a district, or a portion of a district, lying between the mountains of Uragura, 
which bound it southerly, and the mountains of Udoe, lying northerly in parallel with them, and but ten miles apart. The principal part of the basin thus formed is called Ulagala. Mohale is the next settlement, and here we found ourselves in the territory of Wasagua. On this march we were hemmed in by mountains, on our left by those of the Urugura, on our right by those of Udoa and Usagua, a most agreeable and welcome change to us after the long miles of monotonous level we had hitherto seen. When tired of looking into the depths of the forest that still ran on either side of the road, we had but to look up to the mountain's base, to note its strange trees, its plants, and vari-coloured flowers. We had but to raise our heads to vary this pleasant occupation by observing the lengthy and sinuous spine of the mountains, and mentally report upon their outline, their spurs, their projections and ravines, their bulging rocks and deep clefts, and, above all, the dark green woods clothing them from summit to base and when our attention was not required for the mundane task of regarding the donkey's packs, or the pace of the cautious stepping pagazis, it was grateful to watch the vapours play about the mountain summits, to see them fold into fleecy crowns and fantastic clusters, dissolve, gather together into a pool that threatened rain, and sail away again before the brightening sun. At Mahale was the fourth caravan under Maganga, with three more sick men, who turned with eager eyes to myself, the dispenser of medicine, as I approached. Salvos of small arms greeted me, and a present of rice and ears of Indian corn for roasting were awaiting my acceptance. But, as I told Maganga, I would have preferred to hear that his party were eight or ten marches ahead. At this camp also we met Salim bin Rashid, bound eastward, with a huge caravan carrying three hundred ivory tusks. This good Arab, besides welcoming the newcomer with a present of rice, gave me news of Livingstone. He had met the old traveller at Ujiji, had lived in the next but to him for two weeks, described him as looking old, with long grey moustaches and beard, just recovered from severe illness, looking very wan. When fully recovered, Livingstone intended to visit a country, called Manyama, by way of Morungu. The valley of the Ungarangari, with Mahale, exhibits wonderful fertility. Its crops of Matama were of the tallest, and its Indian corn would rival the best crops ever seen in the Arkansas bottoms. The numerous mountain-fed streams rendered the great depth of loan very sloppy, in consequence of which several accidents occurred before we reached the camp, such as wetting cloth, mildewing tea, watering sugar, and rusting tools. But prompt attention to these necessary things saved us from considerable loss. There was a slight difference noticed in the demeanour and bearing of the Wasagua, compared with the Wadoe, Wakami, and Wukwe heretofore seen. There was none of that civility which we had been until now pleased to note. Their expressed desire to barter was accompanied with insolent hints that we ought to take their produce at their own prices. If we remonstrated, they became angry, retorting fiercely, impatient of opposition, they flew into passion, and would glibe in threats. This strange conduct, so opposite to that of the calm and gentle workwear, may be excellently illustrated by comparing the manner of the hot-headed Greek with that of the cool and collected German. Necessity compelled us to purchase eatables of them, and, to the credit of the country and its productions, be it said, their honey had the peculiar flavour of that of famed Hymettus. Following the latitudinal valley of the Ungarangari, within two hours on the following morning, we passed close under the wall of the capital of Usaga. Simbamweni. The first view of the walled town at the western foot of the Urguru Mountains, with its fine valley abundantly beautiful, watered by two rivers, and several pellucid streams of water 
distilled by the dew and cloud-enriched heights around, was one that we did not anticipate to meet in eastern Africa. In Mazanderin, Persia, such a scene would have answered our expectations, but here it was totally unexpected. The town may contain a population of three thousand, having about one thousand houses. Being so densely crowded, perhaps five thousand would more closely approximate. The houses in the town are eminently African, but of the best type of construction. The fortifications are on an Arabic-Persic model, combining Arab neatness with Persian plan. Through a ride of 950 miles in Persia, I never met a town outside of the great cities better fortified than Simbam Weni. In Persia the fortifications were of mud. Even those of Kasvin, Teheran, Isfahan, and Shiraz. Those of Simban Weni are of stone, pierced with two rows of loopholes for musketry. The area of the town is about half a square mile, its plan being quadrangular. Well-built towers of stone guard each corner, four gates, one facing each cardinal point, and set halfway between the several towers, permit ingress and egress for its inhabitants. The gates are closed with solid square doors made of African teak, and carved with the infinitesimally fine and complicated devices of the Arabs, from which I suspect that the doors were made either at Zanzibar or on the coast, and conveyed to Simbamweni plank by plank. Yet, as there is much communication between Bagamoyo and Simbamweni, it is just possible that native artisans are the authors of this ornate workmanship as several doors chiselled and carved in the same manner, though not quite so elaborately, were visible in the largest houses. The palace of the sultan is after the style of those on the coast, with long sloping roof, wide eaves, and veranda in front. The sultana is the eldest daughter of the famous Kisabengo, a name infamous throughout the neighbouring countries of Udoi, Okami, Ukwe, Kingaroo, Ukwenai, and Kingaroo Wana, for his kidnapping propensities. Kisabengo was another Theodore on a small scale. Sprung from humble ancestry, he acquired distinction for his personal strength, his powers of harangue, and his amusing and versatile address, by which he gained great ascendancy over fugitive slaves, and was chosen a leader among them. Fleeing from justice, which awaited him at the hands of the Zanzibar Sultan, he arrived in Akami, which extended at that time from Ukwe to Usagara, and here he commenced a career of conquest. The result of which was the cession by the Wakami of an immense tract of fertile country in the valley of the Ungarangari. On its most desirable site, with the river flowing close under the walls, he built his capital, and called it Simbamweni, which means the lion, or the strongest city. In old age the successful robber and kidnapper changed his name of Kisambengo, which gained such a notoriety, to Simbamweni, after his town. And when dying, after desiring that his eldest daughter should succeed him, he bestowed the name of the town upon her also, which name of Simbamweni the Sultana now retains and is known by. While crossing a rapid stream, which, as I said before, flowed close to the walls, the inhabitants of Simbamweni had a fine chance of gratifying their curiosity, of seeing the great Musungu, whose several caravans had preceded him, and who unpardonably, because unlicensed, had spread a report of his great wealth and power. I was thus the object of a universal stare. At one time, on the banks, there were considerably over a thousand natives going through the several tenses and moods of the verb to stare, or exhibiting every phrase of the substantive, viz. the stare peremptory, insolent, sly, cunning, modest, and casual. The warriors of the Sultana, holding in one hand the spear, the bow, 
and sheaf or musket, embraced with the other their respective friends. Like so many models of Nisus and Eurylus, Theseus and Pyrrhus, Damon and Pythias, or Achilles and Petroclus, to whom they confidently related their diverse opinions upon my dress and colour. The words, Masungu Kuba, had as much charm for these people as the music of the Pied Piper had for the rats of Hamlin, since they served to draw from within the walls, across their stream, so large a portion of the population. And when I continued the journey to the Ungarengari, distant four miles, I feared that the Hamlin catastrophe might have to be repeated before I could rid myself of them. But fortunately for my peace of mind, they finally proved vincible under the hot sun, and the distance we had to go to the camp. As we were obliged to overhaul the luggage and repair saddles, as well as to doctor a few of the animals, whose backs had by this time become very sore, I determined to halt here two days. Provisions were very plentiful also at Simbamwene, though comparatively dear. On the second day I was, for the first time, made aware that my acclimatization of the ague-breeding swamps of Arkansas was powerless against the Makungaru of East Africa. The premonitory symptoms of the African type were felt in my system at 10 a.m. First, general lassitude prevailed, with a disposition to drowsiness. Secondly came the spinal ache, which, commencing from the loins, ascended the vertebrae, and extended around the ribs until it reached the shoulders, where it settled into a weary pain. Thirdly came a chilliness over the whole body, which was quickly followed by a heavy head, swimming eyes, and throbbing temples with vague vision, which distorted and transformed all objects of sight. This lasted until 10 p.m., and the Makungaru left me, much prostrated in strength. The remedy, applied for three mornings in succession after the attack, was such as my experience in Arkansas had taught me was the most powerful corrective, viz., a quantum of fifteen grains of quinine, taken in three doses of five grains each, every other hour from dawn till meridian. The first dose to be taken immediately after the first effect of the purging medicine taken at bedtime the night previous. I may add that this treatment was perfectly successful in my case, and in all others which occurred in my camp. After the Makungaru had declared itself, there was no fear, with such a treatment of it, of a second attack, until at least some days afterwards. On the third day the camp was visited by the ambassadors of Her Highness the Sultana of Simbamwene, who came as her representatives, to receive the tribute which she regards herself as powerful enough to enforce. But they, as well as Madame Simbamwene, were informed that as we knew it was their custom to charge owners of caravans but one tribute, and as they remembered the Musungu, Farker, had paid already, it was not fair that I should have to pay again. The ambassadors replied, with a Nagemi, very well, and promised to carry my answer back to their mistress. Though it was by no means very well. In fact, as it will be seen in a subsequent chapter, how the female Simbamwene took advantages of an adverse fortune which befell me to pay herself. With this I close the chapter of incidents experienced during our transit across the maritime region. End of chapter 5, part 3「Chapter 6, Part 1, to Ogogo 
The distance from Bagamoyo to Simbamweni we found to be 119 miles, and was accomplished in 14 marches. But these marches, owing to difficulties arising from the Masika season, and more especially to the lagging of the fourth caravan under Maganga, extended to 29 days, thus rendering our progress very slow indeed, but a little more than four miles a day. I infer from what I have seen of the travelling that had I not been encumbered by the sick Wanyamwezi porters, I could have accomplished the distance in sixteen days. For it was not the donkeys that proved recreant to my confidence. They, poor animals, carrying a weight of one hundred and fifty pounds each, arrived at Simbamweni in first-rate order. But it was Maganga, composed of greed and laziness, and his weakly bodied tribe who were ever falling sick. In dry weather the number of marches might have been much reduced. Of the half-dozen of Arabs or so who preceded this expedition along this route, two accomplished the entire distance in eight days. From the brief descriptions given of the country, as it day by day expanded to our view, enough may be gleaned to give readers a fair idea of it. The elevation of Simbamweni cannot be much over one thousand feet above the level, the rise of the land having been gradual. It being the rainy season, about which so many ominous statements were doled out to us by those ignorant of the character of the country, we naturally saw it under its worst aspect. But, even in this adverse phase of it, with all its death of black mud, its excessive dew, its dripping and chill grass, its density of rank jungle, and its fevers, I look back upon the scene with pleasure for the wealth and prosperity it promises to some civilized nation, which in some future time will come and take possession of it. A railroad from Bagamoyo to Simbamweni might be constructed with as much ease and rapidity as, and at far less cost, than the Union Pacific Railway, whose rapid strides day by day towards completion the world heard of and admired. A residence in this part of Africa, after a thorough system of drainage had been carried out, would not be attended with more discomfort than generally follows upon the occupation of new land. The temperature at this season during the day never exceeded 85 degrees Fahrenheit. The nights were pleasant, too cold without a pair of blankets for covering, and, as far as Simbamweni, they were without that pest which is so dreadful in the Nebraska and Kansas prairies, the mosquito. The only annoyances I know of that would tell hard on the settler is the determined ferocity of the mabungo, or horsefly, the chufwa, etc., already described, which, until the dense forests and jungles were cleared, would be certain to render the keeping of domestic cattle unremunerative. Contrary to expectation, the expedition was not able to start at the end of two days. The third and the fourth days were passed miserably enough in the desponding valley of Ungerengeri. This river, small as it is in the dry seasons, becomes of considerable volume and power during the Masika, as we experience to our sorrow. It serves as a drain to a score of peaks and two long ranges of mountains. Winding along their base, it is the recipient of the cascades seen flashing during the few intervals of sunlight, of all the nullas and ravines which render the lengthy frontage of the mountain slopes so rugged and irregular until it glides into the valley of Simbamweni, a formidable body of water, opposing a serious obstacle to caravans without means to build bridges, added to which was an incessant downfall of rain, such a rain as shuts people indoors and renders them miserable and unamiable, a real London rain, an internal drizzle accompanied with mist and fog. When the sun shone it appeared but a pale image of itself, and old pagazis, wise in their traditions as old whaling captains, shook their heads ominously at the dull spectre, and declared it was doubtful if the rain would cease for three weeks yet. The site of the caravan camp on the hither side of the Ungarangeri was a hotbed of malaria, unpleasant to witness, an abomination to memory. The filth of generations of pagazis had gathered innumerable hosts of creeping things, armies of black, white, and red ants infest the stricken soil. Centipedes, like worms of every hue, clamber over shrubs and plants. Hanging to the undergrowth are the honeycombed nests of yellow-headed wasps, with stings as harmful as scorpions. Enormous beetles, as large as full-grown mice, roll dunghills over the ground. Of all sorts, shapes, 
sizes and hues are the myriadfold vermin with which the ground teems. In short, the richest entomological collection could not vie in variety and numbers with the species which the four walls of my tent enclosed from morning until night. On the fifth morning, or the twenty-third April, the rain gave us a few hours' respite, during which we managed to wade through the Stygian quagmire reeking with noisomeness to the inundated river bank. The soldiers commenced at five a.m. to convey the baggage across from bank to bank over a bridge which was the most rustic of the rustic kind. Only an ignorant African would have been satisfied with its small utility as a means to cross a deep and rapid body of water. Even for light-footed Wanyamwezi pagazis it was anything but comfortable to traverse. Only a professional tightrope performer could have carried a load across with ease. To travel over an African bridge requires first a long leap from land to the limb of a tree, which may or may not be covered by water, followed by a long jump ashore. With seventy pounds weight on his back, the carrier finds it difficult enough. Sometimes he is assisted by ropes extemporized from the long convolvuli which hang from almost every tree, but not always, these being deemed superfluities by the Washensi. Fortunately, the baggage was transferred without a single accident, and though the torrent was strong, the donkeys were dragged through the flood by vigorous efforts and much objurgation without a casualty. This performance of crossing the Ungerengeri occupied fully five hours, though energy, abuse, and fury enough were expended for an army. Reloading and wringing our clothes dry, we set out from the horrible neighborhood of the river, with its reek and filth, in a northerly direction, following a road which led up to easy and level ground. Two obtruding hills were thus avoided on our left, and, after passing them, we had shut out the view of the hateful valley. I always found myself more comfortable and light-hearted while travelling than when chafing and fretting in camp at delays which no effort could avoid, and consequently I fear that some things, while on a march, may be tinted somewhat stronger than their appearance or merit may properly warrant. But I thought that the view opening before us was much more agreeable than the valley of Zimbamweni, with all its indescribable fertility. It was a series of glades, opening one after another between forest clumps of young trees, hemmed in distantly by isolated peaks and scattered mountains. Now and again, as we crested low eminences, we caught sight of the blue Uzagara mountains, bounding the horizon westerly and northerly, and looked down upon a vast expanse of plain which lay between. At the foot of the lengthy slope, well watered by bubbling springs and mountain rills, we found a comfortable kambi with well-made huts, which the natives call Simbo. It lies just two hours or five miles northwest of the Ungerengeri crossing. The ground is rocky, composed principally of quartzose detritus swept down by the constant streams. In the neighborhood of these grow bamboo, the thickest of which was about two and a half inches in diameter. The myombo, a very shapely tree, with a clean trunk like an ash. The imbite, with large fleshy leaves like the mtamba, sycamore, plum tree, the ugaza, or tamarisk, and the mgungo a tree containing several wide branches with small leaves clustered together in a clump, and the silk cotton tree. Though there are no villages or settlements in view of Simbo Kambi, there are several clustered within the mountain folds, inhabited by Wazigua, somewhat prone to dishonest acts and murder. The long, broad plain visible from the eminences crossed between the Ungeringiri and Simbo was now before us, and became known to sorrowful memory subsequently as the Makata Valley. The initial march was from Simbo, its terminus at Rehaneko, at the base of the Usagara Mountains, six marches distant. The valley commences with broad undulations, covered with young forests of bamboo, which grow thickly along the streams, the dwarf fan-palm, the stately palmyra, and the mgungu. These undulations soon become broken by gullies containing water, nourishing dense crops of cane reeds and broad-bladed grass, and, emerging from this district, wide savanna covered with tall grass open into view, with an isolated tree here and there agreeably breaking the monotony of the scene. The Makata is a wilderness containing but one village of the Wasagua, 
throughout its broad expanse. Venison consequently abounds within the forest clumps, and the kudu, hartebeest, antelope, and zebra may be seen at early dawn emerging into the open savannas to feed. At night the sinaina prowls about with its hideous clamour seeking for sleeping prey, man or beast. The slushy mire of the savannas rendered marching a work of great difficulty. Its tenacious hold of the feet told terribly on men and animals. A ten-mile march required ten hours. We were therefore compelled to camp in the middle of this wilderness, and construct a new camby, a measure which was afterwards adopted by half a dozen caravans. The cart did not arrive until nearly midnight, and with it, besides three or four broken-down pagazis, came Bombay with a dolorous tail that having put his load, consisting of the property tent, one large American axe, his two uniform coats, his shirts, beads and cloth, powder, pistol and hatchet, on the ground, to go and assist the cart out of a quagmire, he had returned to the place where he had left it, and could not find it. That he believed that some thieving Washenzi, who always lurk in the rear of caravans to pick up stragglers, had decamped with it. Which dismal tale, told me at black midnight, was not received at all graciously, but rather with most wrathful words, all of which the penitent captain received as his proper due. Working myself into a fury, I enumerated his sins to him. He had lost a goat at Muhale, he had permitted Kamisi to desert with valuable property at Imbiki, he had frequently shown culpable negligence in not looking after the donkeys, permitting them to be tied up at night without seeing that they had water, and in the mornings, when about to march, he preferred to sleep until seven o'clock, rather than wake up early and saddle the donkeys, that we might start at six o'clock. He had shown of late great love for the fire, cowering like a bloodless man before it, torpid and apathetic. He had now lost the property tent in the middle of the Masiki season, by which carelessness the cloth bales would rot and become valueless. He had lost the axe which I should want at Ujiji to construct my boat. And finally he had lost a pistol and hatchet, and a flask full of the best powder. Considering all these things, how utterly incompetent he was to be captain, I would degrade him from his office— and appoint Mabruki Burton instead. Uledi, also, following the example of Bombay, instead of being second captain, should give no orders to any soldiers in future, but should himself obey those given by Mabruki, the said Mabruki being worth a dozen Bombays and two dozen Uledis. And so he was dismissed, with orders to return at daylight to find the tent, axe, pistol, powder, and hatchet. The next morning the caravan— thoroughly fatigued with the last day's exertions, was obliged to halt. Bombay was dispatched after the lost goods. Kingaru, Mabruki the Great, and Mabruki the Little, were dispatched to bring back three doughty worth of grain, on which we were to subsist in the wilderness. Three days passed away, and we were still at camp, awaiting, with what patience we possessed, the return of the soldiers. In the meantime, provisions ran very low. No game could be procured. The birds were so wild. Two days' shooting procured but two potfuls of birds, consisting of grouse, quail, and pigeons. Bombay returned unsuccessfully from his search after the missing property, and suffered deep disgrace. On the fourth day I dispatched Shaw with two more soldiers, to see what had become of Kingaru and the two Mabrukis. Towards night he returned completely prostrated, with a violent attack of the mukunguru, or ague, but bringing the missing soldiers, who were thus left to report for themselves. With most thankful hearts did we quit our camp, where so much anxiety of mind and fretfulness had been suffered, not heeding a furious rain, which, after drenching us all night, might have somewhat damped our ardour for the march under other circumstances. The road for the first mile led over reddish ground, and was drained by gentle slopes falling east and west. But, leaving the cover of the friendly woods, on whose eastern margin we had been delayed so long, we emerged into one of the savannas, whose soil during the rain is as soft as slush, and tenacious as thick mortar, where we were all threatened with the fate of the famous Arkansas traveller, who had sunk so low in one of the many quagmires in Arkansas County, that nothing but his tall stove-pipe hat was left visible. Shaw was sick, and the whole duty of driving the foundering caravan devolved upon myself. The Wanyamezi donkeys stuck in the mire as if they were rooted to it. As fast as one was flogged from a stubborn position, 
prone to the deaths fell another, giving me a Sisyphean labour, which was maddening trader-pelting rain, assisted by such men as Bombay and Uledi, who could not for a whole skin's sake stomach the storm and mire. Two hours of such a task enabled me to drag my caravan over a savannah one mile and a half broad, and barely had I finished congratulating myself over my success, before I was halted by a deep ditch, which, filled with rain-water from the inundated savannas, had become a considerable stream, breast-deep, flowing swiftly into the Makata. Donkeys had to be unloaded, led through a torrent, and loaded again on the other bank, an operation which consumed a full hour. Presently, after straggling through a wood-clump, barring our progress was another stream, swollen into a river. The bridge being swept away, we were obliged to swim and float our baggage over, which delayed us two hours more. Leaving this second river-bank, we splashed, waded, occasionally half-swimming, and reeled through mire, water-dripping grass and matama stalks, along the left bank of the Makata proper, until farther progress was effectually prevented for that day by a deep bend of the river, which we should be obliged to cross the next day. Though but six miles were traversed during that miserable day, the march occupied ten hours. Half dead with fatigue, I yet could feel thankful that it was not accompanied by fever, which it seemed a miracle to avoid. For if ever a district was cursed with the ache, the Makata wilderness ranks foremost of those afflicted. Surely the sight of the dripping woods enveloped in opaque mist, of the inundated country with lengthy swaths of tiger-grass laid low by the turbid flood, of mounds of decaying trees and canes, of the swollen river and the weeping sky, was enough to engender the Mukunguru. The well-used kambi and the heaps of filth surrounding it were enough to create a cholera. The Makata, a river whose breadth during the dry season is but forty feet, in the Masiki season assumes the breadth, depth, and force of an important river. Should it happen to be an unusually rainy season, it inundates the great plain which stretches on either side, and converts it into a great lake. It is the main feeder of the Wami River, which empties into the sea between the ports of Saadani and Winde. About ten miles northeast of the Makata crossing, the Great Makata, the Little Makata, a nameless creek, and the Rudewa River unite and the river thus formed becomes known as the Wami. Throughout Uzagara, the Wami is known as the Mukondokwa. Three of these streams take their rise from the crescent-like Uzagara range, which bounds the Makata plain south and southwesterly, while the Rudewa rises in the northern horn of the same range. So swift was the flow of the Makata, and so much did its unsteady bridge, half buried in the water, imperil the safety of the property, that its transfer from bank to bank occupied fully five hours. No sooner had we landed every article on the other side, undamaged by the water, than the rain poured down in torrents that drenched them all, as if they had been dragged through the river. To proceed through the swamp which an hour's rain had formed was utterly out of the question. We were accordingly compelled to camp in a place where every hour furnished its quota of annoyance. One of the Wangrana soldiers engaged at Bagamoyo, named Kingaru, improved an opportunity to desert with another Magwana's kit. My two detectives, Uledi, Grand's valet, and Sarmian, were immediately dispatched in pursuit, both being armed with American breech-loaders. They went about their task with an adroitness and celerity which augured well for the success. In an hour they returned with the runaway, having found him hidden in the house of a Mzegua chief called Kigondo, who lived about a mile from the eastern bank of the river, and who had accompanied Uledi and Sarmian to receive his reward, and render an account of the incident. Kigondo said, when he had been seated, I saw this man carrying a bundle, and running hard, by which I knew that he was deserting you. We, my wife and I, were sitting in our little watch-hut, watching our corn and, as the road runs close by, this man was obliged to come close to us. We called to him when he was near, saying, "'Master, where are you going so fast? Are you deserting the Muzungu? For we know you belong to him, since you bought from us yesterday two doughty worth of meat.' "'Yes,' said he, "'I am running away. I want to get to Simamweni. If you will take me there, I will give you a doughty. We said to him then, "'Come into our house, and we'll talk it over quietly.' When he was in our house, in an inner room, we locked him up, and went out again to the watch, 
but leaving word with the women to look out for him. We knew that if you wanted him, you would send Askari, soldiers, after him. We had but lit our pipes when we saw two men armed with short guns and having no loads coming along the road, looking now and then on the ground as if they were looking at footmarks. We knew them to be the men we were expecting, so we hailed them and said, "'Masters, what are you looking for?' They said, "'We are looking for a man who has deserted our master. Here are his footsteps. If you have been long in your hut, you must have seen him. Can you tell us where he is?' We said, "'Yes, he is in our house. If you will come with us, we will give him up to you. But your master must give us something for catching him.' As Kegondo had promised to deliver Kingaru up, there remained nothing further to do for Uledi and Sarmian but to take charge of their prisoner, and bring him and his captors to my camp on the western bank of the Makaza. Kingaru received two dozen lashes, and was chained. His captor Adati, besides five keta of red coral beads for his wife. That downpour of rain which visited us the day we crossed the Makaza proved the last of the Masika season. As the first rainfall which we had experienced occurred on the 23rd March, and the last on the 30th April, its duration was thirty-nine days. The seers of Bagamoyo had delivered their vaticinations concerning this same Masika with solemnity. For forty days, said they, rain would fall incessantly, whereas we had but experienced eighteen days' rain. Nevertheless, we were glad that it was over, for we were tired of stopping day after day to dry the bales and grease the tools and ironware, and of seeing all things of cloth and leather rot visibly before our eyes. The first of May found us struggling through the mire and water of the Makata, with a caravan bodily sick from the exertion and fatigue of crossing so many rivers and wading through marshes. Shaw was still suffering from his first Mukunguru. Zaidi, a soldier, was critically ill with the smallpox. The Kichuma Chuma, little irons, had hold of Bombay across the chest, rendering him the most useless of the unserviceables. Mabruk Salim, a youth of lusty frame, following the example of Bombay, laid himself down on the marshy ground, professing his total inability to breast the Makata swamp. Abdul Kader, the Hindi tailor and adventurer, the weakliest of mortal bodies, was ever ailing for lack of force, as he expressed it in French, i.e. strength ever indisposed to work, shiftless, mock-sick, but ever hungry. Oh, God! was the cry of my tired soul. Were all the men of my expedition like this man, I should be compelled to return. Solomon was wise, perhaps from inspiration, perhaps from observation. I was becoming wise by experience, and I was compelled to observe that when mud and wet sapped the physical energy of the lazily inclined, a dog-whip became their begs restoring them to a sound, sometimes to an extravagant activity. For thirty miles from our camp was the Makata Plain an extensive swamp. The water was on an average one foot in depth. In some places we plunged into holes three, four, or even five feet deep. Plash, splash, plash, splash, were the only sounds we heard from the commencement of the march until we found the bomas occupying the only dry spots along the line of march. This kind of work continued for two days, until we came in sight of the Rudewa River, another powerful stream with banks brimful of rushing rainwater. Crossing a branch of the Rudewa, and emerging from the dank, reedy grass crowding the western bank, the view consisted of an immense sheet of water, topped by clumps of grass, tufts, and foliage of thinly scattered trees, bounded ten or twelve miles off by the eastern front of the Usagara mountain range. The acme of discomfort and vexation was realized on the five-mile march from the Rudewa branch. As myself and the Wangwana appeared with the loaded donkeys, the Bagazis were observed huddled on a mound. When asked if the mound was the camp, they replied, No. Why then do you stop here? Ugh! Water plenty! One drew a line across his loins to indicate the depth of water before us. Another drew a line across his chest, another across his throat. Another held his hand over his head, by which he meant that we should have to swim. Swim five miles through a reedy marsh? It was impossible. It was also impossible that such varied accounts could all be correct. Without hesitation, therefore, I ordered the Wangwana to proceed with the animals. After three hours of splashing through four feet of water, we reached dry land, and had traversed the swamp of Makata. 
but not without the swamp with its horrors having left a durable impression upon our minds. No one was disposed to forget its fatigues, nor the nausea of travel which it almost engendered. Subsequently we had to remember its passage still more vividly, and to regret that we had undertaken the journey during the Masika season, when the animals died from this date by twos and threes almost every day until with five sickly, worn-out beasts remained, when the Wangwana, soldiers, and pagazis sickened of diseases innumerable, when I myself was finally compelled to lie abed with an attack of acute dysentery which brought me to the verge of the grave. I suffered more, perhaps, than I might have done had I taken the proper medicine, but my overconfidence in that compound called Collis Brown's Chlorodyne delayed the cure which ultimately resulted from a judicious use of Dover's powder. In no one single case of diarrhoea or acute dysentery had this Chlorodyne, about which so much has been said and written, any effect of lessening the attack whatever, though I used three bottles. To the dysentery contracted during the transit of the Makata swamp, only two fell victims, and those were Pagazi and my poor little dog, Omar, my companion from India. The only tree of any prominence in the Makata valley was the palmyra palm, Borassus flabelliformis, and this grew in some places in numbers sufficient to be called a grove. The fruit was not ripe while we passed, otherwise we might have enjoyed it as a novelty. The other vegetation consisted of the several species of thornbush, and the graceful parachute-topped and evergreen mimosa. The 4th of May we were ascending a gentle slope towards the important village of Rianeco, the first village near to which we encamped in Uzagara. It lay at the foot of the mountain, and its plenitude and mountain air promised its comfort and health. It was a square, compact village, surrounded by a thick wall of mud, enclosing cone-topped huts, roofed with bamboo and hulkus stalks, and contained a population of about a thousand souls. It has several wealthy and populous neighbours, whose inhabitants are independent enough in their manner, but not unpleasantly so. The streams are of the purest water, fresh and pellucid as crystal, bubbling over round pebbles and clean gravel, with a music delightful to hear to the traveller in search of such a sweetly potable element. The bamboo grows to serviceable size in the neighbourhood of Raneco, strong enough for tent and banji poles, and in numbers sufficient to supply an army. The mountain slopes are densely wooded with trees that might supply very good timber for building purposes. We rested four days at this pleasant spot to recruit ourselves and to allow the sick and feeble time to recover a little before testing their ability in the ascent of the Uzagara Mountains. End of chapter 6, part 1《ハウ・アイ・ファウンド・リヴィングストン》この時は、LibriVox のレコーディングです。全ての LibriVox のレコーディングは、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のように、ご覧のよ The 8th of May saw us with our terribly jaded men and animals winding up the steep slope of the first line of hills, gaining the summit of which we obtained a view remarkably grand, which exhibited as in a masterpiece the broad valley of the Makata, with its swift streams like so many cords of silver, as the sunshine played on the unshadowed reaches of water, with its thousands of graceful palms adding not a little to the charm of the scene. With the great wall of the Uruguru and Usapanga mountains dimly blue, but sublime in their loftiness and immensity, forming a fit background to such an extensive, far embracing prospect. Turning our faces west, we found ourselves in a mountain world, fold rising above fold, peak behind peak, cone jostling cone, away to the north, to the west, to the south, the mountain tops rolled like so many vitrified waves. Not one a dust or arid spot was visible in all this scene. The diorama had no sudden changes or striking contrasts, for a universal forest of green trees clothed every peak, cone, and summit. To the men this first day's march through the mountain region of Uzagara was an agreeable interlude after the successive journey over the flats and heavy undulations of the maritime region. 
but to the loaded and enfeebled animals it was most trying. We were minus two by the time we had arrived at our camp, but seven miles from Reneco, our first installment of the debt we owed to Makata. Water, sweet and clear, was abundant in the deep hollows of the mountains, flowing sometimes over beds of solid granite, sometimes over a rich red sandstone, whose soft substance was soon penetrated by the aqueous element and whose particles were swept away constantly to enrich the valley below. And in other ravines it dashed and roared miniature thunder as it leaped over granite boulders and quartz rock. The ninth of May, after another such an up-and-down course, ascending hills and descending into the twilight depths of deepening valleys, we came suddenly upon the Mukondokwa, and its narrow pent-up valley crowded with rank, reedy grass, cane, and thorny bushes, and rugged tamarisk which grappled for existence with monster convolvuli, winding their coils around their trunks with such tenacity and strength that the tamarisk seemed grown but for their support. The valley was barely a quarter of a mile broad in some places, at others it widened to about a mile. The hills on either side shot up into precipitous slopes, clothed with the mimosa, acacia, and tamarisk, enclosing a river and valley whose curves and folds were as various as a serpent's. Shortly after debouching into the Mukondokwa Valley, we struck the road traversed by Captains Buxton and Speke in 1857, between Mbumi and Karatamara. The latter place should be called Mizongi, Karatamara being but the name of a chief. After following the left bank of the Mukondokwa, during which our route diverged to every point from southeast to west, north and northeast, for about an hour, we came to the fort. Beyond the fort, a short half-hour's march, we came to Kiora. At this filthy village of Kiora, which was well grounded with goat dung, and peopled with a wonderful number of children for a hamlet that did not number twenty families, with a hot sun pouring on the limited open space, with a fury that exceeded one hundred and twenty-eight degrees Fahrenheit, which swarmed with flies and insects of known and unknown species. I found, as I had been previously informed, the third caravan, which had started out of Bagamoyo, so well fitted and supplied. The leader, who was no other than the white man Farquhar, was sick abed with swollen legs, Bright's disease, unable to move. As he heard my voice, Farquhar staggered out of his tent, so changed from my spruce mate who started from Bagamoyo that I hardly knew him at first. His legs were ponderous, elephantine, since his leg illness was of elephantiasis, or dropsy. His face was of a deathly pallor, for he had not been out of his tent for two weeks. A breezy hill overlooking the village of Kiora was chosen by me for my camping ground, and as soon as the tents were pitched, the animals attended to, and the boma made of thorn bushes, Farquhar was carried up by four men into my tent. Upon being questioned as to the cause of his illness, he said he did not know what had caused it. He had no pain, he thought, anywhere. I asked, do you not sometimes feel pain on the right side? Yes, I think I do, but I don't know. Nor over the left nipple sometimes, a quick throbbing with the shortness of breath? Yes, I think I have. I know I breathe quick sometimes. He said his only trouble was in the legs, which were swollen to an immense size. Though he had a sound appetite, he yet felt weak in the legs. From the scant information of the disease and its peculiarities, as given by Farquhar himself, I could only make out, by studying a little medical book I had with me, that a swelling of the legs, and sometimes of the body, might result from either heart, liver, or kidney disease. But I did not know to what to ascribe the disease, unless it was to elephantiasis, a disease most common in Zanzibar nor did I know how to treat it in a man who could not tell me whether he felt pain in his head or in his back, in his feet or in his chest. It was therefore fortunate for me that I overtook him at Kiora, though he was about to prove a sore encumbrance to me, for he was not able to walk, and the donkey carriage, after the rough experience of the Makata Valley, was failing. I could not possibly leave him at Kiora. Death would soon overtake him there, but how long I could convey a man in such a state— through a country devoid of carriage, was a question to be resolved by circumstances. On the 11th of May, the third and fifth caravans, now united, followed up the right bank of the Mukondokwa, through fields of Holkus, the great Mukondokwa ranges rising in higher altitude as we proceeded west, 
and enfolding us in a narrow river valley round about. We left Munii Uzagara on our right, and soon after found hill spurs athward our road, which we were obliged to ascend and descend. A march of eight miles from the fort of Mizongi brought us to another fort of the Mukondokwa, where we bid a long adieu to Burton's Road, which led up to the Goma Pass and up the steep slopes of Rubeo. Our road left the right bank and followed the left over a country quite the reverse of the Mukondokwa Valley, enclosed between mountain ranges. Fertile soils and spontaneous vegetation, reeking with miasma and overpowering from their odour, we had exchanged for a drowsy wilderness of aloetic and cactaceous plants, where the colquell and several thorn bushes grew paramount. Instead of the tree-clad heights, slopes, and valleys, instead of cultivated fields, we saw now the confines of uninhabited wilderness. The hilltops were bared of their bosky crowns, and revealed their rocky natures bleached white by rain and sun. Guru Peak, the loftiest of the Uzagara cones, stood right shoulderwards of us as we ascended the long slope of dun-grey soil which rose beyond the brown Mukondokwa on the left. At the distance of two miles from the last fort we found a neat combi, situated close to the river, where it first broke into a furious rapid. The next morning the caravan was preparing for the march when I was informed that the Banam Dogo, little master, shore, had not yet arrived with the cart and the man in charge of it. Late the previous night I had dispatched one donkey for Shaw, who had said he was too ill to walk, and another for the load that was on the cart, and had retired satisfied that they would soon arrive. My conclusion, when I learned in the morning that the people had not yet come in, was that Shaw was not aware that for five days we should have to march through a wilderness totally uninhabited. I therefore dispatched Chaupera, a Mugana soldier, with the following note to him. You will, upon receipt of this order, pitch the cart into the nearest ravine, gully, or river, as well as all the extra pack saddles, and come at once, for God's sake, for we must not starve here. One, two, three, and four hours were passed by me in the utmost impatience, waiting, but in vain, for sure. Having a long march before us, I could wait no longer, but went to meet his party myself. About a quarter of a mile from the fort I met the van of the laggards, stout burly Chaupera, and, O oh, cart-makers, listen! He carried the cart on his head, wheels, shafts, body, axle, and all complete, he having found that carrying it was much easier than drawing it. The sight was such a damper to my regard for it as an experiment that the cart was wheeled into the depths of the tall reeds and there left. The central figure was Shaw himself, riding at a gait which seemed to leave it doubtful on my mind whether he or his animal felt most sleepy. Upon expostulating with him for keeping the caravan so long waiting when there was a march on hand, in a most peculiar voice, which he always assumed when disposed to be ugly-tempered, he said he had done the best he could. But as I had seen the solemn pace at which he rode, I felt dubious about his best endeavours, and of course there was a little scene. But the young European Tongi of an East African expedition must needs sup with the fellows he has chosen. We arrived at Madeta at 4 p.m., minus two donkeys, which had stretched their weary limbs in death. We had crossed the Mukondokwa about 3 p.m., and after taking its bearings and course, I made sure that its rise took place near a group of mountains about 40 miles north by west of Guru Peak. Our road led west-northwest, and at this place finally diverged from the river. On the 14th, after a march of seven miles over hills whose sandstone and granite formation crop visibly here and there above the surface, whose stony and dry aspect seemed reflected in every bush and plant, and having gained an altitude of about eight hundred feet above the flow of the Mukondokwa, we sighted the lake of Ugombo, a grey sheet of water lying directly at the foot of the hill, from whose summit we gazed at the scene. The view was neither beautiful nor pretty, but what I should call refreshing. It afforded a pleasant relief to the eyes fatigued from dwelling on the bleak country around. Besides, the immediate neighbourhood of the lake was too tame to call forth any enthusiasm. There were no grandly swelling mountains, no smiling landscapes, nothing but a dun-brown peak, about one thousand feet high above the surface of the lake at its western extremity, from which the lake derived its name, Ugombo. Nothing but a low, dun-brown irregular range, running parallel with its northern shore at the distance of a mile. 
nothing but the low plain stretching from its western shore far away towards the Mbwapwa mountains and Marenga Mkali, then apparent to us from our coin of vantage, from which extensive scene of dun brownness we were glad to rest our eyes on the quiet grey water beneath. Descending from the summit of the range, which bounded the lake east for about four hundred feet, we travelled along the northern shore. The time occupied on the journey from the eastern to the western extremity was exactly one hour and thirty minutes. As this side represents its greatest length, I conclude that the mile is three miles long by two miles greatest breadth. The immediate shores of the lake, on all sides, for at least fifty feet from the water's edge, is one impassable morass, nourishing rank reeds and rushes, where the hippopotamus ponderous form has crushed into watery trails the soft composition of the morass as he passes from the lake on his nocturnal excursions. The lesser animals, such as the mbogo, buffalo, the punatera, zebra, the twiga, giraffe, the boar, the kudu, the hirax, or coney, and the antelope, come here also to quench their thirst by night. The surface of the lake swarms with an astonishing variety of waterfowl, such as black swan, duck, ibisacra cranes, pelicans, and soaring above on the lookout for their prey are fish eagles and hawks, while the neighborhood is resonant with the loud chirps of the guinea fowls calling for their young, with the harsh cry of the toucan, the cooing of the pigeon, and a tweet to woo of the owl. From the long grass in its vicinity also issue the grating and loud cry of the florican, woodcock, and grouse. Being obliged to hold here two days, owing to the desertion of the Hindi cooper, Jaco, with one of my best carbines, I improved the opportunity of exploring the northern and southern shores of the lake. At the rocky foot of a low, humpy hill on the northern side, about fifteen feet above the present surface of the water, I detected in most distinct and definite lines the agency of waves. From its base could be traced clear to the edge of the dank morass tiny lines of the comminuted shell, as plainly marked as the small particles which lie in rows on a beach after a receding tide. There is no doubt that the wave marks on the sandstone might have been traced much higher by one skilled in geology. It was only its elementary character that was visible to me. Nor do I entertain the least doubt, after a two days' exploration of the neighbourhood, especially of the low plain at the western end, that this lake of Ugombo is but the tail of what was once a large body of water, equal in extent to the Tanganyika. And, after ascending halfway up Ugombo Peak, this opinion was confirmed when I saw the long depressed line of plain at its base stretching towards the Mbwapa mountains thirty miles off, and thence round to Marenga Mkali, and covering all that extensive surface of forty miles in breadth and at unknown length. A depth of twelve feet more, I thought, as I gazed upon it, would give the lake a length of thirty miles, and a breadth of ten. A depth of thirty feet would increase its length over a hundred miles, and give it a breadth of fifty, for such was the level nature of the plain that stretched west of Ugombo and north of Marenga Mkali. Besides, the water of the lake partook slightly of the bitter nature of the Matamombo Creek, distant fifteen miles, and in a still lesser degree of that of Marenga Mkali, forty miles off. Towards the end of the first day of our hold, the Hindi cooper Jaco arrived in camp, alleging as an excuse that feeling fatigued he had fallen asleep in some bushes a few feet from the roadside. Having been the cause of our detention in the hungry wilderness of Agombo, I was not in a frame of mind to forgive him, so, to prevent any future truant tricks on his part, I was under the necessity of including him with the chain gangs of runaways. Two more of our donkeys died, and to prevent any of the valuable baggage being left behind, I was obliged to send Farquhar off on my own riding ass to the village of Mpwapwa, thirty miles off, under the charge of Mabruko Burton. To save the expedition from ruin, I was reluctantly compelled to come to the conclusion that it were better for me, for him and concerned, that he be left with some kind of chief of a village, with a six months' supply of cloth and beads, until he got well, and that he make his own recovery impossible. The 16th of May saw us journeying over the plain which lies between Ugombo and Mpwapwa, skirting close, at intervals, a low range of trap-rock, out of which had become displaced by some violent agency several immense boulders. On its slopes grew the Colquell to a size which I had not seen in Abyssinia. In the plain grew Baobab, an immense tamarind, 
and a variety of thorn. Within five hours from Ogombo, the mountain ridge deflected towards the northeast, while we continued on a northwesterly course, heading for the lofty mountain line of the Mvapa. To our left towered to the blue clouds the gigantic Rubeo. The adoption of this new road to Unyanyembe, by which we were travelling, was now explained. We were enabled to avoid the passes and stiff steeps of Rubeo, and had nothing worse to encounter than a broad, smooth plain which sloped gently to Ugogo. After a march of fifteen miles, we camped at a dry mtoni called Matamombo, celebrated for its pools of bitter water of the colour of ochre. Monkeys and rhinoceroses, besides kudus, steinboks, and antelopes, were numerous in the vicinity. At this camp my little dog Omar died of inflammation of the bowels, almost on the threshold of the country, Ugogo, where his faithful watchfulness would have been invaluable to me. The next day's march was also fifteen miles in length, through one interminable jungle of thorn bushes. Within two miles of the camp the road led up a small river bed, broad as an avenue, clear to the Kambi of Mvapwa, which was situated close to a number of streams of the purest water. The following morning found us much fatigued after the long marches from Ugombo, and generally disposed to take advantage of the precious luxuries Mvapwa offered to caravans fresh from the fly-plague lands of the Wasagua and Wado. Shaikh Tani, clever but innocently speaking old Arab, was encamped under the grateful umbrage of a huge Mtamba sycamore, and had been regaling himself with fresh milk, luscious mutton, and rich bullock humps, ever since his arrival here two days before. And, as he informed me, it did not suit his views to quit such a happy abundance so soon for the saline nitrous water of Marenga Mkali, with its several terquesas and manifold disagreeables. No, he said to me, emphatically, better stop here two or three days, give your tired animals some rest, collect all the bagazis you can, fill your inside with fresh milk, sweet potatoes, beef, mutton, ghee, honey, beans, matama, mareri, and nuts. Then, inshallah, we shall go together through Ugogo without stopping anywhere. As the advice tallied accurately with my own desired and keen appetite for the good things he named, he had not long to wait for my assent to his counsel. Ugogo, continued he, is rich with milk and honey, rich in flour, beans, and almost every eatable thing, and, inshallah, before another week is gone we shall be in a gogo. I had heard from passing caravans so many extremely favourable reports respecting Ugogo and its productions that it appeared to me a very land of promise, and I was most anxious to refresh my jaded stomach with some of the precious esculents raised in Ugogo. But when I heard that Mvava also furnished some of those delicate eatables and good things, most of the morning hours were spent in inducing the slow-witted people to part with them, and when, finally, eggs, milk, honey, mutton, ghee, ground matama and beans had been collected in sufficient quantities to produce a respectable meal, my keenest attention and best culinary talents were occupied for a couple of hours in converting this crude supply into a breakfast which could be accepted by and befit a stomach at once fastidious and famished, such as mine was. The subsequent healthy digestion of it proved my endeavours to have been eminently successful. At the termination of this eventful day, the following remark was jotted down in my diary. Thank God! After fifty-seven days of living upon matama porridge and tough goat, I have enjoyed with unctuous satisfaction a real breakfast and dinner. It was in one of the many small villages which are situated upon the slopes of the Mvava that a refuge and a home for Farquhar was found until he should be enabled by restored health to start to join us at Unyanyembe. Food was plentiful and of sufficient variety to suit the most fastidious. Cheap also, much cheaper than we had experienced for many a day. Lukola, the chief of the village, with whom arrangements for Farquhar's protection and comfort were made, was a little old man of mild eye and a very pleasing face and on being informed that it was intended to leave the Musungu entirely under his charge, suggested that some man should be left to wait on him, and interpret his wishes to his people. As Jacob was the only one who could speak English, except Bombay and Selim, Jacob was appointed, and the chief Lukola was satisfied. Six months' provisions of white beads, Merikani and Kaniki cloth, together with two doti of handsome cloth to serve as a present to Lukola after his recovery, were taken to Farquhar by Bombay, together with a star's carabine, three hundred rounds of cartridge, 
a set of cooking pots, and three pounds of tea. Abdullah bin Nasib, who was found encamped here with five hundred pagazis and a train of Arab and Wasawahili satellites who revolved around his importance, treated me in somewhat the same manner that Hamid bin Suleiman treated Speak at Kasenge. Followed by his satellites, he came, a tall, nervous-looking man of fifty or thereabouts, to see me in my camp, and asked me if I wished to purchase donkeys. As all my animals were either sick or moribund, I replied very readily in the affirmative, upon which he graciously said he would sell me as many as I wanted, and for payment I could give him a draft on Sensibar. I thought him a very considerate and kind person, fully justifying the encomiums lavished on him in Burton's Lake Regions of Central Africa, and accordingly I treated him with the consideration due to so great and good a man. The morrow came, and with it went Abdullah bin Nasib, or Kisesa, as he is called by the Wanyamwezi, with all his pagazis, his train of followers, and each and every one of his donkeys, towards Bagamoyo, without so much as giving a quahiri or good-bye. At this place there are generally to be found from ten to thirty pagazis awaiting up-caravans. I was fortunate enough to secure twelve good people, who, upon my arrival at Unyanyembe, without an exception, voluntarily engaged themselves as carriers to Ujiji. With the formidable marches of Marangamgali in front, I felt thankful for this happy windfall, which resolved the difficulties I had been anticipating, for I had but ten donkeys left, and four of these were so enfeebled that they were worthless as baggage animals. Vapa, so-called by the Arabs who have managed to corrupt almost every native word, is called Bamba by the Wasagara. It is a mountain range rising over six thousand feet above the sea, bounding on the north the extensive plain which commences at Ugombo Lake, and on the east that part of the plain which is called Maringa Mukali, which stretches away beyond the borders of Uhumba. Opposite Mwapa, at the distance of thirty miles or so, rises the Anak peak of Rubeo, with several other ambitious and tall brethren cresting long lines of rectilinear scalps, which ascend from the plain of Ugombo and Maringabkali as regularly as if they had been chiselled out by the hands of generations of masons and stone-cutters. Upon looking at Vapa's greenly-tinted slopes, dark with many a densely foliaged tree, its many rills following sweet and clear, nourishing besides thick patches of gum and thorn-bush, giant sycamore and parachute-topped mimosa, and permitting my imagination to picture sweet views behind the tall cones above, I was tempted to brave the fatigue of an ascent to the summit. Nor was my love for the picturesque disappointed. One sweep of the eyes embraced hundreds of square miles of plain and mountain, from Ogombo Peak away to distant Ogogo, and from Rubeo and Ogogo to the dim and purple pasture lands of the wild, untamable Wahumba. The plain of Ogombo and its neighbour of Marenga Mkali, apparently level as a sea, was dotted here and there with hillocks dropped in nature's careless haste, which appeared like islands amid the dun and green expanse. Where the jungle was dense the colour was green, alternating with dark brown. Where the plain appeared denuded of bush and brake it had a whitey brown appearance, on which the passing clouds now and again cast their deep shadows. Altogether this side of the picture was not inviting. It exhibited too plainly the true wilderness in its sternest aspect but perhaps the knowledge that in the bosom of the vast plain before me there was not one drop of water but was bitter as nitre, and undrinkable as urine, prejudiced me against it. The hunter might consider it a paradise, for in its depths were all kinds of game to attract his keenest instincts, but to the mere traveller it had a stern outlook. Nearer, however, to the base of the Mvapa, the aspect of the plain altered. At first the jungle thinned, openings in the wood appeared, then wide and naked clearings, then extensive fields of the hardy holcus, Indian corn, and mariri of barchery, with here and there a square tembe or village. Still nearer ran thin lines of fresh young grass, great trees surrounded a patch of alluvial meadow. A broad river-bed, containing several rivulets of water, ran through the thirsty fields, conveying the vivifying element which in this part of Uzagara was so scarce and precious. Down to the river-bed sloped Mvapa, roughened in some places by great boulders of basalt, or by rock-masses, which had parted from a precipitous scarp, where clung the coal-qual with a sure hold, drawing nourishment where every other green thing failed, clad in others by the hardy mimosa, which rose like a sloping bank of green verdure almost to the summit. 
and, happy sight to me so long a stranger to it, there were hundreds of cattle grazing, imparting a pleasing animation to the solitude of the deep folds of the mountain range. But the fairest view was obtained by looking northward towards the dense group of mountains which buttressed the front range, facing towards Rubeho. It was the home of the winds, which starting here and sweeping down the precipitous slopes and solitary peaks on the western side, and gathering strength as they rushed through the prairie-like Moranga Mkali, howled through Ogogo and Unyamwezi with the force of a storm. It was also the home of the dews, where sprang the clear springs which cheered by their music the bosky dells below, and enriched the populous district of Mpwapa. One felt better, stronger, on this breezy height, drinking in the pure air and feasting the eyes on such a varied landscape as it presented, on spreading plateaus green as lawns, on smooth rounded tops, on mountain vales containing recesses which might charm a hermit's soul, on deep and awful ravines where reigned a twilight gloom, on fractured and riven precipices, on huge fantastically worn boulders which overtopped them, on picturesque tracts which embraced all that was wild and all that was poetical in nature. Poipa, though the traveller from the coast will feel grateful for the milk it furnished after being so long deprived of it, will be kept in mind as a most remarkable place for earwigs. In my tent they might be counted by thousands. In my slunkot they were by hundreds. On my clothes they were by fifties. On my neck and head they were by scores. The several plagues of locusts, fleas, and lice sink into utter insignificance compared with this fearful one of earwigs. It is true they did not bite, and they did not irritate the cuticle, but what their presence and numbers suggested was something so horrible that it drove one nearly insane to think of it. Who will come to East Africa without reading the experiences of Burton speak? Who is he that, having read them, will not remember with horror the dreadful account given by speak of his encounters with these pests? My intense nervous watchfulness alone, I believe, saved me from a like calamity." Second to the earwigs, in importance and in numbers, were the white ants, whose powers of destructiveness were simply awful. Mats, cloths, portmanteaus, clothes, in short, every article I possessed, seemed on the verge of destruction, and, as I witnessed their voracity, I felt anxious lest my tent should be devoured while I slept. This was the first combi since leaving the coast, where their presence became a matter of anxiety, at all other camping-places hitherto the red and black ants had usurped our attention, but at Mpwapa the red species were not seen, while the black were also very scarce. After a three days' hold at Mpwapa I decided of a march to Marenga Mkali, which should be uninterrupted, until we reached Mfumi in Ugogo, where I should be inducted into the art of paying tribute to the Wagogo chiefs. The first march to Kisokwe was purposely made short, being barely four miles, in order to enable Sheikh Tani, Sheikh Hamad, and five or six Wazawahili caravans to come up with me at Chunyo on the confines of Marenga Makali. End of chapter six, part two. Chapter seven, part one of How I Found Livingstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone, Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, Including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingstone, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 7, Part 1. Moranga, Makali, Ugogo, and Uyanzi to Unyanyembe. The 22nd of May saw Thani and Hamad's caravans united with my own at Chunyo, three and a half hours' march from Mpwapwa. The road from the latter place ran along the skirts of the Mpwapwa range. At three or four places it crossed outlying spurs that stood isolated from the main body of the range. The last of these hill spurs, joined by an elevated cross ridge to the Mpwapwa, shelters the tomb of Chunyo situated on the western face from the stormy gusts that come roaring down the steep slopes the water of chunyo is eminently bad in fact it is its saline nitrous nature which has given the name marenga makali bitter water to the wilderness which separates usagara from ugogo 
though extremely offensive to the palate, Arabs and the natives drink it without fear, and without any bad results, but they are careful to withhold their baggage animals from the pits. Being ignorant of its nature, and not exactly understanding what precise location was meant by Marenga Macaulay, I permitted the donkeys to be taken to water, as usual after a march, and the consequence was calamitous in the extreme. What the fearful swamp of Makata had spared, the waters of Marenga Makali destroyed. In less than five days after our departure from Chenyo or Marenga Mali, five out of the nine donkeys left to me at the time, the five healthiest animals, fell victim. We formed quite an imposing caravan as we emerged from inhospitable Chenyo, in number amounting to about four hundred souls. We were strong in guns, flags, horns, sounding drums, and noise. To Sheikh Hamad, by permission of Sheikh Dani, and myself, was allotted the task of guiding and leading this great caravan through dreaded Ugogo, which was a most unhappy selection, as will be seen hereafter. Marenga Mali, over thirty miles across, was at last before us. This distance had to be traversed within thirty-six hours, so that the fatigue of the ordinary march would be more than doubled by this. From Chunyo to Ugogo not one drop of water was to be found. As a large caravan, say over two hundred souls, seldom travels over one and three-quarter miles per hour, a march of thirty miles would require seventeen hours of endurance, without water, and but little rest. East Africa generally possessing unlimited quantities of water, caravans have not been compelled, for lack of the element, to have recourse to the Mushok of India and the Kerba of Egypt. Being able to cross the waterless districts by a couple of long marches, they content themselves for the time with a small gourdful, and with keeping their imaginations dwelling upon the copious quantities they will drink upon arrival at the watering-place. The march through this waterless district was most monotonous, and a dangerous fever attacked me, which seemed to eat into my very vitals. The wonders of Africa that bodied themselves forth in the shape of flocks of zebras, giraffes, elands, or antelopes, galloping over the jungleless plain, had no charm for me, nor could they serve to draw my attention from the severe fit of sickness which possessed me. Towards the end of the first march I was not able to sit upon the donkey's back, nor would it do, when but a third of the way across the wilderness, to halt until the next day. Soldiers were therefore detailed to carry me in a hammock, and when the terrakeza was performed in the afternoon, I lay in a lethargic state, unconscious of all things." With the night passed the fever, and at three o'clock in the morning, when the march was resumed, I was booted and spurred, and the recognized matangi of my caravan once more. At eight a.m. we had performed the thirty-two miles. The wilderness of Marenga Makali had passed, and we entered Ugogo, which was at once a dreaded land to my caravan, and a land of promise to myself. The transition from the wilderness into this promised land was very gradual and easy. Very slowly the jungle thinned, the cleared land was a long time appearing, and when it had finally appeared, there were no signs of cultivation until we could clearly make out the herbage and vegetation on some hill-slopes to our right, running parallel with our route. Then we saw timber on the hills, and broad acreage under cultivation, and lo, as we ascended a wave of reddish earth covered with tall weeds and cane, but a few feet from us, and directly across our path, were the fields of Matama and grain we had been looking for, and Ugogo had been entered an hour before. The view was not such as I expected. I had imagined a plateau several hundred feet higher than Marengi Makali, and an expansive view which should reveal Ugogo and its characteristics at once. But instead, while travelling from the tall weeds which covered the clearing which had preceded the cultivated parts, we had entered into the depths of the taller Matama stalks, and, excepting some distant hills near Mavumi, where the great sultan lived, the first of the tribe to whom we should pay tribute, the view was extremely limited. However, in the neighborhood of the first village a glimpse at some of the peculiar features of Ugogo was obtained, and there was a vast plain, now flat, now heaving upwards, here level as a table, there tilted up into rugged knolls bristling with scores of rough boulders of immense size, which lay piled one above another, as if the children of a titanic race had been playing at house-building. 
Indeed, these piles of rounded, angular, and riven rock formed miniature hills of themselves, and appeared as if each body had been ejected upwards by some violent agency beneath. There was one of these in particular, near Mvumi, which was so large, and being slightly obscured from view by the outspreading branches of a gigantic boabab, bore such a strong resemblance to a square tower of massive dimensions, that for a long time I cherished the idea that I had discovered something most interesting, which had strangely escaped the notice of my predecessors in East Africa. A nearer view dispelled the illusion, and it proved out to be a huge cube of rock, measuring about forty feet each way. The boababs were also particularly conspicuous on this scene, no other kind of tree being visible in the cultivated parts. These had probably been left for two reasons. First, want of proper axes for felling trees of such enormous growth. Secondly, because during a famine the fruit of the boabab furnishes a flower which, in the absence of anything better, is said to be eatable and nourishing. The first words I heard in Ugogo were from a Wagogo elder, of sturdy form, who in an indolent way tended the flocks, but showed a marked interest in the stranger clad in white flannels, with a hawk's patent cork solar topi on his head, a most unusual thing in Ugogo, who came walking past him, and there were Yambo, Masungu, Yambo, Bana, Bana, delivered with a voice loud enough to make itself heard a full mile away. No sooner had the greeting been delivered than the word Masungu seemed to electrify his entire village, and the people of other villages, situated at intervals near the road, noting the excitement that reigned at the first, also participated in the general frenzy which seemed suddenly to have possessed them. I consider my progress from the first village to Mavumi to have been most triumphant, for I was accompanied by a furious mob of men, women, and children, all almost as naked as Mother Earth when the first world dawned upon her in the Garden of Eden, fighting, quarrelling, jostling, staggering against each other for the best view of the white man, the like of whom was now seen for the first time in this part of Ugogo. The cries of admiration, such as highly, which broke often in the confused uproar upon my head, were not gratefully accepted, inasmuch as I deemed many of them impertinent. A respectful silence and more reserved behavior would have won my esteem. But ye powers, who cause etiquette to be observed in Usungu, respectful silence, reserved behavior, and esteem are terms unknown in savage Ugogo. Hitherto I had compared myself to a merchant of Baghdad travelling among the Kurds of Kurdistan, selling his wares of Damascus silk, kefiyas, etc., but now I was compelled to lower my standard, and thought myself not much better than a monkey in a zoological collection. One of my soldiers requested them to lessen their vociferous noise, but the evil-minded race ordered him to shut up, as a thing unworthy to speak to the Wagogo. When I imploringly turned to the Arabs for counsel in the strait, old Sheikh Thani, always worldly-wise, said, Heed them not, they are dogs who bite besides barking. At nine a.m. we were in our boma, near the Mbvumi village, but here also crowds of Wagogo came to catch a glimpse of the Masungu, whose presence was soon made known throughout the district of Mvumi. But two hours later I was oblivious of their endeavours to see me, for despite repeated doses of quinine, the Mukunguru had sure hold of me. The next day was a march of eight miles, from East Mvumi to West Mvumi, where lived the sultan of the district. The quantity and variety of provisions which arrived at our boma did not belie the reports respecting the productions of Ugogo. Milk, sour and sweet, honey, beans, matama, maweri, Indian corn, ghee, peanuts, and a species of bean nut very like a large pistachio or an almond, watermelons, pumpkins, mushmelons, and cucumbers were brought, and readily exchanged for Marikani, Kaniki, and for the white Marikani beads and Sami Sami, or Sam Sam. The trade and barter which progressed in the camp from morning till night reminded me of the customs existing among the Galas and Abyssinians. Eastward, caravans were obliged to dispatch men with cloth, to purchase from the villagers. This was unnecessary in Ugogo, where the people voluntarily brought every vendible they possessed to the camp. The smallest breadth of white or blue cloth became saleable and useful in purchasing provisions, even a loin-cloth worn threadbare. The day after our march was a halt. We had fixed this day for bearing the tribute to the great sultan of Mavumi. 
Prudent and cautious Sheikh Thani early began this important duty, the omission of which would have been a signal for war. Hamed and Thani sent two faithful slaves, well up to the eccentricities of the Wagogo sultans, well spoken, having glib tongues and the real instinct for trade as carried on amongst Orientals. They bore six doti of cloths, viz., one doti of Dabwani Ulya, contributed by myself, also one doti of Barsati from me, two doti Marikani Satin from Sheikh Thani, and two doti of Kaniki from Sheikh Hamad, as a first instalment of the tribute. The slaves were absent a full hour, but having wasted their powers of pleading in vain, they returned with the demand for more, which Sheikh Thani communicated to me in this wise. Off! Oh, this sultan is a very bad man, a very bad man indeed. He says, The Masungu is a great man, I call him a sultan. The Masungu is very rich, for he has several caravans already gone past. The Masungu must pay forty doti, and the Arabs must pay twelve doti each, for they have rich caravans. It is of no use for you to tell me you are all one caravan, otherwise why so many flags and tents? Go and bring me sixty doti, with less I will not be satisfied." I suggested to Sheikh Thani, upon hearing this exorbitant demand, that I had twenty Wasungu armed with Winchester repeating rifles, the Sultan might be obliged to pay tribute to me. But Thani prayed and begged me to be cautious, lest angry words might irritate the Sultan, and cause him to demand a double tribute, as he was quite capable of doing so. And if you preferred war, said he, your pagazis would all desert, and leave you and your cloth to the small mercy of the Wagogo but I hastened to allay his fears by telling Bombay, in his presence, that I had foreseen such demands on the part of the Wagogo, and that having set aside one hundred and twenty dota of Honga cloths, I should not consider myself a sufferer if the Sultan demanded and I paid forty cloths to him, that he must therefore open the Honga bale and permit Sheikh Thani to extract such cloths as the Sultan might like. Sheikh Thani, having put on the cap of consideration and joined heads with Hamad and the faithful serviles, thought if I paid twelve doti, out of which three should be of Ulya quality, that the Sultan might possibly condescend to accept our tribute, supposing he was persuaded by the oratorical words of the faithfuls, that the Masungu had nothing with him but the Mashiwa, boat, which would be of no use to him, come what might, with which prudent suggestion the Masungu concurred, see in its wisdom. The slaves departed, bearing this time from our Boma thirty doti, with our best wishes for their success. In an hour they returned with empty hands, but yet unsuccessful. The sultan demanded six doti of Marikani, and a fundu of bubu, from the Masungu, and from the Arabs and other caravans, twelve doti more. For the third time the slaves departed for the sultan's tembi, carrying with them six doti Marikani, and a fundu of bubu from myself, and ton doti from the Arabs. Again they returned to us with the sultan's word, that, as the doti of the Masungu were short measure, and the cloths of the Arabs of miserable quality, the Masungu must send three doti full measure, and the Arabs five doti of Kaniki. My three doti were at once measured out with the longest forearm, according to Kigogo measure, and sent off by Bombay. But the Arabs, almost in despair, declared they would be ruined if they gave way to such demands, and out of the five doti demanded sent only two, with a pleading to the sultan that he would consider what was paid as just and fair mahungo, and not ask any more. But the sultan of Mavumi was by no means disposed to consider any such proposition, but declared he must have three doti, and these to be two of Ulya cloth and one Kitambi Basardi, which, as he was determined to obtain, were sent to him heavy with the deep maledictions of Sheikh Hamad, and the despairing sighs of Sheikh Thami. Altogether, the sultanship of a district in Ugogo must be very remunerative, besides being a delightful sinecure, so long as the sultan has to deal with timid Arab merchants who fear to exhibit anything approaching to independence and self-reliance, lest they might be mulcited in cloth. In one day from one camp the sultan received forty-seven doti, consisting of Marikani, Kaniki, Barsadi, and Dabwani, equal to thirty-five dollars and twenty-five cents, besides seven doti of superior cloths, consisting of Rahani, Sohori, and Dabwani Ulya, and one fundo of Bubu, equal to fourteen dollars, making a total of forty-nine dollars and twenty-five cents, a most handsome revenue for a Mugogo chief. On the 27th of May we gladly shook the dust of Mavumi from our feet, and continued on our route, ever westward. 
Five of my donkeys had died the night before, from the effects of the water of Merengue Macaulay. Before leaving the camp of Mavumi, I went to look at their carcasses, but found them to have been clean-picked by the hyenas, and the bones taken possession of by an army of white-necked crows. As we passed the numerous villages, and perceived the entire face of the land to be one vast field of grain, and counted the people, halted by scores on the roadside, to feast their eyes with a greedy stare on the Masungu, I no longer wondered at the extortionate demands of the Wagogo. For it was manifest that they had but to stretch out their hands to possess whatever the wealth of a caravan consisted of, and I began to think better of the people who, knowing well their strength, did not use it, of people who were intellectual enough to comprehend that their interest lay in permitting the caravans to pass on, without attempting any outrage. Between Mvumi and the next sultan's district, that of Matamburo, I counted no less than twenty-five villages, scattered over the clay-colored plain. Despite the inhospitable nature of the plain, it was better cultivated than any part of any other country we have seen since leaving Bagamoyo. When we had at last arrived at our boma of Matamburu, the same groups of curious people, the same eager looks, the same exclamations of surprise, the same peals of laughter at something they deemed ludicrous in the Masungu's dress or manner, awaited us as at Mavumi. The Arabs being Wakanongo travellers, whom they saw every day, enjoyed a complete immunity from the vexations which we had to endure. The Sultan of Matamburu, a man of Herculean form and massive head, well set on shoulders that might vie with those of Milo, proved to be a very reasonable person. Not quite so powerful as the Sultan of Mavumi, he yet owned a fair share of Ugogo and about forty villages, and could, if he chose, have oppressed the mercantile souls of my Arab companions, in the same way as he of Mavumi. Four doti of cloth were taken to him as a preliminary offering to his greatness, which he said he would accept, if the Arabs and Musungu would send him four more. As his demands were reasonable, this little affair was soon terminated to everybody's satisfaction, and soon after the Kirangozi of Sheikh Hamad sounded the signal for the morrow's march. At the orders of the same Sheikh, the Kirangozi stood up to speak before the assembled caravans. "'Words, words from the Bana!' he shouted. "'Give ear, Kirangozis. Listen, children of Unyamwezi. The journey is for to-morrow. The road is crooked and bad, bad. The jungle is there, and many Wagogo lie hidden within it. Wagogo spear the pagazis, and cut the throats of those who carry matumba, bales, and ushanga, beads. The Wagogo have been to our camp. They have seen your bales. To-night they seek the jungle. To-morrow watch well, O Wanyamwenzi. Keep close together. Lag not behind. Kirangozis walk slow, that the weak, the sick, and the young may keep up with the strong. Take two rests on the journey. These are the words of the Bana. Do you hear them, Wanyamwenzi? A loud shout in the affirmative from all. Do you understand them well? Another chorus. Then, Bas, having said which, the elegant Kirangozi retired into the dark night, and his straw hut. The march to Bihawana, our next camp, was rugged and long, through a continuous jungle of gums and thorns, up steep hills, and finally over a fervid plain, while the sun waxed hotter and hotter as it drew near the meridian, until it seemed to scorch all vitality from inanimate nature, while the view was one white blaze, unbearable to the pained sight, which sought relief from the glare in vain. Several sandy watercourses, on which were impressed many a trail of elephants, were also passed on this march. The slope of these stream-beds trended south-east and south. In the middle of this scorching plain stood the villages of Bahawana, almost undistinguishable from the extreme lowness of the huts, which did not reach the height of the tall bleached grass which stood smoking in the untempered heat. Our camp was in a large boma, about a quarter of a mile from the sultan's temple. Soon after arriving at the camp I was visited by three Wagogo, who asked me if I had seen a Mugogo on the road with a woman and child. I was about to answer, very innocently, yes, when Mabruki, cautious and watchful always for the interests of the master, requested me not to answer, as the Wagogo, as customary, would charge me with having done away with them, and would require their price from me. Indignant at the imposition they were about to practice upon me, I was about to raise my whip to flog them out of the camp, when again Mabruki, with a roaring voice, bade me beware, for every blow would cost me three or four doti of cloth. 
As I did not care to gratify my anger at such an expense, I was compelled to swallow my wrath, and consequently the Wagogo escaped chastisement. We halted for one day at this place, which was a great relief to me, as I was suffering severely from intermittent fever, which lasted in this case two weeks, and entirely prevented my posting my diary in full, as was my custom every evening after a march. The Sultan of Bihawana, though his subjects were evil disposed, and ready-handed at theft and murder, contented himself with three doti as honga. From this chief I received news of my fourth caravan, which had distinguished itself in a fight with some outlawed subjects of his. My soldiers had killed two who had attempted, after waylaying a couple of my pagazis, to carry away a bale of cloth and a bag of beads. Coming up in time, the soldiers decisively frustrated the attempt. The Sultan thought that if all caravans were as well guarded as mine were, there would be less depredations committed on them while on the road, with which I heartily agreed. The next Sultan's tembe through whose territory we marched, this being on the 30th of May, was at Kitadimo, but four miles from Bihuana. The road led through a flat, elongated plain, lying between two lengthy, hilly ridges, thickly dotted with the giant forms of the Boabab. Kitadimo is exceedingly bleak in aspect. Even the faces of the Wagogo seem to have contracted a bleak hue from the general bleakness around. The water of the pits obtained in the neighborhood had an execrable flavor, and two donkeys sickened and died in less than an hour from its effects. Man suffered nausea and a general irritability of the system, and accordingly revenged himself by cursing the country and its imbecile ruler most heartily. The climax came, however, when Bombay reported, after an attempt to settle the Mahungo, that the chief's head had grown big since he had heard that the Masungu had come, and that its bigness would not be reduced unless he could extract ten doti as tribute. Though the demand was large, I was not in a humor, being feeble and almost nerveless, from repeated attacks of the Mukunguru, to dispute the sum. Consequently it was paid without many words. But the Arabs continued the whole afternoon negotiating, and at the end had to pay eight doti each. End of chapter 7, part 1《ハワイ・フィン・リビングストン》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ハワイ・フィン・リビングストン》Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 7, Part 2 Marenga, Macaulay, Ugogo, and Uyanza to Unyanyembe. Between Kitadimo and Yambwa, the district of the Sultan Pembera Pera, was a broad and lengthy forest and jungle inhabited by the elephant, rhinoceros, zebra, deer, antelope, and giraffe. Starting at dawn of the 31st, we entered the jungle, whose dark lines and bosky banks were clearly visible from our bower at Kitadimo, and travelling for two hours, halted for rest and breakfast, at pools of sweet water surrounded by tracts of vivid green verdure, which were a great resort for the wild animals of the jungle, whose tracks were numerous and recent. A narrow nulla, shaded deeply with foliage, afforded excellent retreats from the glaring sunshine. At meridian, our thirsts quenched, our hunger satisfied, our gourds refilled, we set out from the shade into the heated blaze of hot noon. The path serpentined in and out of jungle and thin forest into open tracts of grass bleached white as stubble, into thickets of gums and thorns, which emitted an odor as rank as a stable, through clumps of wide-spreading mimosa and colonies of boabab, through a country teeming with noble game, which, though we saw them frequently, were yet as safe from our rifles as if we had been on the Indian Ocean. A terraqueza, such as we are now making, admits of no delay. Water we had left behind at noon, until noon of the next day not a drop was to be obtained, and unless we marched fast and long on this day, raging thirst would demoralize everybody. So for six long, weary hours we toiled bravely, and at sunset we camped, and still a march of two hours, to be done before the sun was an hour high, intervened between us and our camp at Niambwa. That night the men bivouacked under the trees, surrounded by many miles of dense forest, enjoying the cool night unprotected by hat or tent, 
while I groaned and tossed throughout the night in a paroxysm of fever. The morn came, and while it was yet young, the long caravan, or string of caravans, was under way. It was the same forest, admitting, on the narrow line which we threaded, but one man at a time. Its view was as limited. To our right and left the forest was dark and deep. Above was a riband of glassy sky, flecked by the floating nimbus. We heard nothing, save a few stray notes from a flying bird, or the din of caravans as the men sang, or hummed, or conversed, or shouted, as the thought struck them that we were nearing water. One of Mapagazis, wearied and sick, fell and never rose again. The last of the caravan passed him before he died. At seven a.m. we were encamped at Nyamba, drinking the excellent water found here with the avidity of thirsty camels. Extensive fields of grain had heralded the neighborhood of the villages, at the sight of which we were conscious that the caravan was quickening its pace, as approaching its halting place. As the Wasungu drew within the populated area, crowds of Wagogo used their utmost haste to see them before they passed by. Young and old of both genders pressed about us in a multitude, a very howling mob. This excessive demonstrativeness elicited from my sailor overseer the characteristic remark, well, I declare, these must be the genuine Yugogians, for they stare, stare, there is no end to their staring. I am almost tempted to slap them in the face. In fact, the conduct of the Wagogo of Nyambwa was an exaggeration of the general conduct of Wagogo. Hitherto, those we had met had contented themselves with staring and shouting, but these outstepped all bounds, and my growing anger at their excessive insolence vented itself in gripping the rowdiest of them by the neck, and before he could recover from his astonishment in ministering a sound thrashing with my dog-whip, which he little relished. This proceeding educed from the tribe of starers all their native power of vitrepation and abuse, in expressing which they were peculiar. Approaching in manner to angry tomcats, they jerked their words with something of a splitting hiss and half-bark. The ejaculation, as near as I can spell it phonetically, was hacht, uttered in a shrill crescendo tone. They paced backwards and forwards, asking themselves, Are the Wagogo to be beaten like slaves by this Masungu? A Mugogo is a Moana, a free man. He is not used to be beaten. Hocked. But whenever I made motion, flourishing my whip towards them, these mighty braggarts found it convenient to move to respectable distances from the irritated Masungu. Perceiving that a little manliness and show of power was something which the Wagogo long needed, and that in this instance it relieved me from annoyance, I had recourse to my whip, whose long lash cracked like a pistol-shot whenever they overstepped moderation. So long as they continued to confine their obtrusiveness to staring, and communicating to each other their opinions respecting my complexion and dress and accoutrement, I philosophically resigned myself in silence for their amusement. But when they pressed on me, barely allowing me to proceed, a few vigorous and rapid slashes right and left with my serviceable thong, soon cleared the track. Pembera Pera is a queer old man, very small, and would be very insignificant were he not the greatest sultan in Ugogo, and enjoying a sort of demediated power over many other tribes. Though such an important chief, he is the meanest dressed of his subjects, is always filthy, ever greasy, eternally foul about the mouth, but these are mere eccentricities. As a wise judge he is without parallel, always has a dodge ever ready for the extraction of cloth from the spiritless Arab merchants, who trade with Unyanyembe every year, and disposes with ease of a judicial case which would overtask ordinary men. Sheikh Hamad, who was elected guider of the United Caravans, now travelling through Ugogo, was of such a fragile and small make that he might be taken for an imitation of his famous prototype, Dapper. Being of such dimensions, what he lacked for weight and size he made up by activity. No sooner had he arrived in camp than his trim, dapper form was seen frisking about from side to side of the great boma, fidgeting, arranging, disturbing everything and everybody. He permitted no bales or packs to be intermingled, or to come into too close proximity to his own. He had a favorite mode of stacking his goods, which he would see carried out. He had a special eye for the best place for his tent, and no one else must trespass on that ground. One would imagine that walking ten or fifteen miles a day he would leave such trivialities to his servants, but no, nothing could be right unless he had personally superintended it, in which work he was tireless and knew no fatigue. 
Another not uncommon peculiarity pertained to Sheikh Hamad. As he was not a rich man, he labored hard to make the most of every shukka and doti expended, and each fresh expenditure seemed to gnaw his very vitals. He was ready to weep, as he himself expressed it, at the high prices of Ugogo, and the extortionate demands of its sultans. For this reason, being the leader of the caravans, so far as he was able, we were very sure not to be delayed in Ugogo, where food was so dear. The day we arrived at Nyamba will be remembered by Hamad as long as he lives, for the trouble and vexation which he suffered. His misfortunes arose from the fact that, being too busily engaged in fidgeting about the camp, he permitted his donkeys to stray into the Matama fields of Perambarapera, the sultan. For hours he and his servants sought for the stray donkeys, returning towards evening utterly unsuccessful, Hamad bewailing, as only an Oriental can do, when hard fate visits him with its inflictions, the loss of a hundred dollars' worth of musket donkeys. Sheikh Thani, older, more experienced, and wiser, suggested to him that he should notify the sultan of his loss. Acting upon the sagacious advice, Hamad sent an embassy of two slaves, and the information they brought back was that Pembera Pera's servants had found the two donkeys eating the unripened matama, and that unless the Arab who owned them would pay nine doti of first-class cloths, he, Pembera Pera, would surely keep them to remunerate him for the matama they had eaten. Hamad was in despair. Nine doti of first-class cloths, worth twenty-five dollars in Unyanyembe, for half a chukka's worth of grain, was, as he thought, an absurd demand. But then if he did not pay it, what would become of the hundred dollars' worth of donkeys? He proceeded to the sultan to show him the absurdity of the damage claim, and to endeavor to make him accept one chukka, which would be more than double the worth of what grain the donkeys had consumed. But the sultan was sitting on Pombe, he was drunk, which I believe to be his normal state, too drunk to attend to business. Consequently his deputy, a renegade Munyamwenze, gave ear to the business. With most of the Wagogo chief lives a Munyamwezi, as their right-hand man, prime minister, counsellor, executioner, ready man at all things save the general good, a sort of harlequin Unyamwenze, who is such an intriguing, restless, unsatisfied person, that as soon as one hears that this kind of man forms one of and the chief of a Magogo sultan's council, one feels very much tempted to do damage to his person. Most of the extortions practiced upon the Arabs are suggested by these crafty renegades. Sheikh Hamad found that the Munyamwezi was far more obdurate than the sultan. Nothing under nine doti first-class cloths would redeem the donkeys. The business that day remained unsettled, and the night following was, as one may imagine, a very sleepless one to Hamad. As it turned out, however, the loss of the donkeys, the after heavy fine, and the sleepless night proved to be blessings in disguise, for towards midnight a robber Magogo visited his camp, and while attempting to steal a bale of cloth, was detected in the act by the wide-awake and irritated Arab, and was made to vanish instantly with a bullet whistling in close proximity to his ear. From each of the principals of the caravans the Munyamwezi had received as tribute for his drunken master fifteen doti, and from the other six caravans six doti each, altogether fifty-one doti. Yet on the next morning, when we took the road, he was not in a whit disposed to deduct a single cloth from the fine imposed on Hamad, and the unfortunate sheikh was therefore obliged to liquidate the claim, or leave his donkeys behind. After travelling through the cornfields of Pembera Pera, we emerged upon a broad, flat plain, as level as the still surface of a pond, whence the salt of the Wogogo is obtained. From Kenyanit on the southern road, to beyond the confines of Ihumba and Ubanarama, this saline field extends, containing many large ponds of salt-bitter water, whose low banks are covered with an effervescence partaking of the nature of nitrate. Subsequently, two days afterwards, having ascended the elevated ridge which separates Ugogo from Uyanzi, I obtained a view of this immense saline plain, embracing over a hundred square miles. I may have been deceived, but I imagined I saw large expanses of grayish-blue water, which causes me to believe that this salina is but a corner of a great salt lake. The Wahumba, who are numerous, from Nyambwa to the Uyanzi border, informed my soldiers that there was a Maji Kuba away to the north. Mazanza, our next camp after Nyuamba, is situated in a grove of palms, about thirteen miles from the latter place. Soon after arriving I had to bury myself under blankets, 
plagued with the same intermittent fever which first attacked me during the transit of Marenga Makali. Feeling certain that one day's halt, which would enable me to take regular doses of the invaluable sulphate of quinine, would cure me, I requested Sheikh Thani to tell Hamad to halt on the morrow, as I should be utterly unable to continue thus long, under repeated attacks of a virulent disease which was fast reducing me into a mere frame of skin and bone. Hamad, in a hurry to arrive at Unyanyembe, in order to dispose of his cloth before other caravans appeared in the market, replied at first that he would not, that he could not, stop from Masungu. Upon Thani's reporting his answer to me, I requested him to inform Hamad that, as the Masungu did not wish to detain him or any other caravan, it was his express wish that Hamad would march and leave him, as he was quite strong enough in guns to march through Ugogo alone. Whatever cause modified the sheikh's resolution and his anxiety to depart, Hamad's horn signal for the march was not heard that night, and on the morrow he had not gone. Early in the morning I commenced on my quinine doses. At six a.m. I took a second dose. Before noon I had taken four more. Altogether, fifty measured grains, the effect of which was manifest in the copious perspiration which drenched flannels, linen, and blankets. After noon I arose, devoutly thankful that the disease which had clung to me for the last fourteen days had at last succumbed to quinine. On this day the lofty tent, and the American flag which ever flew from the center pole, attracted the Sultan of Mazanzi toward it, and was the cause of a visit with which he honored me. As he was notorious among the Arabs for having assisted Muana Sera in his war against Sheikh Snin bin Amir, high eulogies upon whom have been written by Burton, and subsequently by Speke, and as he was the second most powerful chief in Ugogo, of course he was quite a curiosity to me. As the tent-door was uplifted that he might enter, the ancient gentleman was so struck with astonishment at the lofty apex and internal arrangements, that the greasy barsati cloth which formed his sole and only protection against the chills of night and the heat of noon, in a fit of abstraction was permitted to fall down to his feet, exposing to the Masungu's unhallowed gaze the sad and aged wreck of what must have once been a towering form. His son, a youth of about fifteen, attentive to the infirmities of his father, hastened with filial duty to remind him of his condition, upon which, with an idiotic titter at the incident, he resumed his scanty apparel and sat down to wonder and gibber out his admiration at the tent and the strange things which formed the Masungu's personal baggage and furniture. After gazing in stupid wonder at the table, on which was placed some crockery and the few books I carried with me, at the slung hammock, which he believed was suspended by some magical contrivance, at the portmanteaus, which contained my stock of clothes, he ejaculated, Hila, the Masungu is a great sultan, who has come from his country to see Ugogo. He then noticed me, and was again wonderstruck at my pale complexion and straight hair, and the question now propounded was, how on earth was I white when the sun had burned his people's skins into blackness? Whereupon he was shown my cork toppy, which he tried on his woolly head, much to his own and to our amusement. The guns were next shown to him, the wonderful repeating rifle of the Winchester Company, which was fired thirteen times in rapid succession to demonstrate its remarkable murderous powers. If he was astonished before, he was a thousand times more so now, and expressed his belief that the Wagogo could not stand before the Masungu in battle, for wherever a Magogo was seen, such a gun would surely kill him. Then the other firearms were brought forth, each with its peculiar mechanism explained, until, in a burst of enthusiasm at my riches and power, he said he would send me a sheep or goat, and that he would be my brother. I thanked him for the honor, and promised to accept whatever he was pleased to send me. At the instigation of Sheikh Thani, who acted as interpreter, who said that Wagogo chiefs must not depart with empty hands, I cut off a shuka of kaniki and presented it to him, which, after being examined and measures, was refused upon the ground that, the Masungu, being a great sultan, should not demean himself so much as to give him only a shuka. This, after the twelve doti received his mahungo from the caravans, I thought, was rather sore, but as he was about to present me with a sheep or goat, another shuka would not matter much. Shortly after he departed, and true to his promise, I received a large fine sheep, with a broad tail, heavy with fat, but with the words, that being now his brother, I must send him three doti of good cloth. As the price of a sheep is but a doti and a half, 
I refused the sheep and the fraternal honour, upon the ground that the gifts were all on one side, and that, as I had paid Mahongo, and given him a doti of Kanikia's present, I could not afford to part with any more cloth without an adequate return. During the afternoon one more of my donkeys died, and at night the hyenas came in great numbers to feast upon the carcass. Ulimengo, the chasseur, and best shot of my wangwana, stole out and succeeded in shooting two, which turned out to be some of the largest of their kind. One of them measured six feet from the tip of the nose to the extremity of the tail, and three feet around the girth. On the fourth June we struck camp, and after travelling westward for about three miles, passing several ponds of salt water, we headed north by west, skirting the range of low hills which separates Ugogo from Uyanzi. End of chapter 7, part 2《ハウ・アイ・フォウンド・リビングストン》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ハウ・アイ・フォウンド・リビングストン》Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley.《ハウ・アイ・フォウンド・リビングストン》Marenga Makali, Ugogo, and Uyanzi to Unyanyembe. After a three hours' march, we halted for a short time at Little Makandaku to settle tribute with the brother of him who rules at Makandaku proper. Three doti satisfied the sultan, whose district contains but two villages, mostly occupied by pastoral Wahamba and renegade Wahehe. The Wahamba live in plastered cow dung cone huts, shaped like the Tartar tents of Turkestan. The Wahamba, so far as I have seen them, are a fine and well formed race. The men are positively handsome, tall, with small heads, the posterior parts of which project considerably. One will look in vain for a thick lip or a flat nose among them. On the contrary, the mouth is exceedingly well cut, delicately small. The nose is that of the Greeks, so universal was the peculiar feature, that I at once named them the Greeks of Africa. Their lower limbs have not the heaviness of the Wugogo and other tribes, but are long and shapely, clean as those of an antelope. Their necks are long and slender, on which their small heads are poised most gracefully. Athletes from their youth, shepherd bred, and intermarrying among themselves, thus keeping the race pure, any of them would form a fit subject for the sculptor who would wish to immortalize in marble an Antonius, a Hylas, a Daphnis, or an Apollo. The women are as beautiful as the men are handsome. They have clear ebon skins, not coal black, but of an inky hue. Their ornaments consist of spiral rings of brass pendants from the ears, brass ring collars about the necks, and a spiral cincture of brass wire about their loins for the purpose of retaining their calf and goat skins, which are folded about their bodies, and, depending from the shoulder, shade one half of the bosom and fall to the knees. The Wahehe may be styled the Romans of Africa. Resuming our march, after a halt of an hour, in four hours more we arrived at Mukundoku proper. This extremity of Ugogo is most populous. The villages which surround the central tembe, where the Sultan Swaruru lives, amount to thirty-six. The people who flocked from these to see the wonderful men whose faces were white, who wore the most wonderful things on their persons, and possessed the most wonderful weapons, guns which bum-bummed as fast as you could count on your fingers, formed such a mob of howling savages that I for an instant thought there was something besides mere curiosity which caused such commotion, and attracted such numbers to the roadside. Halting, I asked what was the matter, and what they wanted, and why they made such a noise. One burly rascal, taking my words for a declaration of hostilities, promptly drew his bow. But as prompt as he had fixed his arrow, my faithful Winchester, with thirteen shots in the magazine, was ready and at the shoulder and but waited to see the arrow fly to pour the leaden messengers of death into the crowd. But the crowd vanished as quickly as they had come, leaving the burly Thersites, and two or three irresolute fellows of his tribe, standing within pistol range of my leveled rifle. Such a dispersion of the mob, which, but a moment before, was overwhelming in numbers, caused me to lower my rifle, and to indulge in a hearty laugh at the disgraceful flight of the men-destroyers. The Arabs, who were as much alarmed at their boisterous obtrusiveness, now came up to patch a truce, in which they succeeded to everybody's satisfaction. 
A few words of explanation, and the mob came back in greater numbers than before, and the Thersites, who had been the cause of the momentary disturbance, was obliged to retire abashed before the pressure of public opinion. A chief now came up, whom I afterwards learned was the second man to Swaruru, and lectured the people upon their treatment of the white stranger. "'Know ye not, Wagogo,' shouted he, "'that this Musungu is a sultan, Mitemi, a most high title. He has not come to Ugogo like the Wakanongo Arabs, to trade in ivory, but to see us, and to give presents. Why do you molest him and his people? Let them pass in peace. If you wish to see him, draw near, but do not mock him. The first of you who creates a disturbance, let him beware. Our great Mitemi shall know how you treat his friends.' This little bit of oratorical effort on the part of the chief was translated to me there and then by the old Sheikh Thani, which, having understood, I bade the Sheikh to inform the chief that, after I had rested, I should like him to visit me in my tent. Having arrived at the Kambi, which always surrounds some great Boabab in Ugogo, at the distance of about half a mile from the temple of the Sultan, the Wagogo pressed in in such great numbers to the camp that Sheikh Thani resolved to make an effort to stop or mitigate the nuisance. Dressing himself in his best clothes, he went to appeal to the sultan for protection against his people. The sultan was very inebriated, and was pleased to say, "'What is it you want, you thief? You have come to steal my ivory or my cloth. Go away, thief!' But the sensible chief, whose voice had just been heard reproaching the people for their treatment of the Wasungu, beckoned to Thani to come out of the tembe, and then proceeded with him towards the Kambi. The camp was in a great uproar. The curious Wagogo monopolized almost every foot of ground. There was no room to turn anywhere. The Wanyamwezi were quarreling with the Wagogo. The Waswahili servants were clamoring loud that the Wagogo pressed down their tents, and that the property of the masters was in danger, while I, busy on my diary within my tent, cared not how great was the noise and confusion outside, so long as it confined itself to the Wagogo, Wanyamwezi, and Wangwana. The presence of the chief in the camp was followed by a deep silence that I was prevailed upon to go outside to see what had caused it. The chief's words were few and to the point. He said, To your tembes, Wagogo, to your tembes. Why do you come to trouble the Wakanongo? What have you to do with them? To your tembes, go. Each Magogo found in the combi without meal, without cattle to sell, shall pay to the Matembe cloth or cows. Away with you! saying which, he snatched up a stick and drove the hundreds out of the combi, who were as obedient to him as so many children. During the two days we halted at Makandanko, we saw no more of the mob, and there was peace. The Mahongo of the Sultan Swaruru was settled with a few words. The chief who acted for the Sultan as his Prime Minister, having been made glad with the doti of Rahani Ulya from me, accepted the usual tribute of six doti, only one of which was of first-class cloth. There remained but one more sultan to whom Mahongo must be paid after Mokonduku, and this was the sultan of Kiwa, whose reputation was so bad that owners of property who had control over the pagazis seldom passed by Kiwia, preferring the hardships of long marches through the wilderness to the rudeness and exorbitant demands of the chief of Kiwia. But the pagazis, on whom no burden or responsibility fell save that of carrying their loads, who could use their legs and show clean heels in the case of a hostile outbreak, preferred the march to Kiwia to enduring thirst and the fatigue of a terrakeza. Often the preference of the pagazis won the day, when their employers were timid, irresolute men, like Sheikh Hamad. The 7th of June was the day fixed for our departure from Mokandoku, so the day before the Arabs came to my tent to counsel with me as to the route we should adopt. On calling together the Kirangozis of the respective caravans and veteran Watamwandu Pagazis, we learned that there were three roads leading from Mokonduko to Uyanzi. The first was the southern road, and the one generally adopted, for the reasons already stated, and led by Kiya. To this Hamad raised objections. The sultan was bad, he said. He sometimes charged a caravan twenty doti. Our caravan would have to pay about sixty doti. The Kiya road would not do at all. Besides, he added, we have to make a terrakeza to reach Kiya, and then we will not reach it before the day after tomorrow. The second was the central road. We should arrive at Munyeka on the morrow. The day after would be a terrakeza from Mugungura Nulla to a camp near Unyambogi. Two hours the next day would bring us to Kiti, where there was plenty of water and food. 
As neither of the Kirangozis or Arabs knew this road, and as its description came from one of my ancient pagazis, Hamad said he did not like to trust the guidance of such a caravan in the hands of an old Munyamwezi, and would therefore prefer to hear about the third road before rendering his decision. The third road was the northern. It led past numerous villages of the Wagongo for the first two hours. Then we should strike a jungle, and three hours' march would then bring us to Simbo, where there was water but no village. Starting early next morning, we would travel six hours when we would arrive at a pool of water. Here, taking a short rest, an afternoon march of five hours would bring us within three hours of another village. As this last road was known to many, Hamad said, Sheikh Thani, tell the Sahib that I think this is the best road. Sheikh Thani was told, after he had informed me that, as I had marched with them through Ugogo, if they decided upon going by Simbo, my caravan would follow. Immediately after the discussion among the principals respecting the merits of the several routes, arose a discussion amongst the pagazis which resulted in an obstinate clamor against the Simbo Road, for its long terrakeza and scant prospects of water. The dislike to the Simbo Road communicated itself to all the caravans, and soon it was magnified by reports of a wilderness reaching from Simbo to Kisuri, where there was neither food nor water to be obtained. Hamad's pagazis and those of the Arab servants rose in a body and declared they could not go on that march, and if Hamad insisted upon adopting it, they would put their packs down and leave him to carry them himself. Hamad Kimiani, as he was styled by the Arabs, rushed up to Sheikh Thani and declared that he must take the Kiwa road, otherwise his pagazis would all desert. Thani replied that all the roads were the same to him, that wherever Hamad chose to go he would follow. They then came to my tent, and informed me of the determination at which the Wanyamwenze had arrived. Calling my veteran Munyamwenze, who had given me the favorable report once more to my tent, I bade him give a correct account of the Kiti road. It was so favorable that my reply to Hamad was, that I was the master of my caravan, that it was to go wherever I told the Kirangozi, not where the Pagazis chose, that when I told them to halt they must halt, and when I commanded a march, a march should be made and that as I fed them well and did not overwork them, I should like to see the pagazi or soldier that disobeyed me. You made up your mind just now that you would take the Simbo road, and we all agreed upon it. Now your pagazis say they will take the Kiwa road or desert. Go on the Kiwa road and pay twenty Dodi Mahongo. I and my caravan to-morrow morning will take the Kiti road, and when you find me in Unyamwembe one day ahead of you, you will be sorry you did not take the same road." This resolution of mine had the effect of again changing the current of Hamad's thoughts, for he instantly thought, That is the best road after all, and as the Sahib is determined to go on it, and we have all travelled together through the bad land of the Wagogo, inshallah, let us all go the same way. And Thani, good old man, not objecting, and Hamad having decided, they both joyfully went out of the tent to communicate the news. On the seventh the caravans, apparently unanimous that the Kiti road was to be taken, were led, as usual, by Hamad's Kirangozi. We had barely gone a mile before I perceived that we had left the Simbo Road, had taken the direction of Kiti, and by a cunning detour, were now fast approaching the defile of the mountain ridge before us, which admitted access to the higher plateau of Kivya. Instantly halting my caravan, I summoned the veteran who had travelled by Kiti, and asked him whether we were not going towards Kivya. He replied that we were. Calling my pagazis together, I bade Bombay tell them that the Masungu never changed his mind, that, as I had said my caravan should march by Kiti, to Kiti it must go whether the Arabs followed it or not. I then ordered the veteran to take up his load and show the Kirangozi the proper road to Kiti. The Wanyamwenze pagazis put down their bales, and then there was every indication of a mutiny. The Wangwana soldiers were next ordered to load their guns and to flank the caravan, and shoot the first pagazis who made an attempt to run away. Dismounting, I seized my whip, and advancing towards the first pagazi who had put down his load, I motioned him to take up his load and march. It was unnecessary to proceed further. Without an exception, all marched away obediently after the Kirangozi. I was about bidding farewell to Thani and Hamad when Thani said, Stop a bit, Sahib, I have had enough of this child's play, I come with you, and his caravan turned after mine. Hamad's caravan was by this time close to the defile, and he himself was a full mile behind it, weeping like a child at what he was pleased to call our desertion of him. 
pitying his strait, for he was almost beside himself as thoughts of Kiwa's sultan, his extortion and rudeness swept across his mind, I advised him to run after his caravan, and tell it, as all the rest had taken the other road, to think of the sultan of Kiwa. Before reaching the Kiti defile I was aware that Hamad's caravan was following us. The descent of the ridge was rugged and steep. Thorns of the prickliest nature punished us severely. The acacia horida was here more horrid than usual. The gums stretched out their branches, and entangled the loads. The mimosa, with its umbrella-like top, served to shade us from the sun, but impeded a rapid advance. Steep outcrops of cyanite and granite, worn smooth by many feet, had to be climbed over. Rugged terraces of earth and rock had to be ascended, and distant shots resounding through the forest added to the alarm and general discontent, and had I not been immediately behind my caravan, watchful of every manoeuvre, my one young Wednesday had deserted to a man. Though the height we ascended was barely eight hundred feet above the Salina we had just left, the ascent occupied two hours. Having surmounted the plateau and the worst difficulties, we had a fair road comparatively, which ran through jungle, forest, and small open tracks, which in three hours more brought us to Munyeka, a small village surrounded by a clearing richly cultivated by a colony of subjects of Swaruru of Mokanduku. By the time we had arrived at camp everybody had recovered his good humour and content except Hamad. Thani's men happened to set his tent too close to Hamad's tree, around which his bales were stacked. Whether the little sheikh imagined honest old Thani capable of stealing one is not known, but it is certain that he stormed and raved about the near neighbourhood of his best friend's tent, until Thani ordered its removal a hundred yards off. This proceeding even, it seems, did not satisfy Hamad, for it was quite midnight, as Thani said, when Hamad came, and kissing his hands and feet, on his knees implored forgiveness, which, of course, Thani, being the soul of good nature, and as large-hearted as any man, willingly gave. Hamad was not satisfied, however, until with the aid of his slaves he had transported his friend's tent to where it had at first been pitched. The water at Munyeka was obtained from a deep depression in a hump of cyanite, and was as clear as crystal, and as cold as ice-water, a luxury we had not experienced since leaving Sembaweni. We were now on the borders of Unyanzi, or it is as better known, Makanduki Makali, the hot ground or hot field. We had passed the village populated by Wagogo, and were about to shake the dust of Ugogo from our feet. We had entered Ugogo full of hopes, believing it a most pleasant land, a land flowing with milk and honey. We had been grievously disappointed, it proved to be a land of gall and bitterness, full of trouble and vexation of spirit, where danger was imminent at every step, where we were exposed to the caprice of inebriated sultans. Is it a wonder, then, that all felt happy at such a moment? With the prospect before us of what was believed by many to be a real wilderness, our ardour was not abated, but was rather strengthened. The wilderness in Africa proves to be, in many instances, more friendly than the populated country. The Kirangozi blew his kudu horn much more merrily on this morning than he was accustomed to do while in Ugogo. We were about to enter Magundu Makali. At nine a.m., three hours after leaving Munieka, and two hours since we had left the extreme limits of Ugogo, we were halted at Mabungura Nala. The Nala runs southwesterly, after leaving its source in the chain of hills dividing Ugogo from Magunda Makali. During the rainy season it must be nearly impassable, owing to the excessive slope of its bed. Traces of the force of the torrent are seen in the cyanite and basalt boulders which encumber their course. Their rugged angles are worn smooth, and deep basins are excavated where the bed is of the rock, which in the dry season serve as reservoirs. Though the water contained in them has a slimy and greenish appearance, and is well populated with frogs, it is by no means unpalatable. End of chapter 7, part 3「Chapter Seven, Part Four of How I Found Livingston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingston Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter Seven, Part Four Marenge Makali, Ugogo, and Uyanzi to Unyanyembe. At noon we resumed our march, the Wanyamwezi cheering, shouting, and singing, 
the Wangwana soldiers, servants, and pagazis vying with them in volume of voice and noise-making, the dim forest through which we were now passing resonant with their voices. The scenery was much more picturesque than any we had yet seen since leaving Bagamoyo. The ground rose into grander waves, hills cropped out here and there, great castles of cyanide appeared, giving a strange and weird appearance to the forest. From a distance it would almost seem as if we were approaching a bit of England as it must have appeared during feudalism. The rocks assumed such strange, fantastic shapes. Now they were round boulders raised one above another, apparently susceptible to every breath of wind. Anon they towered like blunt-pointed obelisks, taller than the tallest trees. Again they assumed the shape of mighty waves, vitrified. Here they were a small heap of fractured and riven rock, there they rose to the grandeur of hills. By five p.m. we had travelled twenty miles, and the signal was sounded for a halt. At one a.m., the moon being up, Hamad's horn and voice were heard throughout the silent camp, awakening his pagazis for the march. Evidently Sheikh Hamad was gone stark mad, otherwise why should he be so frantic for the march at such an early hour? The dew was falling heavily, and chilled one like a frost and an ominous murmur of deep discontent responded to the early call on all sides. Presuming, however, that he had obtained better information than we had, Sheikh Thani and I resolved to be governed as the events proved him to be right or wrong. As all were discontented this night, march was performed in a deep silence. The thermometer was at fifty-three degrees, we being about forty-five hundred feet above the level of the sea. The pagazis, almost naked, walked quickly in order to keep warm, and by doing so many a sore foot was made by stumbling against obtrusive roots and rocks, and treading on thorns. At three a.m. we arrived in the village of Unyambogi, where we threw ourselves down to rest and sleep until dawn should reveal what else was in store for the hard-dealt-with caravans. It was broad daylight when I awoke. The sun was flaring his hot beams in my face. Sheikh Thani came soon after to inform me that Hamad had gone to Kiti two hours since, but he, when asked to accompany him, positively refused, exclaiming against it as folly and utterly unnecessary. When my advice was asked by Thani, I voted the whole thing as sheer nonsense, and in turn asked him what a terekeza was for. Was it not an afternoon march enough to enable caravans to reach water and food? Thani replied that it was. I then asked him if there was no water or food to be obtained in Unyambogi. Thani replied that he had not taken pains to inquire, but was told by the villagers that there was an abundance of Matamiya, Hindi, Maweri, sheep, goats, and chickens in their village at cheap prices, such as were not known in Ugogo. Well, then, said I, if Hamad wants to be a fool and kill his pagazis, why should we? I have as much cause for haste as Sheikh Hamad but Unyanyembe is far yet, and I am not going to endanger my property by playing the madman. As Thani had reported, we found an abundance of provisions at the village, and good sweet water from some pits close by. A sheep cost one chukka, six chickens were also purchased at that price, six measures of matama, maweri, or hindi were procurable for the same sum. In short, we were coming at last into the land of plenty." On the 10th June we arrived at Kiti, after a journey of four hours and a half, where we found the irrepressible Hamad halted in sore trouble. He who would be a Caesar proved to be an irresolute Anthony. He had to sorrow over the death of a favorite slave-girl, the loss of five dish-dashes, Arab shirts, silvered sleeve, and gold-embroidered jackets, with which he had thought to enter Unyanyembe in state, as became a merchant of his standing, which had disappeared with three absconding servants, besides copper trays, rice and pilau dishes, and two bales of cloth with runaway Wangwani pagazis. Salim, my Arab servant, asked him, What are you doing here, Sheikh Hamad? I thought you were well on the road to Unyanyeme. Said he, Could I leave Thani, my friend, behind? Kiti abounded in cattle and grain, and we were able to obtain food at easy rates. The Wakimbu, emigrants from Ukimbu, near Ururi, are a quiet race, preferring the peaceful arts of agriculture to war, of tending their flocks to conquest. At the least rumor of war they remove their property and family, and emigrate to the distant wilderness, where they begin to clear the land and to hunt the elephant for his ivory. Yet we found them to be a fine race, and well armed, and seemingly capable by their numbers and arms to compete with any tribe. But here, as elsewhere, disunion makes them weak. They are mere small colonies, each colony ruled by its own chief, 
whereas, were they united, they might make a very respectable front before an enemy. Our next destination was Masalalo, a distant fifteen miles from Kiti. Hamad, after vainly searching for his runaways and the valuable property he had lost, followed us, and tried once more, when he saw us encamped at Masalalo, to pass us. But his pagazis failed him, the march having been so long. Weld Nagarezo was reached on the fifteenth, after three and a half hours' march. It is a flourishing place, where provisions were almost twice as cheap as they were at Unyambogi. Two hours' march south is Jewel la Mokoa, on the old road, towards which the road which we have been travelling since leaving Bagamoyo was now rapidly leading. Unyanyembe being near, the pagazis and soldiers, having behaved excellently during the lengthy marches we had lately made, I purchased a bullock for three doti, and had it slaughtered for their special benefit. I also gave each a ket of red beads to indulge his appetite for whatever little luxury the country afforded. Milk and honey were plentiful, and three fasala of sweet potatoes were bought for a shuka, equal to about forty cents of our money. The thirteenth of June brought us to the last village of Maganda Makali, in the district of Jiwalasinga, after a short march of eight miles and three quarters. Kasuri, so called by the Arabs, is called Kansuli by the Wakimbu who inhabit it. This is, however, but one instance out of many where the Arabs have misnamed or corrupted the native names of villages and districts. Between Nagarezo and Kasuri we passed the village of Kururumo, now a thriving place, with many a thriving village near it. As we passed it, the people came out to greet the Masungu, whose advent had been so long heralded by his loud-mouthed caravans, and whose soldiers had helped them win the day in a battle against their fractious brothers of Jiwa Lamakoa. A little further on we came across a large kambi, occupied by a Sultan bin Muhammad, an Omani Arab of high descent, who, as soon as he was notified of my approach, came out to welcome me, and invited me to his kambi. As his harem lodged in his tent, of course I was not invited thither, but a carpet outside was ready for his visitor. After the usual questions had been asked about my health, the news of the road, the latest from Zanzibar and Oman, he asked me if I had much cloth with me. This was a question often asked by owners of down caravans, and the reason of it is that the Arabs, in their anxiety to make as much as possible of their cloth at the ivory ports on the Tanganyika and elsewhere, are liable to forget that they should retrain a portion for the down marches. As, indeed, I had but a bale left of the quantity of cloth retained for provisioning my party on the road, when outfitting my caravans on the coast, I could unblushingly reply in the negative. I halted a day at Kasuri to give my caravan a rest, after its long series of marches, before venturing on the two days' march through the uninhabited wilderness that separates the district of Jiwa Lasinga Uyuza from the district of Tura in Unyanyembe. Hamad proceeded, promising to give Said ben Salim notice of my coming, and to request him to provide a tembe for me. On the 15th, having ascertained that Sheikh Thani would be detained several days at Kasuri, owing to the excessive number of his people who were laid up with that dreadful plague of East Africa, the smallpox, I bade him farewell, and my caravan struck out of Kasuri once more for the wilderness and the jungle. A little before noon we halted at the Kambi of Magongo Tembo, or the Elephant's Back, so called from a wave of rock whose back, stained into dark brownness by atmospheric influences, is supposed by the natives to resemble the blue-brown back of this monster of the forest. My caravan had quite an argument with me here, as to whether we should make the Terekeza on this day or on the next. The majority was of the opinion that the next day would be the best for a Terekeza, but I, being the Bana, consulting my own interests, insisted, not without a flourish or two of my whip, that the Terekeza should be made on this day. Magongo Tembo, when Burton and Speke passed by, was a promising settlement, cultivating many a fair acre of ground. But two years ago war broke out, for some bold act of its people upon caravans, and the Arabs came from Unyanyembe with their Wangwana servants, attacked them, burnt the villages, and laid waste the work of years. Since that time Magongo Tembo has been but blackened wrecks of houses, and the fields a sprouting jungle. A cluster of date palms, overtopping a dense grove close to the Matani of Magongo Tembo, revived my recollections of Egypt. 
The banks of the stream, with their verdant foliage, presented a strange contrast to the brown and dry appearance of the jungle, which lay on either side. At 1 p.m. we resumed our loads and walking staffs, and in a short time were en route for the Nguala Motoni, distant eight and three-quarters miles from the Kambi. The sun was hot, like a globe of living, seething flame. It flared its heat full on our heads, then, as it descended towards the west, scorched the air before it was inhaled by the lungs which craved it. Gourds of water were emptied speedily to quench the fierce heat that burned the throat and lungs. One pagazi, stricken heavily with the smallpox, succumbed, and threw himself down on the roadside to die. We never saw him afterwards, for the progress of a caravan on a terraqueza is something like that of a ship in a hurricane. The caravan must proceed, Woe befall him who lags behind, for hunger and thirst will overtake him. So must a ship drive before the fierce gale to escape foundering. Woe befall him who falls overboard. An abundance of water, good, sweet, and cool, was found in the bed of the Matoni in deep stony reservoirs. Here also the traces of furious torrents were clearly visible, as at Mungunguru. The Nguala commences in Ubanarama to the north, a country famous for its fine breed of donkeys and after running south, south-southwest, crosses the Unyanyembe road, from which point it has more of a westerly turn. On the 16th we arrived at Maradida, so called from a village which was, but is now no more. Maradida is twelve and a half miles from the Nguala Matoni. A pool of good water a few hundred yards from the roadside is the only supply caravans can obtain, nearer than Tura in Unyamwezi. The tsitsi, or chafwa fly, as called by the waswahili, stung us dreadfully, which is a sign that large game visit the pool sometimes, but must not be mistaken for an indication that there is any in the immediate neighborhood of the water. A single pool so frequented by passing caravans, which must of necessity halt here, could not be often visited by the animals of the forest, who are shy in this part of Africa of the haunts of men. At dawn the next day we were on the road striding at a quicker pace than on most days, since we were about to quit Magundimali for the more populated and better land of Unyamwezi. The forest held its own for a wearisome long time, but at the end of two hours it thinned, then dwarfed into a low jungle, and finally vanished altogether, and we had arrived on the soil of Unyamwezi. With a broad plain, swelling, subsiding, and receding in lengthy and grand undulations in our front, to one indefinite horizon line, which purpled in the far distance. The few consisted of fields of grain ripening, which followed the contour of the plain, and which rustled merrily before the morning breeze that came laden with the chills of Usagara. At eight a.m. we had arrived at the frontier village of Umnyamwezi, eastern Tura, which we invaded without any regard to the disposition of the few inhabitants who lived there. Here we found Nando, a runaway of Speaks, one of those who had sided with Baraka against Bombay, who, desiring to engage himself with me, was engaging enough to furnish honey and sherbet to his former companions, and lastly to the Pagazis. It was only a short breathing pause we made here, having another hour's march to reach central Tura. The road from eastern Tura led through vast fields of millet, Indian corn, hulkus sorghum, mawari, or panicum, or bajri, as called by Arabs, gardens of sweet potatoes, large tracts of cucumbers, watermelons, mushmelons, and peanuts which grew in the deep furrows between the ridges of the hulkas. Some broad-leafed plantain plants were also seen in the neighborhood of the villages, which, as we advanced, became very numerous. The villages of the Wakimbu are like those of the Wagogo, square, flat-roofed, enclosing an open area, which is sometimes divided into three or four parts by fences or matama stocks. At central Tura, where we encamped, we had evidence enough of the rascality of the Wakimbo of Tura. Hamad, who despite his efforts to reach Unyanyembe in time to sell his cloths before other Arabs came with cloth supplies, was unable to compel his bagazis to the double march every day, was also encamped at central Tura, together with the Arab servants who preferred Hamad's imbecile haste to Thani's cautious advance. Our first night in Unyamwezi was very exciting indeed. The Masungu's camp was visited by two crawling thieves, but they were soon made aware by the portentous click of a trigger that the white man's camp was well guarded. Hamad's camp was next visited, but here also the restlessness of the owner frustrated their attempts, for he was pacing backwards and forwards through his camp, 
with a loaded gun in his hand, and the thieves were obliged to relinquish the chance of stealing any of his bales. From Hamad's they proceeded to Hassan's camp, one of the Arab servants, where they were successful enough to reach and lay hold of a couple of bales, but unfortunately they made a noise, which awoke the vigilant and quick-eared slave, who snatched his loaded musket, and in a moment had shot one of them through the heart. Such were our experiences of the Wakimbu of Tura. On the 18th the three caravans, Hamad's, Hassan's, and my own, left Tura by a road which zigzagged towards all points through the Tamatama fields. In an hour's time we had passed Tura Pero, or western Tura, and had entered the forest again, whence the Wakimbu of Tura obtained their honey, and where they excavate deep traps for the elephants with which the forest is said to abound. An hour's march from western Tura brought us to Aziwa, or Pond. There were two, situated in the midst of a small open mabuga, or plain, which, even at this late season, was yet soft from the water which overflows it during the rainy season. After resting three hours, we started on the Terrakeza, or afternoon march. It was one in the same forest that we had entered soon after leaving western Tura, that we travelled through until we reached the Koala Matoni, or as Burton has misnamed it on his map, Koala. The water of this matoni is contained in large ponds, or deep depressions in the wide and crooked gully of Koala. In these ponds a species of mudfish was found, of one of which I made a meal, by no means to be despised by one who had not tasted fish since leaving Bagamoyo. Probably, if I had my choice, being, when occasion demands it, rather fastidious in my tastes, I would not select the mudfish. From Tura to the Koala matoni is seventeen and a half miles a distance which, however easy it may be traversed once a fortnight, assumes a prodigious length when one has to travel it almost every other day, at least so my pagazis, soldiers, and followers found it, and their murmurs were loud when I ordered the signal to be sounded on the march. Abdul Qadir, the tailor who had attached himself to me, as a man ready-handed at all things, from mending a pair of pants, making a delicate entremont, or suiting an elephant, but whom the interior proved to be the weakliest of the weakly, unfit for anything except eating and drinking, almost succumbed on this march. Long ago the little stock of goods which Abdul had brought from Zanzibar folded in a pocket handkerchief, and with which he was about to buy ivory and slaves, and make his fortune in the famed land of Unyamwezi, had disappeared with the great eminent hopes he had built on them, like those of Al-Nashar, the unfortunate owner of crockery in the Arabian tale. He came to me as we prepared for the march, with a most dolorous tale about his approaching death, which he felt in his bones, and weary back. His legs would barely hold him up. In short, he had utterly collapsed. Would I take mercy on him, and let him depart? The cause of this extraordinary request, so unlike the spirit with which he had left Zanzibar, eager to possess the ivory and slaves of Unyamwezi, was that, on the long, last march, two of my donkeys being dead, I had ordered that the two saddles which they had carried should be Abdul Qadir's load to Unyanyembe. The weight of the saddles was sixteen pounds, as the spring balance scale indicated, yet Abdul Qadir became weary of life, as he counted the long marches that intervened between the Matoni and the Unyanyembe. On the ground he fell prone, to kiss my feet, begging me in the name of God to permit him to depart. As I had some experience of Hindus, Malabaris, and Coolies in Abyssinia, I knew exactly how to deal with a case like this. Unhesitatingly I granted the request as soon as asked, for as much tired as Abdul Qadir said he was of life, I was with Abdul Qadir's worthlessness. But the Hindi did not want to be left in the jungle, he said, but after arriving in Unanyembe. Oh, said I, then you must reach Unanyembe first. In the meanwhile you will carry those saddles there for the food which you must eat. As the march to Rabuga was eighteen and three-quarters miles, the Pagazis walked fast and long without resting. Rabuga, in the days of Burton, according to his book, was a prosperous district. Even when we passed, the evidences of wealth and prosperity which it possessed formerly were plain enough in the wide extent of its grain fields, which stretched to the right and left of the Unyanyembe road for many a mile. But they were the only evidences of what once were numerous villages, a well-cultivated and populous district, rich in herds of cattle and stores of grain. All the villages are burnt down, the people have been driven north three or four days from Rabuga, the cattle were taken by force, 
the grain fields were left standing to be overgrown with jungle and rank weeds. We passed village after village that had been burnt, and were mere blackened heaps of charred timber and smoked clay. Field after field of ripe grain years ago was yet standing in the midst of a crop of gums and thorns, mimosa and coquall. We arrived at the village, occupied by about sixty Wangwana, who have settled here to make a living by buying and selling ivory. Food is provided for them in the deserted fields of the people of Urbuga. We were very tired and heated from the long march, but the pagazis had all arrived by three p.m. At the Wangwana village we met Amir ben Sultan, the very type of old Arab sheikh, such as we read of in books, with a snowy beard and a clean, reverend face, who was returning to Zanzibar after a ten years' residence in Unanyembe. He presented me with a goat, and a goat-skin full of rice, a most acceptable gift in a place where a goat cost five cloths. After a day's halt at Rabuga, during which I dispatched two soldiers to notify Sheikh Said bin Salim and Sheikh bin Nasib, the two chief dignitaries of Unyanyembe, of my coming, on the 21st of June we resumed the march for Kigwa, distant five hours. The road ran through another forest similar to that which separated Tura from Rabuga, the country rapidly sloping as we proceeded westward. Kigwa we found to have been visited by the same vengeance which rendered Rabuga such a waste. The next day, after three and a half hours' rapid march, we crossed the Matoni, which was no Matoni, separating Kigwa from the Unyanyembe district, and after a short halt to quench our thirst, in three and a half hours more arrived at Shiza. It was a most delightful march, though a long one, for its picturesqueness of scenery, which every few minutes was revealed, and the proofs everywhere we saw of the peaceful and industrious disposition of the people. A short hour and a half from Shiza we beheld the undulating plain wherein the Arabs have chosen to situate the central depot which commands such a wide and extensive field of trade. The lowing of cattle and the bleeding of the goats and sheep were everywhere heard, giving the country a happy pastoral aspect. The Sultan of Shiza desired me to celebrate my arrival in Unyanyembe with a five-gallon jar of pombe, which he brought for that purpose. As the pombe was but stale ale in taste, and milk and water in color, after drinking a small glassful I passed it to the delighted soldiers and pagazis. At my request the sultan brought a fine, fat bullock, for which he accepted four and a half doti of Marikani. The bullock was immediately slaughtered and served out to the caravan as a farewell feast. No one slept much that night, and long before the dawn the fires were lit, and great steaks were broiling, that their stomachs might rejoice before parting with the Masungu, whose bounty they had so often tasted. Six rounds of powder were served to each soldier, and Pagazi, who owned a gun, to fire away when we should be near the Arab houses. The meanest Pagazi had his best cloth about his loins, and some were exceedingly brave in gorgeous Ulya, Kombiza, Pagonga, and crimson Jawa, the glossy Rahani, and the neat Dabwani. The soldiers were mustered in new tarbushes, and the long white shirts of the Marima and the island. For this was the great and happy day which had been on our tongues ever since quitting the coast, for which we had made those noted marches latterly, one hundred and seventy-eight and a half miles in sixteen days, including pauses, something over eleven miles a day. The signal sounded, and the caravan was joyfully off with banners flying and trumpets and horns blaring. A short two and a half hours' march brought us within sight of Quikura, which is about two miles south of Tabora, the main Arab town, on the outside of which we saw a long line of men in clean shirts, whereat we opened our charged batteries and fired a volley of small arms, such as Quikura seldom heard before. The Pagazis closed up and adopted the swagger of veterans. The soldiers blazed away uninterruptedly, while I, seeing that the Arabs were advancing towards me, left the ranks and held out my hand, which was immediately grasped by Sheikh Said bin Salim, and then by about two dozen people, and thus our entree into Unyanyembe was effected. End of chapter 7, part 4「8」Part 1 of How I Found Livingstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 8, Part 1. My Life and Troubles During My Residence in Unyas Niembe. I Become Engaged in a War. I received a noiseless ovation as I walked side by side with the governor, Said bin Salim, towards his tembe in Kwikuru, or the capital. The Wanyamwezi Pagazis were out by the hundreds. The warriors of Mkasiwa, the sultan, hovered around their chief. The children were seen between the legs of their parents, even infants a few months old slung over their mothers' backs, all paid the tribute due to my colour, with one grand concentrated stare. The only persons who talked with me were the Arabs, and aged Mkasiwa, ruler of Unyanyembe. Said bin Salim's house was at the northwestern corner of the enclosure, a stockaded boma of Kwikuru. We had tea made in a silver teapot, and a bountiful supply of dampers were smoking under a silver cover, and to this repast I was invited. When a man has walked eight miles or so without any breakfast, and a hot tropical sun has been shining on him for three or four hours, he is apt to do justice to a meal, especially if his appetite is healthy. I think I astonished the governor by the dexterous way in which I managed to consume eleven cups of his aromatic concoction of an Assam herb, and the easy effortless style with which I demolished his high tower of slapjacks, that but a minute or so smoked hotly under their silver cover. For the meal I thanked the sheikh, as only an earnest and sincerely hungry man now satisfied could thank him. Even if I had not spoken, my gratified looks had well informed him under what obligations I had been laid to him. Out came my pipe and tobacco pouch. My friendly sheikh, wilt thou smoke? No thanks, Arabs never smoke. Oh, if you don't, perhaps you would not object to me smoking in order to assist digestion? Gema, good, go on, master. Then began the questions. The gossipy, curious, serious, light questions. How came the master? By the Mpwapa road. It is good. Was the Makata bad? Very bad. What news from Zanzibar? Good. Seer Torki has possession of Muscat, and Azim bin Gis was slain in the streets. Is this true, Ali? By God. It is true. <laughs> this is news stroking his beard. Have you heard, Master, of Suleiman bin Ali? Yes, the Bombay governor sent him to Zanzibar in a man of war, and Suleiman bin Ali now lies in the Goraiza. Fort. Heh, that is very good. Did you have to pay much tribute to the Wagogo? Eight times. Hamad Kimiani wished me to go by Kiwiya, but I declined when struck through the forest to Munieka. Hamad and Thani thought it better to follow me than to brave Kiwiya by themselves. Where is that Haji Abdullah, Captain Burton, that came here and speaky? Speak. Haji Abdullah? What Haji Abdullah? Ah, Sheikh Burton we call him. Oh, he is a great man now. A Balius, a consul. A Del Sham, Damascus. <laughs> Balius? Hey, a Del Sham? Is not that near Bethlehem al Quds, Jerusalem? Yes, about four days. Speaky is dead. He shot himself by accident. Ah, oh, Wella, by God, but this is bad news. Speaky dead? Mashallah. Oh, he was a good man, a good man. Dead? But where is his Kaza, Sheikh Said? Kaza? Kaza? I never heard the name before. But you were with Burton and Speak at Kaza. You lived there several months when you were all stopping in Unyanyembe. It must be close here somewhere. Where did Haji Abdullah and Speaky live when they were in Unyanyembe? Was it not in Musa Mazuri's house? That was in Tabora. Well, then, where is Kaza? I have never seen the man yet who could tell me where that place is, and yet the three white men have that word down as the name of the place they lived at when you were with them. You must know where it is. Wallahi Bana, I never heard the name. But stop, Kaza in Kinlimwezi means kingdom. Perhaps they gave that name to the place they stopped at. But then I used to call the first house Snape in Amma's house, and Speak lived at Musa Mazuri's house, but both houses, as well as all the rest, are in Tabora. Thank you, Sheikh. I should like to go and look after my people. They must all be wanting food. I shall go with you to show you your house. The Tembi is in Kuihara, only an hour's walk from Tabora. On leaving Kuikuru, we crossed a low ridge, 
and soon saw Quihara lying between two low ranges of hills, the northernmost of which was terminated westward by the round, fortress-like hill of Simbili. There was a cold glare of intense sunshine over the valley, probably the effect of a universal bleakness or an autumnal ripeness of the grass, unrelieved by any depth of colour to vary the universal sameness. The hills were bleached, or seemed to be, under that dazzling sunshine and clearest atmosphere. The corn had long been cut, and there lay the stubble and fields, a browny white expanse. The houses were of mud, and their flat roofs were of mud, and the mud was of a browny whiteness. The huts were thatched, and the stockades around them of barked timber, and these were of a browny whiteness. The cold, fierce, sickly wind from the mountains of Uzagara sent a deadly chill to our very marrows, yet the intense sunshiny glare never changed. A black cow or two or a tall tree here and there caught the eye for a moment, but they never made one forget that the first impression of Quihara was as of a picture without colour, or of food without taste, and if one looked up there was a sky of a pale blue, spotless and of an awful serenity. As they approached the tembe of Said bin Salim, Sheikh bin Nasib and other great Arabs joined us. Before the great door of the tembe the men had stacked the bales and piled the boxes, and were using their tongues at a furious rate, relating to the chiefs and soldiers of the first, second, and fourth caravans the many events which had befallen them, and which seemed to them the only things worth relating. Outside of their own limited circles they evidently cared for nothing. Then the several chiefs of the other caravans had in turn to relate their experiences of the road, and the noise of tongues was loud and furious. But as we approached all this loud sounding gabble ceased, and my caravan chiefs and guides rushed to me to hail me as master, and to salute me as their friend. One fellow, faithful Baruti, threw himself at my feet, the others fired their guns and acted like madmen suddenly become frenzied, and a general cry of welcome was heard on all sides. "'Walk in, master, this is your house now. Here are your men's quarters, here you will receive the great Arabs. Here is the cook-house, here is the store-house, here is the prison for the refectory, here are your white men's apartments, and these are your own, see, here is the bedroom, here is the gun-room, bathroom, etc. And so Sheikh Said talked as he showed me the several places. On my honour it was a most comfortable place, this in Central Africa. One could almost wax poetic, but we will keep such ambitious ideas for a future day. Just now, however, we must have the goods stored, and the little army of carriers paid off and disbanded. Bombay was ordered to unlock the strong storeroom, to pile the bales in regular tiers, the beads in rows one above another, and the wire in a separate place. The boats, canvas, etc., were to be placed high above the reach of white ants, and the boxes of ammunition and powder kegs were to be stored in the gun-room, out of reach of danger. Then a bale of cloth was opened, and each carrier was rewarded according to his merits, that each of them might proceed home to his friends and neighbours, and tell them how much better the white men behaved than the Arab. The reports of the leaders of the first, second, and fourth caravans were then received, their separate stores inspected, and the details and events of their marches heard. The first caravan had been engaged in a war in Kirurumo, and had come out of the fight successful, and had reached Unyanyembe without loss of anything. The second had shot a thief in the forest between Pemberapere and Kiridimo. The fourth had lost a bale in the jungle of Marenga Mkali, and the porter who had carried it had received a very sore head from a knob-stick wielded by one of the thieves, who prowl about the jungle near the frontier of Ugogo. I was delighted to find that their misfortunes were no more, and each leader was then and there rewarded with one handsome cloth, and five doti of Merikani. Just as I began to feel hungry again came several slaves in succession, bearing trays full of good things from the Arabs, first an enormous dish of rice with a bowl full of curried chicken, another with a dozen huge wheaten cakes, another with a plateful of smoking hot krillas, another with pawpaws, another with pomegranates and lemons, after these came men driving five fat humpbacked oxen, eight sheep and ten goats, and another man with a dozen chickens and a dozen fresh eggs. This was real, practical, noble courtesy, munificent hospitality, which quite took my gratitude by storm. My people, now reduced to twenty-five, were as delighted at the prodigal plentitude visible on my tables and in my yard as I was myself. 
and as they saw their eyes light up at the unctuous anticipations presented to them by their riotous fancies, I ordered a bullock to be slaughtered and distributed. The second day of the arrival of the expedition in the country which I now looked upon as classic ground, since Captains Burton, Speke, and Grant years ago had visited it and described it, came the Arab magnates from Tabor to congratulate me. Tabora is the principal Arab settlement in Central Africa. It contains over a thousand huts and tembis, and one may safely estimate the population, Arabs, Wangwana, and natives, at five thousand people. Between Tabora and the next settlement, Quihara, rise two rugged hill ridges, separated from each other by a low saddle, over the top of which Tabora is always visible from Quihara. There is no such recognized place as Kaza. They were a fine, handsome body of men, these Arabs. They mostly hailed from Oman. Others were Wazawahili, and each of my visitors had quite a retinue with him. At Tabora they live quite luxuriously. The plain on which the settlement is situated is exceedingly fertile. Though naked of trees, the rich pasturage it furnishes permits them to keep large herds of cattle and goats, from which they have an ample supply of milk, cream, butter, and ghee. Rice is grown everywhere. Sweet potatoes, yams, mohogo, mohoko sorghum, maize, or Indian corn, sesame, millet, field peas, or vetches called choroko, are cheap and always procurable. Around their tembes the Arabs cultivate a little wheat for their own purposes, and have planted orange, lemon, pawpaw, and mangoes, which thrive here fairly well. Onions and garlic, chilies, cucumbers, tomatoes, and brinjols may be procured by the white visitor from the more important Arabs, who are undoubted Epicureans in their way. Their slaves convey to them from the coast, once a year at least, their stores of tea, coffee, sugar, spices, jellies, curries, wine, brandy, biscuits, sardines, salmon, and such fine cloths and articles as they require for their own personal use. Almost every Arab of any eminence is able to show a wealth of Persian carpets, and most luxurious bedding, complete tea and coffee services, and magnificently carved dishes of tinned copper and brass lavers. Several of them sport gold watches and chains, mostly all a watch and chain of some kind and as in Persia, Afghanistan, and Turkey, the harems form an essential feature of every Arab's household. The sensualism of the Mohammedans is as prominent here as in the Orient. The Arabs who now stood before the front door of my tembi were the donors of the good things received the day before. As in duty bound, of course, I greeted Sheikh Said first, then Sheikh bin Nasib, His Highness of Zanzibar's Consul of Caragua, then I greeted the noblest Trojan among the Arab population, noblest in bearing, noblest in courage and manly worth, Sheikh Kamis bin Abdullah, then young Amram bin Masood, who is now making war on the king of Urori and his fractious people, then handsome, courageous Sood, the son of Said bin Majid, then dandified Tani bin Abdullah, then Musood bin Abdullah and his cousin Abdullah bin Masood, who owned the houses where formerly lived Burton and Speke, then old Suleiman Dawa, Said bin Saif, and the old hetman of Tabora, Sheikh Sultan bin Ali. As the visit of these magnates, under whose loving protection white travellers must needs submit themselves, was only a formal one, such as Arab etiquette, ever of the stateliest and truest, impelled them to, it is unnecessary to relate the discourse on my health and their wealth, my thanks and their professions of loyalty and attachment to me. After having expended our mutual stock of congratulations and nonsense, they departed, having stated their wish that I should visit them at Tabora and partake of a feast which they were about to prepare for me. Three days afterwards I sallied out of my tembi, escorted by eighteen bravely dressed men of my escort, to pay Tabora a visit. On surmounting the saddle over which the road from the valley of Quihara leads to Tabora, the plain on which the Arab settlement is situated lay before us, one expanse of dun pasture-land, stretching from the base of the hill on our left as far as the banks of the northern Gomb, which a few miles beyond Tabora heave into purple-coloured hills and blue cones. Within three-quarters of an hour we were seated on the mud veranda of the tembe of Sultan bin Ali, who, because of his age, his wealth, and his position, being a colonel in Said Bukhash's unlovely army, is looked upon by his countrymen high and low as a referee and counsellor. His boma, or enclosure, contains quite a village of hive-shaped huts and square tembis. 
From here, after being presented with a cup of mocha coffee and some sherbet, we directed our steps towards Kamis bin Abdullah's house, who had, in anticipation of my coming, prepared a feast to which he had invited his friends and neighbours. The group of stately Arabs in their long white dresses and jaunty caps, also of a snowy white, who stood ready to welcome me to Dabora, produced quite an effect on my mind. I was in time for a council of war they were holding, and I was requested to attend. Kamis bin Abdullah, a bold and brave man, ever ready to stand up for the privileges of the Arabs and their rights to pass through any countries for legitimate trade, is the man who, in Speke's journal of the discovery of the source of the Nile, is reported to have shot Maula, an old chief who sided with Manuasera during the wars of 1860, and who subsequently, after chasing his relentless enemy for five years through Ogogo and Unyamwezi as far as Ukonongo, had the satisfaction of beheading him, was now urging the Arabs to assert their rights against a chief called Mirambo of Uyoe, in a crisis which was advancing. This Mirambo of Uyoe, it seems, had for the last few years been in a state of chronic discontent with the policies of the neighbouring chiefs. Formerly a pagazi for an Arab, he had now assumed regal power, with the usual knack of unconscionable rascals who care not by what means they step into power. When the chief of Uyoe died, Mirambo, who was head of a gang of robbers infesting the forests of Wiliankuru, suddenly entered Uyoe, and constituted himself Lord Paramount by force. Some feats of enterprise which he performed to the enrichment of all those who recognized his authority established him firmly in his position. This was but a beginning. He carried war through Ugara to Unkonongo, through Usagozi to the borders of Uvinza, and after destroying the populations over three degrees of latitude, he conceived a grievance against Mkasiwa and against the Arabs, because they would not sustain him in his ambitious projects against the ally and friend with whom they were living in peace. The first outrage which this audacious man committed against the Arabs was the halting of an Ujiji-bound caravan, and the demand for five kegs of gunpowder, five guns, and five bales of cloth. This extraordinary demand, after expending more than a day in fierce controversy, was paid, but the Arabs, if they were surprised at the exorbitant blackmail demanded of them, were more than ever surprised when they were told to return the way they came, and that no Arab caravan should pass through his country to Ujiji, except over his dead body. On the return of the unfortunate Arabs to Unyanyembe, they reported the facts to Sheikh Said bin Salim, the governor of the Arab colony. This old man, being averse to war, of course tried every means to induce Mirambo as of old to be satisfied with presents, but Mirambo this time was obdurate, and sternly determined on war unless the Arabs aided him in the warfare he was about to wage against old Mkasiwa, sultan of the Waniamwezi of Unyanyembe. This is the status of affairs, said Kamis bin Abdullah. Mirambo says that for years he has been engaged in war against the neighbouring Washensi, and has come out of it victorious. He says this is a great year with him, that he is going to fight the Arabs in the Waniamwezi of Unyanyembe, and that he shall not stop until every Arab is driven from Unyanyembe, and he rules over this country in place of Umkasiwa. Children of our man, shall it be so? Speak, Salim, son of Saif, shall we go to meet this Mashensi, pagan, or shall we return to our island? A murmur of approbation followed the speech of Kamis bin Abdullah, the majority of those present being young men eager to punish the audacious Mirambo. Salim, the son of Saif, an old patriarch, slow of speech, tried to appease the passions of the young men, signs of the aristocracy of Muscat and Mutra, and Bedouins of the desert, but Kamis's bold words had made too deep an impression on their minds. Saud, the handsome Arab whom I have noticed already as the son of Said, the son of Majid, spoke. My father used to tell me that he remembered the days when the Arabs could go through the country from Bagamoyo to Ujiji, and from Kilwa to Lunda, and from Usenga to Uganda armed with canes. Those days are gone by. We have stood the insolence of the Wagogo long enough. Swaruru of Usoi just takes from us whatever he wants, and now here is Mirambo, who says after taking more than five bales of cloth as tribute from one man that no Arab caravan shall go to Ujiji, but over his body. Are we prepared to give up the ivory of Ujiji, of Urundi, of Karagwa, of Uganda, because of this one man? I say war. War until we have got his beard under our feet. 
War until the whole of Uyoe and William Kuru is destroyed. War until we can again travel through any part of the country with only our walking canes in our hands. The universal assent that followed Sen's speech proved beyond a doubt that we were about to have a war. I thought of Livingstone. What if we were marching to Unyanyembe directly into the war country? Having found from the Arabs that they intended to finish the war quickly, at most within fifteen days, as Uyoe was only four marches distant, I volunteered to accompany them, take my loaded caravan with me as far as Mfuto, and there leave it in charge of a few guards, and with the rest march on with the Arab army. And my hope was that it might be possible after the defeat of Mirambo and his forest banditti, the Ruga Ruga, to take my expedition direct to Ujiji by the road now closed. The Arabs were sanguine of victory, and I partook of their enthusiasm. The council of war broke up. A great dishful of rice and curry, in which almonds, citron, raisins, and currants were plentifully mixed, was brought in, and it was wonderful how soon we forgot our warlike fervour after our attention had been drawn to this royal dish. I, of course, not being a Mohammedan, had a dish of my own, of a similar composition, strengthened by platters containing roast chicken and kebabs, crullers, cakes, sweetbread, fruit, glasses of sherbet and lemonade, dishes of gumdrops and muscat sweetmeats, dry raisins, prunes, and nuts. Certainly Kamis bin Abdullah proved to me that if he had a warlike soul in him, he could also attend to the cultivated tastes acquired under the shade of the mangoes on his father's estates in Zanzibar, the island. After gorging ourselves on these uncommon dainties, some of the chief Arabs escorted me to other tembes of Tabora. When we went to visit Musub bin Abdullah, he showed me the very ground where Burton and Speke's houses stood, now pulled down and replaced by his office. Sneep bin Amer's house was also torn down, and the fashionable tembe of Unyanyembe, now in vogue, built over it. Finely carved rafters, huge carved doors, brass knockers and lofty, airy rooms, a house built for defence and comfort. The finest house in Unyanyembe belongs to Amram bin Masud, who paid sixty frasila of ivory, over three thousand dollars for it. Very fair houses can be purchased for from twenty to thirty frasila of ivory. Amram's house is called the Two Seas, Baharin. It is one hundred feet in length and twenty feet high, with walls four feet thick, neatly plastered over with mud mortar. The great door is a marvel of carving work for Union Yembe artisans. Each rafter within is also carved with fine designs. Before the front of the house is a young plantation of pomegranate trees, which flourish here as if they were indigenous to the soil. A shadouf, such as may be seen on the Nile, serves to draw water to irrigate the gardens. End of chapter 8, part 1《Chapter 8, Part 2 of How I Found Livingstone》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《How I Found Livingstone》by Sir Henry M. Stanley — Chapter 8, Part 2 — My Life and Troubles During My Residence in Nyes Nyembe Towards evening we walked back to our own finely situated tembe in Quihara, well satisfied with what we had seen at Tabora. My men drove a couple of oxen and carried three sacks of native rice, a most superior kind, the day's presence of hospitality from Kamis bin Abdullah. In Unenyembe I found the Livingston caravan, which started off in a fright from Bagamoyo upon the rumour that the English consul was coming. As all the caravans were now halted at Unyanyembe because of the now approaching war, I suggested to Said bin Salim that it were better that the men of the Livingstone caravan should live with mine in my tembe, that I might watch over the white man's goods. Said bin Salim agreed with me, and the men and goods were at once brought to my tembe. One day Asmani, who was now chief of Livingstone's caravan, the other having died of smallpox two or three days before, brought out a tent to the veranda where I was sitting writing, and showed me a packet of letters, which to my surprise was marked, To Dr. Livingstone, Ujiji, November 1st, 1870, Registered Letters. 
From November 1st, 1870, to February 10th, 1871, just one hundred days at Bagamoyo, a miserable small caravan of thirty-three men halting one hundred days at Bagamoyo, only twenty-five miles by water from Zanzibar. Poor Livingstone! Who knows but he may be suffering for want of these very supplies that were detained so long near the sea. The caravan arrived at Unyanyembe some time about the middle of May. About the latter part of May the first disturbances took place. Had this caravan arrived here in the middle of March, or even in the middle of April, they might have travelled on to Ujiji without trouble. On the 7th of July, about 2 p.m., I was sitting on the Bozani as usual. I felt listless and languid, and a drowsiness came over me. I did not fall asleep, but the power of my limbs seemed to fail me. Yet the brain was busy. All my life seemed passing in review before me. When these retrospective scenes became serious, I looked serious. When they were sorrowful, I wept hysterically. And when they were joyous, I laughed loudly. Reminiscences of yet a young life's battles and hard struggles came surging into the mind in quick succession. Events of boyhood, of youth, and manhood, perils, travels, scenes, joys and sorrows, loves and hates, friendships and indifferences. My mind followed the various and rapid transition of my life's passages. It drew the lengthy, erratic, sinuous lines of travel my footsteps had passed over. If I had drawn them on the sandy floor, what enigmatical problems they had been to those around me, and what plain, readable, intelligent histories they had been to me. The loveliest feature of all to me was the form of a noble and true man who called me son. Of my life in the great pine forests of Arkansas and in Missouri, I retained the most vivid impressions. The dreaming days I passed under the sighing pines on the Ojita's shores, the new clearing, the blockhouse, our faithful black servant, the forest deer and the exuberant life I led, were all well remembered. And I remembered how one day, after we had come to live near the Mississippi, I floated down, down hundreds of miles, with a wild fraternity of gnarly giants, the boatmen of the Mississippi, and how a dear old man welcomed me back, as if from the grave. I remembered also my travels on foot through sunny Spain and France, with numberless adventures in Asia Minor, among Kurdish nomads. I remembered the battlefields of America and the stormy scenes of rampant war. I remembered gold mines and broad prairies, Indian councils, and much experience in the new western lands. I remembered the shock it gave me to hear after my return from a barbarous country of the calamity that had overtaken the fond man whom I called father, and the hot, fitful life that followed it. Stop. Dear me, is it the 21st of July? Yes, Shaw informed me that it was the 21st of July after I recovered from my terrible attack of fever. The true date was the 14th of July, but I was not aware that I had jumped a week until I met Dr. Livingstone. We two together examined the nautical almanac, which I brought with me. We found that the doctor was three weeks out of his reckoning, and to my great surprise I was also one week out, or one week ahead of the actual date. The mistake was made by my being informed that I had been two weeks sick, and as the day I recovered my senses was Friday, and Shaw and the people were morally sure that I was in bed two weeks, I dated it on my diary the 21st of July. However, on the tenth day after the first of my illness, I was in excellent trim again, only, however, to see and attend to Shaw, who was in turn taken sick. By the 22nd of July, Shaw was recovered, and then Selim was prostrated, and groaned in his delirium for four days, but by the 28th we were all recovered, and were beginning to brighten up at the prospect of a diversion in the shape of a march upon Mirambo's stronghold. The morning of the 29th I had fifty men loaded with bales, beads, and wire for Ujiji. When they were mustered for the march outside the Tembe, the only man absent was Bombay. While men were sent to search for him, others departed to get one more look and one more embrace with their black Delilahs. Bombay was found some time about 2 p.m., his face faithfully depicting the contending passions under which he was labouring. Sorrow at parting from the flesh-pots of Unyanyembe, regret at parting from his Dulcinea of Tabora. To be bereft of all enjoyment now, nothing but marches hard, long marches, to go to the war, to be killed, perhaps? Oh, inspired by such feelings, no wonder Bombay was inclined to be pugnacious when I ordered him to his place, and I was in a shocking bad temper, 
for having been kept waiting from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. for him. There was simply a word and a savage look, and my cane was flying around Bombay's shoulders, as if he were to be annihilated. I fancy that the eager fury of my onslaught broke his stubbornness more than anything else, for before I had struck him a dozen times he was crying for pardon. At that word I ceased belabouring him, for this was the first time he had ever uttered that word. Bombay was conquered at last. March! and the guide led off, followed in solemn order by forty-nine of his fellows, every man carrying a heavy load of African monies, besides his gun, hatchet, and stock of ammunition, and his ukali pot. We presented quite an imposing sight while thus marching on in silence and order, with our flags flying, and the red blanket robes of the men streaming behind them as the furious northeaster blew right on our flank. The men seemed to feel they were worth seeing, for I noticed that several assumed a more martial tread as they felt their royal Joho cloth tugging at their necks, as it was swept streaming behind by the wind. Maganga, a tall Minyamwezi, stalked along like a very Goliath about to give battle alone to Mirambo and his thousand warriors. Frisky Kamisi paced on under his load, imitating a lion, and there was the rude jester, the incorrigible Ulimengo, with a stealthy pace like a cat but their silence could not last long. Their vanity was so much gratified, the red cloaks danced so incessantly before their eyes, that it would have been a wonder if they could have maintained such serious gravity or discontent one half-hour longer. Ulimengo was the first who broke it. He had constituted himself the Kirangozi, or guide, and was the standard-bearer, bearing the American flag, which the men thought would certainly strike terror into the hearts of the enemy. Growing confident at first, then valorous, then exultant, he suddenly faced the army he was leading, and shouted, "'Hoy, hoy!' Chorus, "'Hoy, hoy!' "'Where are you going?' Chorus, "'Going to war.' "'Against whom?' Chorus, "'Against Mirambo.' "'Who is your master?' Chorus, "'The white man.' "'Ow, oh, ow!' Oh. Chorus, "'Ow, oh, ow!' Oh. "'Yah, yah!' Chorus, "'Yah, yah!' This was the ridiculous song they kept up all day without intermission. We camped the first day at Bombomas village, situated a mile to the southwest of the natural hill fortress of Zimbili. Bombay was quite recovered from his thrashing, and had banished the sullen thoughts that had aroused my ire, and the men having behaved themselves so well, a five-gallon pot of pombe was brought, to further nourish the valour which they one and all thought they possessed. The second day we arrived at Masangi, I was visited soon afterwards by Saud, the son of Said bin Majid, who told me the Arabs were waiting for me, that they would not march from Mufuto until I had arrived. Eastern Mufuto, after a six hours' march, was reached on the third day from Unyanyembe. Shaw gave in, laid down in the road, and declared he was dying. This news was brought to me about four p.m. by one of the last stragglers. I was bound to despatch men to carry him to me, into my camp, though every man was well tired after the long march. A reward stimulated half a dozen to venture into the forest just at dusk, to find Shaw, who was supposed to be at least three hours away from camp. About two o'clock in the morning my men returned, having carried Shaw on their backs the entire distance. I was roused up, and had him conveyed to my tent. I examined him, and I assured myself he was not suffering from fever of any kind, and in reply to my inquiries as to how he felt, he said he could neither walk nor ride, that he felt such extreme weakness and lassitude that he was incapable of moving further. After administering a glass of port wine to him and a bowlful of sago gruel, we both fell asleep. We arrived early the following morning at Mufuto, the rendezvous of the Arab army. A halt was ordered the next day in order to make ourselves strong by eating the beeves which we freely slaughtered. The personnel of our army was as follows. Sheikh Said bin Salim, twenty-five half-caste. Sheikh Kamis bin Abdullah, two hundred and fifty slaves. Sheikh Thani bin Abdullah, eighty slaves. Sheikh Musud bin Abdullah, seventy-five slaves. Sheikh Abdullah bin Masud, eighty slaves. Sheikh Ali bin Said bin Nasib, two hundred and fifty slaves. Sheikh Nasir bin Masud, fifty slaves. Sheikh Hamed Kimiami, seventy slaves. Sheikh Hamdam, thirty slaves. Sheikh Said bin Habib, fifty slaves. Sheikh Salim bin Saif, a hundred slaves. Sheikh Sunguru, twenty-five slaves. Sheikh Saboko, 
twenty-five slaves, Sheikh Saud bin Said bin Majid, fifty slaves, Sheikh Mohammed bin Masood, thirty slaves, Sheikh Said bin Hamed, ninety slaves, the Herald Expedition, fifty soldiers, Nkasiwa's Wanyamwezi, eight hundred soldiers, a hundred and twenty-five half-castes in Wanwanga, and three hundred independent chiefs and their followers. This made a total of two thousand two hundred and fifty-five, according to numbers given me by Thani bin Abdullah, and corroborated by a baluk in the pay of Sheikh bin Nasib. Of these men, one thousand five hundred were armed with guns, flintlock muskets, German and French double barrels, some English Enfields, and American Springfields. Besides these muskets, they were mostly armed with spears and long knives for the purpose of decapitating and inflicting vengeful gashes in the dead bodies. Powder and ball were plentiful. Some men were served a hundred rounds each. My people received each man sixty rounds. As we fell out of the stronghold of Mufuto, with waving banners denoting the various commanders, with booming horns and the roar of fifty bass drums called gomas, with blessings showered on us by the mullahs and happiest predications from the soothsayers, astrologers, and the diviners of the Koran, who could have foretold that this grand force, before a week passed over its head, would be hurrying into that same stronghold of Mufuto, with each man's heart in his mouth from fear. The date of our leaving Mufuto for battle with Mirambo was the 3rd of August. All my goods were stored in Mufuto, ready for the march to Ujiji, should we be victorious over the African chief, but at least for safety, whatever befell us. Long before we reached Amanda, I was in my hammock in the paroxysms of a fierce attack of intermittent fever, which did not leave me until late that night. At Umanda, six hours from Mufuto, our warriors bedaubed themselves with the medicine which the wise men had manufactured for them, a compound of matama flour mixed with the juice of a herb, whose virtues were only known to the Wangana of the Winyamwezi. At six a.m. on the 4th of August, we were once more prepared for the road, but before we were marched out of the village, the maneno, or speech, was delivered by the orator of the Winyamwezi. Words, words, words! Listen, sons of Mkasiwa, children of Unyamwezi, the journey is before you, the thieves of the forest are waiting. Yes, they are thieves, they cut up your caravans, they steal your ivory, they murder your women. Behold, the Arabs are with you. Alwali of the Arab Sultan and the white man are with you. Go, the son of Mkasiwa is with you. Fight, kill, take slaves, take cloth, take cattle. Kill, eat, and fill yourselves. Go! A loud wild shout followed this bold harangue. The gates of the village were thrown open, and blue, red, and white-robed soldiers were bounding upwards like so many gymnasts, firing their guns incessantly in order to encourage themselves with noise, or to strike terror into the hearts of those who awaited us within the strong enclosure of Zimbizo, Sultan Kolongo's palace. As Zimbizo was distant only five hours from Amanda, at eleven a.m. we came in view of it. We halted on the verge of the cultivated area around it and its neighbours, within the shadow of the forest. Strict orders had been given by several chiefs to their respective commands not to fire until they were within shooting distance of the boma. Kamis bin Abdullah crept through the forest to the west of the village. The Wani and Wazi took their positions before the main gateway, aided by the forces of Saud, the son of Said, on the right, and the son of Habib on the left. Abdullah, Musud, and myself, and others made ready to attack the eastern gate, which arrangement effectually shut them in, with the exception of the northern side. Suddenly a volley opened on us as we emerged from the forest along the Unyanyembe road, in the direction they had been anticipating the sight of an enemy, and immediately the attacking forces began their firing in most splendid style. There were some ludicrous scenes of men pretending to fire, then jumping off to one side, then forward, then backward, with the agility of hopping frogs, but the battle was none the less in earnest. The breech-loaders of my men swallowed my metallic cartridges much faster than I liked to see, but happily there was a lull in the firing, and we were rushing into the village from the west, the south, the north, through the gates and over the tall palings that surrounded the village, like so many merry andrews, and the poor villagers were flying from the enclosure towards the mountains through the northern gate, pursued by the fleetest runners of our force and pelted in the back by bullets from breech-loaders and shotguns. The village was strongly defended, and not more than twenty dead bodies were found in it, the strong, thick, wooden paling having afforded excellent protection against our bullets. From Zimbizo, after having left a sufficient force within, we sallied out, and in an hour had cleared the neighbourhood of the enemy, 
having captured two other villages which we committed to the flames after gutting them of all valuables. A few tusks of ivory and about fifty slaves, besides an abundance of grain, composed the loot, which fell to the lot of the Arabs. On the fifth, a detachment of Arabs and slaves, seven hundred strong, scoured the surrounding country, and carried fire and devastation up to the boma of William Kuru. On the sixth, Saud bin Said and about twenty other young Arabs led a force of five hundred men against William Kuru itself, where it was supposed Mirambo was living. Another party went out towards the low wooded hills, a short distance north of Zimbizo, near which place they surprised a youthful forest thief asleep whose head they stretched backwards and cut it off as though he were a goat or a sheep. Another party sallied out southward, and defeated a party of Mirambo's bushwhackers, news of which came to our ears at noon. In the morning I had gone to Said bin Salim's tembe, to represent to him how necessary it was to burn the long grass in the forest of Zimbizo, lest it might hide any of the enemy. But soon afterwards I had been struck down with another attack of intermittent fever, and was obliged to turn in and cover myself with blankets to produce perspiration, but not, however, till I had ordered Sean Bombay not to permit any of my men to leave the camp. But I was told soon afterwards by Selim that more than one half had gone to the attack on William Kuru with Saud bin Said. About six p.m. the entire camp of Zimbizo was electrified with the news that all the Arabs who had accompanied Saud bin Said had been killed, and that more than one half of his party had been slain. Some of my own men returned, and from them I learned that Uledi, Grant's former valet, Mabruki Katalabu, killer of his father, Mabruki, the little, Baruti of Usegua, and Ferahan had been killed. I learned also that they had succeeded in capturing William Kuru in a very short time, that Mirambo and his son were there, that as they succeeded in effecting an entrance, Mirambo had collected his men and after leaving the village, had formed an ambush in the grass on each side of the road between Willie and Kuru and Zimbizo, and that as the attacking party were returning home laden with over a hundred tusks of ivory, and sixty bales of cloth, and two or three hundred slaves, Mirambo's men suddenly rose up on each side of them, and stabbed them with their spears. The brave Saud had fired his double-barrelled gun and shot two men, and was in the act of loading again when the spear was launched, which penetrated through and through him. All the other Arabs shared the same fate. This sudden attack from an enemy they believed to be conquered so demoralized the party that, dropping the spoil, each man took to his heels, and after making a wide detour through the woods, returned to Zimbizo to repeat the dolorous tale. The effect of this defeat is indescribable. It was impossible to sleep, from the shrieks of the women whose husbands had fallen. All night they howled their lamentations, and sometimes might be heard the groans of the wounded who had contrived to crawl through the grass unperceived by the enemy. Fugitives were continually coming in throughout the night, but none of my men who were reported to be dead were ever heard of again. The seventh was a day of distrust, sorrow, and retreat. The Arabs accused one another for urging war without expending all peaceful means first. There were stormy councils of war held, wherein were some who proposed to return at once to Unyanyembe and keep within their own houses, and Kamis bin Abdullah raved like an insulted monarch against the abject cowardice of his compatriots. These stormy meetings and propositions to retreat were soon known throughout the camp, and assisted more than anything else to demoralize completely the combined forces of Wenyamwezi and slaves. I sent Bombay to Said bin Salim to advise him not to think of retreat, as it would only be inviting Mirambo to carry the war to Unyanyembe. After dispatching Bombay with this message I fell asleep, but about one thirty p.m. I was awakened by Salim, saying, "'Master, get up! They are all running away, and Kamis bin Abdullah is himself going!' With the aid of Salim I dressed myself, and staggered towards the door. My first view was of Thani bin Abdullah being dragged away, who, when he caught sight of me, shouted out, "'Bana, quick! Mirambo is coming!' He was then turning to run, and putting on his jacket, with his eyes almost starting out of their sockets with terror. Kamis bin Abdullah was also departing, he being the last Arab to leave. Two of my men were following him. These Salim was ordered to force back with a revolver. Shaw was saddling his donkey with my own saddle preparatory to giving me the slip and leaving me in the lurch to the tender mercies of Mirambo. There were only Bombay, Mabruki Speak, Chanda, who was coolly eating his dinner, Mabruk Unyoyembe, Mtamani, Juma, and Samian, only seven out of fifty. All the others had deserted, 
and were by this time far away except Uledi, Manwasera, and Zaidi, whom Selim brought back at the point of a loaded revolver. Selim was then told to saddle my donkey, and Bombay to assist Shaw to saddle his own. In a few moments we were on the road, the men ever looking back for the coming enemy. They belaboured the donkeys to some purpose, for they went at a hard trot which caused me intense pain. I would have gladly lain down to die, but life was sweet, and I had not yet given up all hope of being able to preserve it to the full and final accomplishment of my mission. My mind was actively at work, planning and contriving during the long lonely hours of night, which we employed to reach Mufuto, whither I found the Arabs had retreated. In the night Shaw tumbled off his donkey and would not rise, though implored to do so. As I did not despair myself, so I did not intend that Shaw should despair. He was lifted on his animal, and a man was placed at each side of him to assist him. Thus we rode through the darkness. At midnight we reached Mufuto safely, and were at once admitted into the village, from which we had issued so valiantly, but to which we were now returned so ignominiously. I found all my men had arrived here before dark. Ulemengo, the bold guide who had exulted in his weapons and in our numbers and was so sanguine of victory, had performed the eleven hours' march in six hours. Sturdy Chapare, whom I regarded as the faithfulest of my people, had arrived only half an hour later than Ulemengo, and Frisky Kamizi, the dandy, the orator, the rampant demagogue, yes, he had come third, and Speak's faithfuls had proved as cowardly as any poor nigger of them all. Only Salim was faithful. I asked Salim, "'Why did you not also run away and leave your master to die?' "'Oh, sir,' said the arrow boy naively, "'I was afraid you would whip me.'" End of chapter 8, part 2Chapter 9, Part 1 of How I Found Livingston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Simon. How I Found Livingston. Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa. Including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingston. By Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 9, Part 1. My Life and Troubles in Unyanyembe. Continued. It never occurred to the Arab magnates that I had cause of complaint against them, or that I had a right to feel aggrieved at their conduct, for the base desertion of an ally who had, as a duty to friendship, taken up arms for their sake. Their salams the next morning after the retreat were given as if nothing had transpired to mar the good feeling that had existed between us. They were hardly seated, however, before I began to inform them that as the war was only between them and Mirambo, and that, as I was afraid, if they were accustomed to run away after every little check, that the war might last a much longer time than I could afford to lose, and that as they had deserted their wounded on the field and left their sick friends to take care of themselves, they must not consider me in the light of an alley any more. I am satisfied, said I having seen your mode of fighting, that the war will not be ended in so short a time as you think it will. It took you five years, I hear, to conquer and kill Manwasera. You will certainly not conquer Mirambo in less than a year. Aside, the same war is still raging, April 1874. End of aside. I am a white man, accustomed to wars after a different style. I know something about fighting, but I never saw people run away from an encampment like ours at Zimbizo for such slight cause as you had. By running away, you have invited Mirambo to follow you to Unyanyembe. You may be sure he will come. The Arabs protested one after another that they had not intended to have left me, but the Wanyamezi of Gaziba had shouted out that the Muzungu was gone, and the cry had caused a panic among their people, which it was impossible to allay. Later that day, the Arabs continued their retreat to Tabora, which is twenty-two miles distant from Futo. I determined to proceed more leisurely, and on the second day after the flight from Zimbizo, the expedition, with all the stores and baggage, marched back to Mazangi, and on the third day to Quihara. The following extracts from my diary will serve to show better than anything else my feelings and thoughts about this time, after our disgraceful retreat. Quihara, Friday, 11th August, 1871. Arrived today from Simbili, village of Mombomas. I am quite disappointed and almost disheartened. But I have one consolation. I have done my duty by the Arabs. 
a duty I thought I owed to the kindness they received me with. Now, however, the duty is discharged, and I am free to pursue my own course. I feel happy, for some reasons, that the duty has been paid at such a slight sacrifice. Of course, if I had lost my life in this enterprise, I should have been justly punished." but apart from my duty to the consideration with which the Arabs had received me was the necessity of trying every method of reaching Livingston. This road which the war with Mirambo has closed is only a month's march from this place, and, if the road could be opened with my aid sooner than without it, why should I refuse my aid? The attempt has been made for the second time to Ajuji. Both have failed. I am going to try another route. To attempt to go by the north would be folly." Mirambo's mother and people, and the Wazui, are between me and Ujiji, without including the Watuta, who are his allies and robbers. The southern route seems to be the most practicable one. Very few people know anything of the country south. Those whom I have questioned concerning it speak of want of water, and robber Wazavira as serious obstacles. They also say that the settlements are few and far between. But before I can venture to try this new route, I have to employ a new set of men, as those whom I took to Mfuto consider their engagements at an end, and the fact of five of their number being killed rather damps their ardour for travelling. It is useless to hope that Wanyamwezi can be engaged, because it is against their custom to go with caravans as carriers during wartime. My position is most serious. I have a good excuse for returning to the coast but my conscience will not permit me to do so, after so much money has been expended, and so much confidence has been placed in me. In fact, I feel I must die sooner than return. Saturday, August 12th. My men, as I suppose they would, have gone. They said that I engaged them to go to Ujiji by Marambo's road. I have only thirteen left. With this small body of men, whither can I go? I have over one hundred loads in the storeroom. Livingston's caravan is also here. His goods consist of seventeen bales of cloth, twelve boxes, and six bags of beads. His men are luxuriating upon the best the country affords. If Livingston is at Ujiji, he is now locked up with small means of escape. I may consider myself also locked up at Unyanyembe, and I suppose cannot go to Ujiji until this war with Murambo is settled. Livingston cannot get his goods, for they are here with mine." He cannot return to Zanzibar, and the road to the Nile is blocked up. He might, if he has men and stores, possibly reach Baker by travelling northwards, through Urundi, thence through Rwanda, Caragua, Uganda, Unyoro, and Ubari to Gondokoro. Pagazis he cannot obtain, for the sources whence the supply might be obtained are closed. It is an erroneous supposition to think that Livingston, any more than any other energetic man of his calibre, can travel through Africa without some sort of an escort, and a durable supply of marketable cloth and beads. I was told today by a man that when Livingston was coming from Nyasa Lake towards the Tanganyika, the very time that people thought him murdered, he was met by Said bin Omar's caravan, which was bound for Olamba. He was travelling with Mohammed bin Garab. This Arab, who was coming from Urunga, met Livingston at Chikumbis, or Kwachikumbis, country, and travelled with him afterwards, I hear, to Manuema, or Maniema. Manuema is forty marches from the north of Nyasa. Livingston was walking. He was dressed in American sheeting. He had lost all his cloth in Lake Liemba, while crossing it in a boat. He had three canoes with him. In one he put his cloth, another he loaded with his boxes, and some of his men. Into the third he went himself with two servants and two fishermen. The boat with his cloth was upset. On leaving Nyasa, Livingston went to Ubisa, thence to Uyemba, thence to Urungu. Livingston wore a cap. He had a breech-loading double-barreled rifle with him, which fired fulminating balls. He was also armed with two revolvers. The Wahio, with Livingston, told this man that their master had many men with him at first, but that several had deserted him. August 13th. A caravan came in today from the sea coast. They reported that William L. Farquhar, whom I left sick at Mwapa, Usagara, and his cook, were dead. Farquhar, I was told, died a few days after I had entered Ugogo. His cook died a few weeks later. My first impulse was for revenge. I believed that Lucole had played me false and had poisoned him, 
or that he had been murdered in some other manner. But a personal interview with a Masahili who brought the news, informing me that Farkar had succumbed to his dreadful illness, has done away with that suspicion. So far as I could understand him, Farkar had in the morning declared himself well enough to proceed, but in attempting to rise had fallen backward and died. I was also told that the Wazagara, possessing some superstitious notions respecting the dead, had ordered Jaco to take the body out for burial. That Jaco, not being able to carry it, had dragged the body to the jungle, and there left it naked, without the slightest covering of earth or anything else. "'There's one of us gone, Shaw, my boy. Who will be the next?' I remarked that night to my companion. August 14th. Wrote some letters to Zanzibar. Shaw was taken very ill last night. August 19th. Saturday. My soldiers are employed stringing beads. Shaw is still abed. We hear that Marambo is coming to Unyanyembe. A detachment of Arabs and their slaves have started this morning to possess themselves of the powder left there by the redoubtable Sheikh Said bin Salim, the commander-in-chief of the Arab settlements. August 21st. Monday. Shaw still sick. One hundred fundo of beads have been strung. The Arabs are preparing for another sally against Marambo. The advance of Marambo upon Onyanyembe was denied by Said bin Salim this morning. August 22nd. We were stringing beads this morning when, about 10 a.m., we heard a continued firing from the direction of Tabora. Rushing out from our work to the front door, facing Tabora, we heard considerable volleying and scattered firing, plainly. And ascending to the top of my tembe, I saw with my glasses the smoke of the guns. Some of my men, who were sent on to ascertain the cause, came running back with the information that Marambo had attacked Tabora with over two thousand men, and that a force of over one thousand Watuta, who had allied themselves with him for the sake of plunder, had come suddenly upon Tabora, attacking from opposite directions. Later in the day, or about noon, watching the low saddle over which we could see Tabora, we saw it crowded with fugitives from that settlement, who were rushing to our settlement at Kuhara for protection. From these people we heard the sad information that the noble Kabis bin Abdullah, his little protégé Kamis, Mohammed bin Abdullah, Ibrahim bin Rashid, and Saif, the son of Ali, the son of Shaikh, the son of Nazib, had been slain. When I inquired into the details of the attack, and the manner of the death of these Arabs, I was told that after the first firing which warned the inhabitants of Tabora that the enemy was upon them, Kamis bin Abdullah and some of the principal Arabs who happened to be with him had ascended to the roof of his tembe, and with his spy-glass he had looked towards the direction of the firing. To his great astonishment he saw the plain around Tabora filled with approaching savages, and about two miles off, near Kazima, a tent pitched, which he knew to belong to Marambo, from its having been presented to that chief by the Arabs of Tabora when they were on good terms with him. Kamis bin Abdullah descended to his house, saying, "'Let us go to meet him. Arm yourselves, my friends, and come with me.' His friends advised him strongly not to go out of his tembe, for so long as each Arab kept to his tembe they were more than a match for the Ruga Ruga and the Watuta together. But Kamis broke out impatiently with, "'Would you advise us to stop in our tembes for fear of this mshenti?" Pagan? Who goes with me? His little protege, Kamis, son of a dead friend, asked to be allowed to be his gun bearer. Mohammed bin Abdullah, Ibrahim bin Rashid, and Saif the son of Ali, young Arabs of good families, who were proud to live with the noble Kamis, also offered to go with him. After hastily arming eighty of his slaves, contrary to the advice of his prudent friends, he sallied out and was soon face to face with his cunning and determined enemy, Marambo. This chief, upon seeing the Arabs advance towards him, gave orders to retreat slowly. Kamis, deceived by this, rushed on with his friends after them. Suddenly, Marambo ordered his men to advance upon them in a body, and at the sight of the precipitate rush upon their party, Kamis's slaves incontinently took to their heels, never even deigning to cast a glance behind them, leaving their master to the fate which was now overtaking him. The savages surrounded the five Arabs, and though several of them fell before the Arabs' fire, continued to shoot at the little party, until Kamis bin Abdullah received a bullet in the leg, which brought him to his knees, and, for the first time, to the knowledge that his slaves had deserted him. Though wounded, 
the brave man continued shooting, but he soon afterwards received a bullet through the heart. Little Camise, upon seeing his adopted father's fall, exclaimed, "'My father Camise is dead. I will die with him,' and continued fighting until he received, shortly after, his death wound. In a few minutes there was not one Arab left alive. Late at night some more particulars arrived of this tragic scene. I was told by people who saw the bodies that the body of Kamis bin Abdullah, who was a fine, noble, brave, portly man, was found with the skin of his forehead, the beard and skin of the lower part of his face, the forepart of the nose, the fat over the stomach and abdomen, and lastly a bit from each heel cut off by the savage allies of Mirambo. And in the same condition were found the bodies of his adopted son and fallen friends. The flesh and skin thus taken from the bodies was taken, of course, by the waganga or medicine men, to make what they deemed to be the most powerful potion of all to enable men to be strong against their enemies. This potion is mixed up with their ugali and rice, and is taken in this manner with the most perfect confidence in its efficacy, as an invulnerable protection against bullets and missiles of all descriptions. It was a most sorry scene to witness from our excited settlement at Quihara almost the whole of Tabor in flames, and to see the hundreds of people crowding into Quihara. Perceiving that my people were willing to stand by me, I made preparations for defence by boring loopholes for muskets into the stout clay walls of my tembe. They were made so quickly, and seemed so admirably adapted for the efficient defence of the tembe, that my men got quite brave, and Wangwana refugees with guns in their hands, driven out of Tabora, asked to be admitted into our tembe to assist in its defence. Livingston's men were also collected, and invited to help defend their master's goods against Mirambo's supposed attack. By night I had one hundred and fifty armed men in my courtyard, stationed at every possible point where an attack might be expected. Tomorrow Mirambo has threatened that he will come to Kuhara. I hope he will come, and if he comes within range of an American rifle, I shall see what virtue lies in American lead. August 23rd. We have passed a very anxious day in the valley of Quihara. Our eyes were constantly directed towards unfortunate Tabora. It has been said that three tembes only have stood the brunt of the attack. Abid bin Suleiman's house has been destroyed, and over two hundred tusks of ivory that belong to him have become the property of the African Bonaparte. My tembe is in as efficient a state of defence as its style and means of defence will allow. Rifle pits surround the house outside, and all native huts that obstructed the view have been torn down, and all trees and shrubs which might serve as a shelter for any one of the enemy have been cut. Provisions and water enough for six days have been brought. I have ammunition enough to last two weeks. The walls are three feet thick and there are apartments within apartments, so that a desperate body of men could fight until the last room had been taken. The Arabs, my neighbours, endeavoured to seem brave, but it is evident they are about despairing. I have heard it rumoured that the Arabs of Quihara, if Tabora is taken, will start en masse for the coast, and give the country up to Mirambo. If such are their intentions, and they are really carried into effect, I shall be in a pretty mess." However, if they do leave me, Mirambo will not reap any benefit from my stores, nor from Livingston's either, for I shall burn the whole house, and everything in it. August 24th The American flag is still waving above my house, and the Arabs are still in Unyanyembe. About 10 a.m. a messenger came from Tabora, asking us if we were not going to assist them against Mirambo. I felt very much like going out to help them, but, after debating long upon the pros and cons of it, asking myself, was it prudent? Ought I to go? What will become of the people if I were killed? Will they not desert me again? What was the fate of Kamis bin Abdullah? I sent word that I would not go, that they ought to feel perfectly at home in their tembers against such a force as Mirambo had, that I should be glad if they could induce him to come to Quihara, in which case I would try and pick him off. They say that Mirambo and his principal officer carry umbrellas over their heads, that he himself has long hair, like a Mnyamwesi Pagasi, and a beard. If he comes, all the men carrying umbrellas will have bullets rained on them in the hope that one lucky bullet may hit him. 
according to popular ideas i should make a silver bullet but i have no silver with me i might make a gold one about noon i went over to see sheikh bin nasib leaving about one hundred men inside the house to guard it while i was absent this old fellow is quite a philosopher in his way i should call him a professor of minor philosophy he is generally so sententious fond of aphorisms and a very deliberate character i was astonished to find him so despairing his aphorisms have deserted him his philosophy has not been able to stand against disaster he listened to me more like a moribund than one possessing all the means of defence and offence i loaded his two-pounder with ball and grape and small slugs of iron and advised him not to fire it until Marambo's people were at his gates. About 4 p.m. I heard that Marambo had deported himself to Kazima, a place northwest of Tabora, a couple of miles. August 26th. The Arabs sallied out this morning to attack Kazima, but refrained, because Marambo asked for a day's grace to eat the beef he had stolen from them. He has asked them impudently to come to-morrow morning, at which time he says he will give them plenty of fighting. Quihara is once more restored to a peaceful aspect, and fugitives no longer throng its narrow limits in fear and despair. End of chapter 9, part 1chapter 9, part 2 of How I Found Livingston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Simon. How I Found Livingston. Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingston. By Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 9, Part 2. My Life and Troubles in Union Yembe. Continued. August 27th. Mirambo retreated during the night, and when the Arabs went in force to attack his village of Kazima, they found it vacant. The Arabs hold councils of war nowadays, battle meetings of which they seem to be very fond, but extremely slow to act upon. They were about to make friends with the northern Watuta, but Mirambo was ahead of them. They had talked of invading Mirambo's territory the second time, but Mirambo invaded Unanyembe with fire and sword, bringing death to many a household, and he has slain the noblest of them all. The Arabs spend their hours in talking and arguing, while the Ujiji and Karagwa roads are more firmly closed than ever. Indeed, many of the influential Arabs are talking of returning to Zanzibar, saying, Unanyembe is ruined. Meanwhile, with poor success, however, perceiving the impossibility of procuring Wanyamwezi pagazis, I am hiring the Wangwana renegades living in Unyanyembe to proceed with me to Ujiji, at treble prices. Each man is offered thirty doti, ordinary hire of a carrier being only from five to ten doti to Ujiji. I want fifty men. I intend to leave about sixty or seventy loads here under charge of a guard. I shall leave all personal baggage behind, except one small portmanteau. August 28th. No news today of Mirambo. Shaw is getting strong again. Sheikh bin Nasib called on me today, but, except on minor philosophy, he had nothing to say. I have determined, after a study of the country, to lead a flying caravan to Ujiji, by a southern road through northern Ukonongo and Ukabendi. Sheikh bin Nasib has been informed tonight of this determination. August 29th. Shaw got up today for a little work. Alas, all my fine-spun plans of proceeding by boat over the Victoria Nyanza, thence down the Nile, have been totally demolished, I fear, through this war with Marambo, this black Bonaparte. Two months have been wasted here already. The Arabs take such a long time to come to a conclusion. Advice is plentiful, and words are as numerous as the blades of grass in our valley. All that is wanting is decision." The Arab's hope and stay is dead. Kamis bin Abdullah is no more. Where are the other warriors of whom the Wangwana and Manyamwezi bards sing? Where is mighty Kisesa, great Abdullah bin Nasib? Where is Said, the son of Majid? Kisesa is in Zanzibar, and Said, the son of Majid, is in Ujiji, as yet ignorant that his son has fallen in the forest of Buyankur. Shaw is improving fast. 
I am unsuccessful as yet in procuring soldiers. I almost despair of ever being able to move from here. It is such a drowsy, sleepy, slow, dreaming country. Arabs, Wangwana, Wanyamwezi are all alike, all careless how time flies. Their tomorrow means sometimes within a month. To me it is simply maddening. August 30th. Shaw will not work. I cannot get him to stir himself. I have petted him and coaxed him. I have even cooked little luxuries for him myself. And, while I am straining every nerve to get ready for Ujiji, Shaw is satisfied with looking on listlessly. What a change from the ready-handed bold man he was at Zanzibar! I sat down by his side to-day with my palm and needle in order to encourage him, and to-day, for the first time, I told him of the real nature of my mission. I told him that I did not care about the geography of the country half as much as I cared about finding Livingston. I told him, for the first time, Now, my dear Shaw, you think probably that I have been sent here to find the death of the Tanganyika. Not a bit of it, man. I was told to find Livingston. It is to find Livingston I am here. It is to find Livingston I am going. Don't you see, old fellow, the importance of the mission? Don't you see what reward you will get from Mr. Bennett if you will help me? I am sure if ever you come to New York you will never be in want of a fifty-dollar bill. So shake yourself, jump about, look lively. Say you will not die. That is half the battle. Snap your fingers at the fever. I will guarantee the fever won't kill you. I have medicine enough for a regiment here. His eyes lit up a little, but the light that shone in them shortly faded and died. I was quite disheartened. I made some strong punch to put fire in his veins that I might see life in him. I put sugar and eggs and seasoned it with lemon and spice. Drink, Shaw, said I, and forget your infirmities. You are not sick, dear fellow. It is only ennui you are feeling. Look at Selim here. Now, I will bet any amount that he will not die, that I will carry him home safe to his friends. I will carry you home also, if you will let me. September 1st. According to Tani bin Abdullah, whom I visited at his temba in Mauroro, Marambo lost two hundred men in the attack upon Tabora, while the Arabs' losses were five Arabs, thirteen freemen and eight slaves, besides three tembes and over one hundred small huts burned, two hundred and eighty ivory tusks, and sixty cows and bullocks captured. September 3rd. Received a packet of letters and newspapers from Captain Webb at Zanzibar. What a good thing it is that one's friends, even in far America, think of the absent one in Africa. They tell me that no one dreams of my being in Africa yet. I applied to Sheikh bin Nasib today to permit Livingston's caravan to go under my charge to Ujiji, but he would not listen to it. He says he feels certain I am going to my death. September 4th. Shaw is quite well today, he says. Salim is down with the fever. My force is gradually increasing, though some of my old soldiers are falling off. Umgareza is blind. Baruti has the smallpox very badly. Sadala has the intermittent. September 5th. Baruti died this morning. He was one of my best soldiers, and was one of those men who accompanied Speak to Egypt. Baruti is number seven of those who have died since leaving Zanzibar. Today my ears have been poisoned with the reports of the Arabs about the state of the country I am about to travel through. The roads are bad. They are all stopped. The Rugarua are out in the forests. The Wakonongo are coming from the south to help Marambo. The Washenzi are at war, one tribe against another. My men are getting dispirited. They have imbibed the fears of the Arabs and the Wanyamwezi. Bombay begins to feel that I had better go back to the coast and try again some other time. We buried Baruti under the shade of the banyan tree, a few yards west of my tembe. The grave was made four and a half feet deep and three feet wide. At the bottom, on one side, a narrow trench was excavated, into which the body was rolled on his side, with his face turned towards Mecca. The body was dressed in a dhoti and a half of new American sheeting. After it was placed properly in its narrow bed, a sloping roof of sticks, covered over with matting and old canvas, was made to prevent the earth from falling over the body. The grave was then filled, the soldiers laughing merrily. On the top of the grave was planted a small shrub and into a small hole made with the hand was poured water, lest he might feel thirsty, they said, on his way to paradise. Water was then sprinkled all over the grave, and the gourd broken. This ceremony being ended, the men recited the Arabic fatah, 
after which they left the grave of that dead comrade to think no more of him. September 7th. An Arab named Mohammed presented me today with a little boy's slave called Dugu Mahali, my brother's wealth. As I did not like the name, I called the chiefs of my caravan together and asked them to give him a better name. One suggested Simba, a lion. Another said he thought Gombe, a cow, would suit the boy child. Another thought he ought to be called Marambo, which raised a loud laugh. Bombe thought Bombe Mdogo would suit my black-skinned infant very well. Ulimengo, however, after looking at his quick eyes and noting his celerity of movement, pronounced the name Kalula as the best for him. Because, said he, just look at his eyes, so bright. Look at his form, so slim. Watch his movements, how quick. Yes, Kalulu is his name. Yes, Bana, said the others, let it be Kalulu. Kalulu is a Kizawahili term for the young of the blue buck, per Pusilla antelope. Well then, said I, water being brought in a huge tin pan. Selim, who was willing to stand godfather, holding him over the water, let his name henceforth be Kalulu, and let no man take it from him. And thus it was that the little black boy of Mohammed's came to be called Kalulu. The expedition is increasing in numbers. We had quite an alarm before dark. Much firing was heard at Tabora, which led us to anticipate an attack on Quihara. It turned out, however, to be a salute fired in honour of the arrival of Sultan Kitambi to pay a visit to Kaziwa, Sultan of Unyanyembe. September 8th. Towards night, Sheikh bin Nasib received a letter from an Arab at Nfuto, reporting that an attack was made on that place by Mirambo and his Watuta allies. It also warned him to bid the people of Kuhara hold themselves in readiness, because if Mirambo succeeded in storming Mfuto, he would march direct on Kuhara. September 9th. Mirambo was defeated with severe loss yesterday in his attack upon Mfuto. He was successful in an assault he made upon a small Wanyamwezi village, but when he attempted to storm Mfuto, he was repulsed with severe loss, losing three of his principal men. Upon withdrawing his forces from the attack, the inhabitants sallied out and followed him to the forest of Umanda, where he was again utterly routed, himself ingloriously flying from the field. The heads of his chief men slain in the attack were brought to Kwikuru the boma of Mkaziwa. September 14th. The Arab boy Selim is delirious from constant fever. Shaw is sick again. These two occupy most of my time. I am turned into a regular nurse, for I have no one to assist me in attending upon them. If I try to instruct Abdul Kader in the art of being useful, his head is so befogged with the villainous fumes of Unyamwezi tobacco that he wanders bewildered about, breaking dishes and upsetting cooked dainties until I get so exasperated that my peace of mind is broken completely for a full hour. If I ask Faraji, my now formally constituted cook, to assist, his thick wooden head fails to receive an idea, and I am thus obliged to play the part of chef de cuisine. September 15th The third month of my residence in Unyanyembe is almost finished, and I am still here but I hope to be gone before the twenty-third instant. All last night, until nine a.m. this morning, my soldiers danced and sang to the names of their dead comrades, whose bones now bleach in the forests of Wuliankuru. Two or three huge pots of pombe failed to satisfy the raging thirst which the vigorous exercise they were engaged in created. So, early this morning, I was called upon to contribute a shuka for another potful of the potent liquor. Today I was busy selecting the loads for each soldier and pagasi. In order to lighten their labor as much as possible, I reduced each load from seventy pounds to fifty pounds, by which I hope to be enabled to make some long marches. I have been able to engage ten pagasis during the last two or three days. I have two or three men still very sick, and it is almost useless to expect that they will be able to carry anything but I am in hopes that other men may be engaged to take their places before the actual day of departure, which now seems to be drawing near rapidly. September 16th. We have almost finished our work. On the fifth day from this, God willing, we shall march. I engaged two more pagazis besides two guides, named Asmani and Mabruki. 
if vastness of the human form could terrify any one certainly osmani's appearance is well calculated to produce that effect he stands considerably over six feet without shoes and has shoulders broad enough for two ordinary men to-morrow i mean to give the people a farewell feast to celebrate our departure from this forbidding and unhappy country september seventeenth the banquet is ended i slaughtered two bullocks and had a barbecue three sheep two goats and fifteen chickens one hundred and twenty pounds of rice twenty large loaves of bread made of indian corn flour one hundred eggs ten pounds of butter and five gallons of sweet milk were the contents of which the banquet was formed the men invited their friends and neighbors and about one hundred women and children partook of it after the banquet was ended the pombe or native beer was brought in in five gallon pots and the people commenced their dance which continues even now as i write september nineteenth i had a slight attack of fever to-day which has postponed our departure selim and shaw are both recovered about eight p m sheikh bin nasib came to me imploring me not to go away to-morrow because i was so sick tani sagburi suggested to me that i might stay another month in answer i told them that white men are not accustomed to break their words i had said i would go and i intended to go sheikh bin nasib gave up all hope of inducing me to remain another day and he has gone away with a promise to write to said Burkash to tell him how obstinate i am and that i am determined to be killed this was a parting shot about ten p m the fever had gone all were asleep in the tembe but myself and an unutterable loneliness came on me as i reflected on my position and my intentions and felt the utter lack of sympathy with me in all around it requires more nerve than i possess to dispel all the dark presentiments that come upon the mind but probably what i call presentiments are simply the impress on the mind of the warnings which these false-hearted arabs have repeated so often this melancholy and loneliness i feel may probably have their origin from the same cause the single candle which barely lights up the dark shade that fills the corners of my room is but a poor incentive to cheerfulness i feel as though i were imprisoned between stone walls but why should i feel as if baited by these stupid slow-witted arabs and their warnings and croakings i fancy a suspicion haunts my mind as i write that there lies some motive behind all this i wonder if these arabs tell me all these things to keep me here in the hope that i might be induced another time to assist them in their war with Marambo. if they think so they are much mistaken for i have taken a solemn enduring oath an oath to be kept while the least hope of life remains in me not to be tempted to break the resolution i have formed never to give up the search until i find livingstone alive or find his dead body and never to return home without the strongest possible proofs that he is alive or that he is dead no living man or living man shall stop me only death can prevent me but death not even this i shall not die i will not die i cannot die and something tells me i do not know what it is perhaps it is the ever-living hopefulness of my own nature perhaps it is the natural presumption born out of an abundant and glowing vitality or the outcome of an overweening confidence in oneself anyhow and everyhow something tells me to-night i shall find him and write it larger find him find him even the words are inspiring i feel more happy have i uttered a prayer i shall sleep calmly to-night i have felt myself compelled to copy out of my diary the above notes as they explain written as they are on the spot the vicissitudes of my life at unanyembe to me they appear to explain far better than any amount of descriptive writing even of the most graphic the nature of the life i led there they are unexaggerated in their literality precisely as i conceived them at the time they happened they speak of fevers without number to myself and men they relate our dangers and little joys our annoyances and our pleasures as they occurred end of chapter nine part two chapter ten part one of how i found livingstone this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone, Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa by Sir Henry M. Stanley Chapter 10, Part 1 To Morera Ukonongo The 20th of September had arrived. This was the day I had decided to cut loose from those who tormented me with their doubts, their fears, and beliefs, and commence the march to Ujiji by a southern route. I was very weak from the fever that had attacked me the day before, and it was a most injudicious act to commence a march under such circumstances. But I had boasted to Sheikh bin Nasib that a white man never breaks his word, and my reputation as a white man would have been ruined had I stayed behind or postponed the march in consequence of feebleness. I mustered the entire caravan outside the tembe. Our flags and streamers were unfurled. The men had their loads resting on the walls. There was considerable shouting and laughing and negroidal fanfaronade. The Arabs had collected from curiosity's sake to see us off, all except Sheikh bin Nasib, whom I had offended by my asin in opposition to his wishes. The old sheikh took to his bed, but sent his son to bear me a last morsel of philosophic sentimentality, which I was to treasure up as the last words of the patriarchal sheikh, the son of Nasib, the son of Ali, the son of Saif. Poor sheikh! If thou hadst only known what was at the bottom of this stubbornness, this ass-like determination to proceed the wrong way, what wouldst thou then have said, O Sheikh? But the Sheikh comforted himself with the thought that I might know what I was about better than he did, which is most likely. Only neither he nor any other Arab will ever know exactly the motive that induced me to march at all westward, when the road to the east was ever so much easier. My braves whom I had enlisted for a rapid march somewhere out of Unyanyembe were named as follows. John William Shaw, London, England. Selim Heshmi, Arab. Sidim Barak Mombe, Zanzibar. Mabruki Spoke, Ditto. Ulemengo, Ditto. Ambari, Ditto. Uledi, Ditto. Asmani, Ditto. Samian, Ditto. Kamna, Ditto. Zaidi, Ditto. Kamisi, Ditto. Chopera, Bagamoyo. Kingaru, Ditto. Balali, Ditto. Ferus Unyanyembe, Rojab Bagamoya, Mabruk Unyanyembe, Unyanyembe, Mtamani, Ditto, Chanda, Mororo, Sadala, Zanzibar, Kombo, Ditto, Sabori the Great, Mororo, Sabori the Little, Ditto, Marora, Ditto, Faraji, the Cook, Zanzibar, Mabruk Salim, Zanzibar, Baraka, ditto. Ibrahim, Maroro. Mabruk Ferris, ditto. Baruti, Bagamoyo. Ngareza, Zanzibar. Hamadi, the guide, ditto. Asmani, ditto, ditto. Mabruk, ditto, ditto. Hamdala, the guide, Tabora. Juma, Zanzibar. Maganga, Mkwenkwe. Mukadum, Tabora. Dasturi, ditto. Tumayona, Ujiji. Mparamoto, Ujiji. Wakiri, ditto. Mufu, ditto. Mpepo, ditto. Kapingu, Ujiji. Mashishanga, ditto. Muharuka, ditto. Misosi, ditto. Tufumbia, ditto. Majwara, boy, Uganda. Belali, boy, Uemba. Kalulu, boy, Lunda. Abdul Kader, Taylor, Malabar. These are the men and boys whom I had chosen to be my companions on the apparently useless mission of seeking for the lost traveller David Livingstone. The goods with which I had burdened them consisted of a thousand doti, or four thousand yards of cloth, six bags of beads, four loads of ammunition, one tent, one bed and clothes, one box of medicine, sextant and books, two loads of tea, coffee and sugar, one load of flour and candles, one load of canned meats, sardines, and miscellaneous necessaries, and one load of cooking utensils. The men were all in their places except Bombay. 
Bombay had gone. He could not be found. I dispatched a man to hunt him up. He was found weeping in the arms of his Delilah. Why did you go away, Bombay, when you knew I intended to go and was waiting? Oh, master, I was saying good-bye to my missus. Oh, indeed. Yes, master, you know I do it when you go away. Silence, sir. Oh, all right. What is the matter with you, Bombay? Oh, nothing. As I saw he was in a humour to pick a quarrel with me before those Arabs who had congregated outside of Metembe to witness my departure, and as I was not in a humour to be balked by anything that might turn up, the consequence was that I was obliged to thrash Bombay, an operation which soon cooled his hot choler, but brought down on my head a loud chorus of remonstrances from my pretended Arab friends. Now, master, don't, don't, stop it, master, the poor man knows better than you what he and you may expect on the road you are now taking. If anything was better calculated to put me in a rage than Bombay's insolence before a crowd, it was this gratuitous interference with what I considered my own especial business. But I restrained myself, though I told them in a loud voice that I did not choose to be interfered with unless they wished to quarrel with me. No, no, Banner, they all exclaimed. We do not wish to quarrel with you. In the name of God, go on your way in peace. Fare you well, then, said I shaking hands with them. Farewell, master, farewell. We wish you, we are sure, all success, and God be with you and guide you. March! A parting salute was fired. The flags were raised up by the guides. Each pagazi rushed for his load, and in a short time, with songs and shouts, the head of the expedition had filed round the western end of Mytembe, along the road to Uganda. Now, Mr. Shaw, I am waiting, sir. Mount your donkey if you cannot walk. Please, Mr. Stanley, I am afraid I cannot go. Why? I don't know, I am sure. I feel very weak. So am I weak. It was but late last night, as you know, that the fever left me. Don't back out before these Arabs. Remember you are a white man. Here, Salim, Mabruki, Bombay. Help Mr. Shaw on his donkey and walk by him. Oh, Ban, Bana, said the Arabs, don't take him. Do you not see he is sick? You keep away. Nothing will prevent me from taking him. He shall go. Go on, Bombay. The last of my party had gone. The Tembe, so lately a busy scene, had already assumed a naked, desolate appearance. I turned towards the Arabs, lifted my hat, and said again, Farewell, then faced about for the south, followed by my four young gun-bearers, Salim, Kalulu, Majwara, and Belali. After half an hour's march the scenery became more animated. Shaw began to be amused. Bombay had forgotten our quarrel, and assured me if I could pass Mirambo's country I should catch the Tanganyika. Mabruki Burton also believed we should. Selim was glad to leave Unyanyembe, where he had suffered so much from fever, and there was a something in the bold aspect of the hills which cropped upward, above fair valleys, that enlivened and encouraged me to proceed. In an hour and a half we arrived at our camp in the Kinyamwezi village of Mkwenkwe, the birthplace of our famous Chanta Maganga. My tent was pitched, the goods were stored in one of the tembes, but one half the men had returned to Guihara, to take one more embrace of their wives and concubines. Towards night I was attacked once again with the intermittent fever. Before morning it had departed, leaving me terribly prostrated with weakness. I had heard the men conversing with each other over their campfires upon the probable prospects of the next day. It was a question with them whether I should continue the march. Mostly all were of the opinion that since the master was sick there would be no march. A superlative obstinacy, however, impelled me on, merely to spite their supine souls. But when I sallied out of my tent to call them to get ready, I found that at least twenty were missing, and Livingstone's letter-carrier, Kayif Halak, or How Do You Do, had not arrived with Dr. Livingstone's letter-bag. Selecting twenty of the strongest and faithfulest men, 
I dispatched them back to Unyanyembe in search of the missing men, and Selim was sent to Sheikh bin Nasib to borrow or buy a long slave chain. Towards night my twenty detectives returned with nine of the missing men. The Wajiji had deserted in a body, and they could not be found. Selim also returned with a strong chain, capable of imprisoning within the collars attached to it at least ten men. Kaif Halek also appeared, with the letter-bag which he was to convey to Livingstone under my escort. The men were then addressed, and the slave-chain exhibited to them. I told them that I was the first white man who had taken a slave-chain with him on his travels, but as they were all so frightened of accompanying me, I was obliged to make use of it, as it was the only means of keeping them together. The good need never fear being chained by me, only the deserters, the thieves who received their hire and presents, guns and ammunition, and then ran away. I would not put any one this time in chains, but whoever deserted after this day I should halt and not continue the march till I found him, after which he should march to Ujiji with the slave chain round his neck. Do you hear? Yes, was the answer. Do you understand? Yes. We broke up camp at 6 p.m., and took the road for Inasuka, at which place we arrived at 8 p.m. When we were about commencing the march the next morning, it was discovered that two more had deserted. Baraka and Bombay were at once dispatched to Unyanyembe to bring back the two missing men, Asmani and Kingaru, with orders not to return without them. This was the third time that the latter had deserted, as the reader may remember. While the pursuit was being effected, we halted at the village of Inasuka, more for the sake of shore than any one else. In the evening, the incorrigible deserters were brought back, and as I had threatened, were well flogged and chained, to secure them against further temptation. Bombay and Baraka had a picturesque story to relate of the capture, and as I was in an exceedingly good humour, their services were rewarded with a fine cloth each. On the following morning another carrier had absconded, taking with him his hire of fifteen new cloths and a gun, but to halt anywhere near Nyanyembe any longer was a danger that could be avoided only by travelling without stoppages towards the southern jungle lands. It will be remembered that I had in my train the redoubtable Abdul Kader the tailor, he who had started from Bagamoyo with such bright anticipations of the wealth of ivory to be obtained in the great interior of Africa. On this morning, daunted by the reports of the dangers ahead, Abdul Kader craved to be discharged. He vowed he was sick and unable to proceed any further. As I was pretty well tired of him, I paid him off in cloth, and permitted him to go. About halfway to Kasagera, Mabruk Salim was suddenly taken sick. I treated him with a grain of calomel and a couple of ounces of brandy. As he was unable to walk, I furnished him with a donkey. Another man named Zaidi was ill with a rheumatic fever, and Shaw tumbled twice off the animal he was riding, and required an infinite amount of coaxing to mount again. Verily my expedition was pursued by adverse fortunes, and it seemed as if the fates had determined upon our return. It really appeared as if everything was going to wreck and ruin. If I were only fifteen days from Unyanyembe, thought I, I should be saved. Casagero was a scene of rejoicing the afternoon and evening of our arrival. Absentees had just returned from the coast, and the youths were brave in their gaudy bedizenment. Their new basatis, their suharis, and long cloths of bright new kaniki, with which they had adorned themselves behind some bush before they had suddenly appeared dressed in all this finery. The women high hide like maenads, and the lulu looing was loud, frequent, and fervent the whole of that afternoon. Sylph-like damsels looked up to the youthful heroes with intensest admiration on their features. Old women coddled and fondled them. Staff-using, stooping-backed patriarchs blessed them. This is fame in Unyamwezi. All the fortunate youths had to use their tongues until the wee hours of next morning had arrived, relating all the wonders they had seen near the great sea, and in the Anguja, the island of Zanzibar. 
of how they saw great white men's ships and numbers of white men, of their perils and trials during their journey through the land of the fierce Wagogo, and diverse other facts with which the reader and I are by this time well acquainted. On the twenty-fourth we struck camp, and marched through a forest of Mbiti wood in a south-south-west direction, and in about three hours came to Kigandu. On arriving before this village, which is governed by a daughter of Mkasiwa, we were informed we could not enter unless we paid toll. As we would not pay toll, we were compelled to camp in a ruined, rat-infested boma, situated a mile to the left of Kigandu, being well scolded by the cowardly natives for deserting Mkasiwa in his hour of extremity. We were accused of running away from the war. Almost on the threshold of our camp, Shaw, in endeavouring to dismount, lost his stirrups and fell prone on his face. The foolish fellow actually laid on the ground in the hot sun a full hour, and when I coldly asked him if he did not feel rather uncomfortable, he sat up and wept like a child. "'Do you wish to go back, Mr. Shaw?' "'If you please. I do not believe I can go any further, and if you would only be kind enough I should like to return very much.' "'Well, Mr. Shaw, I have come to the conclusion that it is best you should return. My patience is worn out. I have endeavoured faithfully to lift you above these petty miseries which you nourish so devotedly. You are simply suffering from hypochondria. You imagine yourself sick, and nothing evidently will persuade you that you are not. Mark my words. To return to Unyanyembe is to die. Should you happen to fall sick in Quihara, who knows how to administer medicine to you? Supposing you are delirious, how can any of the soldiers know what you want, or what is beneficial and necessary for you? Once again, I repeat, if you return, you die. Oh, dear me, I wish I had ever ventured to come. I thought life in Africa was so different from this. I would rather go back, if you will permit me. The next day was a halt, and arrangements were made for the transportation of Shaw back to Quihara. A strong litter was made, and four stout pagazis were hired at Kigandu to carry him. Bread was baked, a canteen filled with cold tea, and a leg of a kid was roasted for his sustenance while on the road. The night before we parted we spent together. Shaw played some tunes on an accordion which I had purchased for him at Zanzibar, but though it was only a miserable ten-dollar affair, I thought the homely tunes evoked from the instrument that night were divine melodies. The last tune played before retiring was Home Sweet Home. The morning of the twenty-seventh we were all up early. There was considerable viz in our movements. A long, long march lay before us that day, but then I was to leave behind all the sick and ailing. Only those who were healthy and could march fast and long were to accompany me. Babruk Salim I left in charge of a native doctor, who was to medicate him for a gift of cloth which I gave him in advance. The horn sounded to get ready. Shaw was lifted in his litter on the shoulders of his carriers. My men formed two ranks, the flags were lifted, and between these two living rows and under those bright streamers, which were to float over the waters of the Tanganyika before he should see them again, Shaw was borne away towards the north while we filed off to the south with quicker and more elastic steps as if we felt an incubus had been taken from us. We ascended a ridge bristling with cyanide boulders of massive size, appearing above a forest of dwarf trees. The view which we saw was similar to that we had often seen elsewhere, an illimitable forest stretching in grand waves far beyond the ken of vision. Ridges, forest-clad, rising gently one above another until they receded in the dim purple-blue distance, with a warm haze floating above them, which, though clear enough in our neighbourhood, became impenetrably blue in the far distance. Woods, 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 leafy branches, foliage globes or parachutes, green, brown or sear in colour, forests one above another, rising, falling and receding, a very leafy ocean, the horizon at all points presents the same view. There may be an indistinct outline of a hill far away, 
or here and there a tall tree higher than the rest, conspicuous in its outlines against the translucent sky. With this exception it is the same. The same clear sky dropping into the depths of the forest, the same outlines, the same forest, the same horizon, day after day, week after week. We hurry to the summit of a ridge, expectant of a change, but the wearied eyes, after wandering over the vast expanse, return to the immediate surroundings satiated with the ever-sameness of such scenes. Carlyle, somewhere in his writings, says that though the Vatican is great, it is but the chip of an eggshell compared to the star-fretted dome where Arcturus and Orion glance forever. And I say that though the grove of Central Park, New York, is grand compared to the thin groves seen in other cities, that though the Windsor and the New Forests may be very fine and noble in England, yet they are but faggots of sticks compared to these eternal forests of Unyamwezi. We marched three hours, and then halted for refreshments. I perceived that the people were very tired, not yet inured to a series of long marches, or rather not in proper trim for earnest hard work after our long rest in Quihara. When we resumed our march again there were several manifestations of bad temper and weariness, but a few good-natured remarks about their laziness put them on their mettle, and we reached Uganda at 2 p.m. after another four-hour spurt. Uganda is a very large village in the district of Uganda, which adjoins the southern frontier of Onyanyembe. The village probably numbers four hundred families, or two thousand souls. It is well protected by a tall and strong palisade of three-inch timber. Stages have been erected at intervals above the palisades, with miniature embrasures in the timber for the muskets of the sharpshooters who take refuge within these box-like stages to pick out the chiefs of an attacking force. An inner ditch, with the sand or soil thrown up three or four feet high against the palings, serves as protection for the main body of the defenders, who kneel in the ditch and are thus enabled to withstand a very large force. For a mile or two outside the village all obstructions are cleared, and the besieged are thus warned by sharp-eyed watchers to be prepared for the defence before the enemy approaches within musket range. Mirambo withdrew his force of robbers from before this strongly defended village after two or three ineffectual attempts to storm it, and the Waganda have been congratulating themselves ever since upon having driven away the boldest marauder that Unyamwezi has seen for generations. The Waganda have about three thousand acres under cultivation around their principal village, and this area suffices to produce sufficient grain not only for their own consumption, but also for the many caravans which pass this way for Ufipa and Marungu. However brave the Waganda may be within the strong enclosure with which they have surrounded their principal village, they are not exempt from the feeling of insecurity which fills the soul of a Munyamwezi during wartime. At this place the caravans are accustomed to recruit their numbers from the swarms of pagazis who volunteer to accompany them to the distant ivory regions south, but I could not induce a soul to follow me, so great was their fear of Mirambo and his Rugaraga. They were also full of rumours of wars ahead. It was asserted that Mbogo was advancing towards Uganda with a thousand Wakonongo, that the Wazavira had attacked a caravan four months previously, that Simba was scouring the country with a band of ferocious mercenaries, and much more of the same nature and to the same intent. End of chapter 10, part 1《ハウ・アイ・ファウンド・リヴィングストン》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ハウ・アイ・ファウンド・リヴィングストン》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Simon.《ハウ・アイ・ファウンド・リヴィングストン》《Travels, Adventures and Discoveries in Central Africa, including four months' residence with Dr. Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley.》Chapter 10, Part 2. To Marera, Okonongo. On the 28th we arrived at a small snug village, embosomed within the forest called Benta, three hours and a quarter from Ugunda. The road led through the cornfields of the Wagunda, and then entered the clearings around the villages of Kisari, 
within one of which we found the proprietor of a caravan who was drumming up carriers for Ufipa. He had been halted here two months, and he made strenuous exertions to induce my men to join his caravan, a proceeding that did not tend to promote harmony between us. A few days afterwards I found, on my return, that he had given up the idea of proceeding south. Leaving Kisari, we marched through a thin jungle of blackjack, over sun-cracked ground, with here and there a dried-up pool, the bottom of which was well tramped by elephant and rhinoceros. Buffalo and zebra tracks were now frequent, and we were buoyed up with the hope that before long we should meet game. Benta was well supplied with Indian corn and a grain which the natives called choroco, which I take to be vetches. I purchased a large supply of choroco for my own personal use, as I found it to be a most healthy food. The corn was stored on the flat roofs of the tembes in huge boxes made out of the bark of the mtundu tree. The largest box I have ever seen in Africa was seen here. It might be taken for a titan's hat box. It was seven feet in diameter and ten feet in height. On the twenty-ninth, after travelling in a southwest by south direction, we reached Kikuru. The march lasted for five hours over sun-cracked plains, growing the blackjack and ebony and dwarf shrubs, above which numerous ant hills of light chalky-coloured earth appeared like sand dunes. The Mukunguru, a Kisawahili term for fever, is frequent in this region of extensive forests and flat plains, owing to the imperfect drainage provided by nature for them. In the dry season there is nothing very offensive in the view of the country. The burnt grass gives rather a sombre aspect to the country, covered with the hard-baked tracks of animals which haunt these plains during the latter part of the rainy season. In the forest numbers of trees lie about in the last stages of decay, and working away with might and main on the prostrate trunks may be seen numberless insects of various species. Impalpably, however, the poison of the dead and decaying vegetation is inhaled into the system with a result sometimes as fatal as that which is said to arise from the vicinity of the upas tree. The first evil results experienced from the presence of malaria are confined bowels and an oppressive languor, excessive drowsiness, and a constant disposition to yawn. The tongue assumes a yellowish, sickly hue, coloured almost to blackness. Even the teeth become yellow, and are coated with an offensive matter. The eyes of the patient sparkle lustrously, and become suffused with water. These are sure symptoms of the incipient fever, which shortly will rage through the system. Sometimes this fever is preceded by a violent shaking fit, during which period blankets may be heaped on the patient's form, with but little amelioration of the deadly chill he feels. It is then succeeded by an unusually severe headache, with excessive pains about the loins and spinal column, which presently will spread over the shoulder blades, and, running up the neck, find a final lodgment in the back and front of the head. Usually, however, the fever is not preceded by a chill, but after languor and torpitude have seized him, with excessive heat and throbbing temples, the loin and spinal column ache, and raging thirst soon possesses him. The brain becomes crowded with strange fancies, which sometimes assume most hideous shapes. Before the darkened vision of the suffering man float in a seething atmosphere figures of created and uncreated reptiles, which are metamorphosed every instant into stranger shapes and designs, growing every moment more confused, more complicated, more hideous and terrible. Unable to bear longer the distracting scene, he makes an effort and opens his eyes, and dissolves the delirious dream, only, however, to glide again unconsciously into another dreamland, where another unreal inferno is dioramically revealed, and new agonies suffered. Oh, the many, many hours that I have groaned under the terrible incubi which the fits of real delirium evoke! Oh, the racking anguish of body that a traveller in Africa must undergo! Oh, the spite, the fretfulness, the vexation which the horrible phantasmagoria of diabolisms induce! The utmost patience fails to appease, the most industrious attendance fails to gratify, the deepest humility displeases. During these terrible transitions, which induce fierce distraction, Job himself would become irritable, insanely furious, and choleric. A man in such a state regards himself as the focus of all miseries. When recovered, he feels chastened, becomes urbane and ludicrously amiable. 
he conjures up fictitious delights from all things which but yesterday possessed for him such awful portentous aspects his men he regards with love and friendship whatever is trite he views with ecstasy nature appears charming in the dead woods and monotonous forest his mind becomes overwhelmed with delight i speak for myself as a careful analysation of the attack in all its severe plaintive and silly faces appear to me i used to amuse myself with taking notes of the humorous and the terrible the fantastic and exaggerated pictures that were presented to me even while suffering the paroxysms induced by fever we arrived at a large pool known as the ziwani after a four hours march in a south southwest direction the first of october we discovered an old half-burnt kambi sheltered by a magnificent kuyu sycamore the giant of the forests of unyamwezi which after an hour we transformed into a splendid camp if i recollect rightly the stem of the tree measured thirty-eight feet in circumference it is the finest tree of its kind i have seen in africa a regiment might with perfect ease have reposed under this enormous dome of foliage during a noon halt the diameter of the shadow it cast on the ground was one hundred and twenty feet the healthful vigour that i was enjoying about this time enabled me to regard my surroundings admiringly a feeling of comfort and perfect contentment took possession of me such as i knew not while fretting at unyamyembe wearing my life away in inactivity i talked with my people as to my friends and equals we argued with each other about our prospects in quite a companionable sociable vein when daylight was dying and the sun was sinking down rapidly over the western horizon vividly painting the sky with the colours of gold and silver saffron and opal when its rays and gorgeous tints were reflected upon the tops of the everlasting forest with the quiet and holy calm of heaven resting upon all around and infusing even into the untutored minds of those about me the exquisite enjoyments of such a life as we were now leading in the depths of the great expanse of forest the only and sole human occupants of it this was the time after our day's work was ended and the camp was in a state of perfect security when we all would produce our pipes and could best enjoy the labours which we had performed and the contentment which follows a work well done outside nothing is heard beyond the cry of a stray florican or guinea fowl which has lost her mate or the hoarse croaking of the frogs in the pool hard by or the song of the crickets which seems to lull the day to rest inside our camp are heard the gurgles of the gourd pipes as the men inhale the blue ether which i also love i am contented and happy stretched on my carpet under the dome of living foliage smoking my short meerschaum indulging in thoughts despite the beauty of the still grey light of the sky and of the air of serenity which prevails around of home and friends in distant america and these thoughts soon change to my work yet incomplete to the man who to me is yet a myth who for all i know may be dead or may be near or far from me tramping through just such a forest whose tops i see bound the view outside my camp we are both on the same soil perhaps in the same forest who knows yet is he to me so far removed that he might as well be in his own little cottage of ulva though i am even now ignorant of his very existence yet i feel a certain complacency a certain satisfaction which would be difficult to describe why is man so feeble and weak that he must tramp tramp hundreds of miles to satisfy the doubts his impatient and uncurbed mind feels why cannot my form accompany the bold flights of my mind and satisfy the craving i feel to resolve the vexed question that ever rises to my lips is he alive o oh, soul of mine be patient thou hast a felicitous tranquillity which other men might envy thee sufficient for the hour is the consciousness thou hast that thy mission is a holy one onward and be hopeful monday the second of october found us traversing the forest and plain that extends from the zivani to manyara which occupied us six and a half hours the sun was intensely hot but the matundu and miombo trees grew at intervals just enough to admit free growth to each tree while the blended foliage formed a grateful shade the path was clear and easy 
the tamped and firm red soil offered no obstructions. The only provocation we suffered was from the attacks of the tsetse, or panga, swart fly, which swarmed here. We knew we were approaching an extensive habitat of game, and we were constantly on the alert for any specimens that might be inhabiting these forests. While we were striding onward at the rate of nearly three miles an hour, the caravan, I perceived, sheared off from the road, resuming it about fifty yards ahead of something on the road, to which the attention of the men was directed. On coming up, I found the object to be the dead body of a man, who had fallen a victim to that fearful scourge of Africa, the smallpox. He was one of Oseto's gang of marauders, or guerrillas, in the service of Kaziwa of Unyanyembe, who were hunting these forests for the guerrillas of Mirambo. They had been returning from Ukonongo from a raid they had instituted against the Sultan of Mbogo, and they had left their comrade to perish in the road. He had apparently been only one day dead. Apropos of this, it was a frequent thing with us to discover a skeleton or a skull on the roadside. Almost every day we saw one, sometimes two, of these relics of dead and forgotten humanity. Shortly after this we emerged from the forest and entered a mbuka, or plain, in which we saw a couple of giraffes, whose long necks were seen towering above a bush they had been nibbling at. This sight was greeted with a shout, for we now knew we had entered the game country, and that near the Gombe Creek, or river, where we intended to halt, we should see plenty of these animals. A walk of three hours over this hot plain brought us to the cultivated fields of Manyara. Arriving before the village gate, we were forbidden to enter, as the country was throughout in a state of war, and it behoved them to be very careful of admitting any party, lest the villagers might be compromised. We were, however, directed to a kambi to the right of the village, near some pools of clear water, where we discovered some half-dozen ruined huts, which looked very uncomfortable to tired people. After we'd built our camp, the Kerangosi was furnished with some clothes to purchase food from the village, for the transit of a wilderness in front of us, which was said to extend nine marches, or one hundred and thirty-five miles. He was informed that the Metemi had strictly prohibited his people from selling any grain whatever. This evidently was a case where in the exercise of a little diplomacy, he was informed that the Metemi had strictly prohibited his people from selling any grain whatever. This evidently was a case where in the exercise of a little diplomacy could only be effective. Because it would detain us several days here if we were compelled to send men back to Kikuro for provisions. Opening a bale of choice goods, I selected two royal cloths and told Bombay to carry them to him, with the compliments and friendship of the white man. The sultan sulkily refused them, and bade him return to the white man and tell him not to bother him. Entreaties were of no avail, he would not relent, and the men, in exceedingly bad temper and hungry, were obliged to go to bed supperless. The words of Njara, a slave trader, and parasite of the great Sheikh bin Nasib, recurred to me. Ah, master, master, you will find the people will be too much for you, and that you will have to return. The Wamanyara are bad, the Wakonongo are very bad, the Vazavira are the worst of all. You have come to this country at a bad time, it is war everywhere. And, indeed, judging from the tenor of the conversations around our campfires, it seemed but too evident. There was every prospect of a general decamp of all my people. However, I told them not to be discouraged, that I would get food for them in the morning. The bale of choice cloths was opened again next morning, and four royal cloths were this time selected, and two dotis of Merikani, and Bombay was again dispatched, burdened with compliments and polite words. It was necessary to be very politic with a man who was so surly and too powerful to make an enemy of. What if he made up his mind to imitate the redoubtable Mirambo, king of Uyoe? The effect of my munificent liberality was soon seen in the abundance of provender which came to my camp. Before an hour went by, there came boxes full of choroco, beans, rice, matama or dura, and Indian corn carried on the heads of a dozen villagers, and shortly after the Metemi himself came, followed by about thirty musketeers and twenty spearmen, to visit the first white man ever seen on this road. Behind these warriors came a liberal gift, 
fully equal in value to that sent to him, of several large gourds of honey, fowls, goats, and enough vetches and beans to supply my men with four days' food. I met the chief at the gate of my camp, and bowing profoundly, invited him to my tent, which I had arranged as well as my circumstances would permit, for this reception. My Persian carpet and bearskin were spread out, and a broad piece of brand-new crimson cloth covered my kitanda, or bedstead. The chief, a tall, robust man, and his chieftains, were invited to seat themselves. They cast a look of such gratified surprise at myself, at my face, my clothes, and guns, as is almost impossible to describe. They looked at me intently for a few seconds, and then at each other, which ended in an uncontrollable burst of laughter, and a repeated snappings of the fingers. They spoke the Kinyamwezi language, and my interpreter Maganga was requested to inform the chief of the great delight I felt in seeing them. After a short period expended in interchanging compliments, and a competitive excellence at laughing at one another, their chief desired me to show him my guns. The sixteenth shooter, the Winchester rifle, elicited a thousand flattering observations from the excited man, and the tiny deadly revolvers, whose beauty and workmanship they thought were superhuman, evoked such gratified eloquence that I was fain to try something else. The double-barreled guns, fired with heavy charges of power, caused them to jump up in affected alarm, and then to subside into their seats, convulsed with laughter. As the enthusiasm of my guests increased, they seized each other's index fingers, screwed them, and pulled at them, until I feared they would end in their dislocation. After having explained to them the difference between white men and Arabs, I pulled out my medicine chest, which evoked another burst of rapturous sighs at the cunning neatness of the array of vials. He asked what they meant. Doa, I replied sententiously, a word which may be interpreted medicine. Oh, oh, they murmured admiringly. I succeeded, before long, in winning unqualified admiration, and my superiority, compared to the best of the Arabs they had seen, was but too evident. Doa, doa, they added. Here, said I, uncorking a vial of medicinal brandy, is the Kusungo Pombe, white man's beer. Take a spoonful and try it, at the same time handing it. Acht, acht, oh acht, what, eh, what strong beer the white men have, oh, my throat burns. Ah, but it's good, said I. A little of it makes men feel strong and good, but too much of it makes men bad and they die. Let me have some, said one of the chiefs, and me, and me, and me, as soon as each had tasted. I next produced a bottle of concentrated ammonia, which, as I explained, was for snake bites and headaches. The sultan immediately complained he had a headache and must have a little. Telling him to close his eyes, I suddenly uncorked the bottle and presented it to his majesty's nose. The effect was magical, for he fell back as if shot, and such contortions as his features underwent are indescribable. His chiefs roared with laughter, and clapped their hands, pinched each other, snapped their fingers, and committed many other ludicrous things. I verily believe, if such a scene were presented on any stage in the world, the effect of it would be visible instantaneously on the audience, that had they seen it as I saw it, they would have laughed themselves to hysteria and madness. Finally the sultan recovered himself, great tears rolling down his cheeks, and his features quivering with laughter. Then he slowly uttered the word, Kali, hot, strong, quick, or ardent medicine. He required no more, but the other chiefs pushed forward to get one wee sniff, which they no sooner had than all went into paroxysms of uncontrollable laughter. The entire morning was passed in this state visit, to the mutual satisfaction of all concerned. Oh, said the sultan at parting, these white men know everything. The Arabs are dirt compared to them. That night, Hamdallah, one of the guides, deserted, carrying with him his hire, twenty-seven doti, and a gun. It was useless to follow him in the morning, as it would have detained me many more days than I could afford, but I mentally vowed that Mr. Hamdallah should work out those twenty-seven doti of cloths before I reached the coast. End of chapter 10, part 2
Chapter Ten, Part Three of How I Found Livingston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beth Ann. How I Found Livingston: Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa, Including Four Months' Residence with Dr. Livingston. By Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter Ten, Part Three. To Mrera, Yukonongo. Wednesday, October fourth, saw us traveling to the Gombe River, which is four hours fifteen minutes march from Manyara. We had barely left the waving cornfields of my friend Mamanyara before we came in sight of a herd of noble zebra. Two hours afterwards we had entered a grand and noble expanse of parkland, whose glorious magnificence and vastness of prospect, with a far-stretching carpet of verdure, darkly flecked here and there by miniature clumps of jungle, with spreading trees growing here and there, was certainly one of the finest scenes to be seen in Africa, added to which, as I surmounted one of the numerous small knolls, I saw herds after herds of buffalo and zebra, giraffe and antelope, which sent the blood coursing through my veins in the excitement of the moment, as when I first landed on African soil. We crept along the plain noiselessly to our camp on the banks of the sluggish waters of the Gombe. Here at last was the hunter's paradise. How petty and insignificant appeared my hunts after small antelope and wild boar, what a foolish waste of energies those long walks through damp grasses and through thorny jungles! Did I not well remember my first bitter experience in African jungles, when in the maritime region? But this! Where is the nobleman's park that can match this scene? Here is a soft, velvety expanse of young grass, grateful shade under those spreading clumps, herds of large and varied game, browsing within easy rifle range. Surely I must feel amply compensated now for the long southern detour I have made when such a prospect as this opens to view. No thorny jungles and rank-smelling swamps are here to daunt the hunter and to sicken his aspirations after true sport. No hunter could aspire after a nobler field to display his prowess. Having settled the position of the camp, which overlooked one of the pools found in the depression of the Gombe Creek, I took my double-barreled smooth-bore and sauntered off to the parkland. Emerging from behind a clump, three fine, plump springbok were seen browsing on the young grass, just within one hundred yards. I knelt down and fired. One unfortunate antelope bounded upward instinctively and fell dead. Its companion sprang high into the air, taking leaps about twelve feet in length as if they were quadrupeds practicing gymnastics, and away they vanished, rising up like India rubber balls, until a knoll hid them from view. My success was held with loud shouts by the soldiers, who came running out from the camp as soon as they heard the reverberation of the gun, and my gun-bearer had his knife at the beast's throat, uttering a fervent bismillah as he almost severed the head from the body. Hunters were now directed to proceed east and north to procure meat, because in each caravan it generally happens that there are fundi, whose special trade it is to hunt for meat for the camp. Some of these are experts in stalking, but often find themselves in dangerous positions, owing to the near approach necessary, before they can fire their most inaccurate weapons with any certainty. After luncheon, consisting of springbok steak, hot corn cake, and a cup of delicious mocha coffee, I strolled towards the southwest, accompanied by Kalulu and Majwara, two boy gun bearers. The tiny purpusilla started up like rabbits from me as I stole along through the underbrush. The honey bird hopped from tree to tree, chirping its call as if it thought I was seeking the little sweet treasure, the hiding place of which it only knew. But no, I neither desired purposilla nor the honey. 
I was on the search for something great this day. Keen-eyed fish-eagles and bustards poised on trees above the sinuous gombe thought, and probably with good reason, that I was after them, judging by the ready flight with which both species disappeared as they sighted my approach. Ah, no, nothing but hartebeest, zebra, giraffe, eland, and buffalo this day. After following the Gombe's course for about a mile, delighting my eyes with long looks at the broad and lengthy reaches of water to which I was so long a stranger, I came upon a scene which delighted the innermost recesses of my soul. Five, six, seven, eight, ten zebras, switching their beautiful striped bodies, and biting one another, within about one hundred and fifty yards. The scene was so pretty, so romantic, never did I so thoroughly realize that I was in Central Africa. I felt momentarily proud that I owned such a vast domain, inhabited with such noble beasts. Here I possessed, within reach of a leaden ball, any one I chose of those beautiful animals, the pride of the African forests. It was at my option to shoot any of them. Mine they were, without money or without price. Yet, knowing this, twice I dropped my rifle, loath to wound the royal beasts. But, crack! And a royal one was on his back, battling the air with his legs. Ah, it was such a pity! But hasten, draw the keen, sharp-edged knife across the beautiful stripes which fold around the throat. And, what an ugly gash! It is done, and I have a superb animal at my feet. Hurrah! I shall taste of Yukonongo zebra tonight. I thought a springbok and zebra enough for one day's sport, especially after a long march. The Gombe, a large stretch of deep water, winding in and out of green groves, calm, placid, with lotus leaves lightly resting on its surface. All pretty, picturesque peaceful as a summer stream, looked very inviting for a bath. I sought out the most shady spot under a wide-spreading mimosa, from which the ground sloped smooth as a lawn to the still, clear water. I ventured to undress, and had already stepped into my ankles in the water, and had brought my hands together for a glorious dive, when my attention was attracted by an enormously long body which shot into view occupying the spot beneath the surface which I was about to explore by a header. Great heavens, it was a crocodile! I sprang backward instinctively, and this proved my salvation, for the monster turned away with the most disappointed look, and I was left to congratulate myself upon my narrow escape from his jaws, and to register a vow never to be tempted again by the treacherous calm of an African river. As soon as I had dressed, I turned away from the now repulsive aspect of the stream. In strolling through the jungle, towards my camp, I detected the forms of two natives looking sharply about them, and, after bidding my young attendants to preserve perfect quiet, I crept on towards them and, by the aid of a thick clump of underbrush, managed to arrive within a few feet of the natives, undetected. Their mere presence in the immense forest, unexplained, was a cause of uneasiness in the then disturbed state of the country, and my intention was to show myself suddenly to them and note its effect, which, if it betokened anything hostile to the expedition, could without difficulty be settled at once with the aid of my double-barreled smooth-bore. As I arrived on one side of this bush, the two suspicious-looking natives arrived on the other side, and we were separated by only a few feet. I made a bound, and we were face to face. The natives cast a glance at the sudden figure of a white man, and seemed petrified for a moment. But then, recovering themselves, they shrieked out, Bana Bana, you don't know us. We are Wakonongo who came to your camp to accompany you to Mrera, and we are looking for honey. Oh, to be sure you are the Wakanongo. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, it is all right now. I thought you might be Rugaruga. So the two parties, instead of being on hostile terms with each other, burst out laughing. 
The Wakonongo enjoyed it very much, and laughed heartily as they proceeded on their way to search for the wild honey. On a piece of bark they carried a little fire, with which they smoked the bees out from their nests in the great matunda trees. The adventures of the day were over. The azure sky had changed to a dead grey. The moon was appearing just over the trees. The water of the Gombe was like a silver belt. Hoarse frogs bellowed their notes loudly by the margin of the creek. The fish eagles uttered their dirge-like cries as they were perched high on the tallest trees. Elands snorted their warning to the herds in the forest. Stealthy forms of the carnivore stole through the dark woods outside of our camp. Within the high enclosure of bush and thorn, which we had raised about our camp, all was jollity, laughter, and radiant, genial comfort. Around every campfire dark forms of men were seen squatted. One man gnawed at a luscious bone, another sucked the rich marrow in a zebra leg bone. Another turned the stick, garnished with huge kebabs, to the bright blaze. Another held a large rib over the flame. There were others, busy stirring industriously, great black potfuls of yugali, and watching anxiously the meat simmering, and the soup bubbling, while the firelight flickered and danced bravely, and cast a bright glow over the naked forms of the men and gave a crimson tinge to the tall tent that rose in the center of the camp, like a temple to some mysterious god. The fires cast their reflections upon the massive arms of the trees as they branched over our camp, and, in the dark gloom of their foliage, the most fantastic shadows were visible. Altogether it was a wild, romantic, and impressive scene, but little wrecked my men for shadows and moonlight, for crimson tints and temple-like tints. They were all busy relating their various experiences and gorging themselves with the rich meats our guns had obtained for us. One was telling how he had stalked a wild boar, and the furious onset the wounded animal made on him, causing him to drop his gun and climb a tree, and the terrible grunt of the beast he well remembered, and the whole welkin rang with the peals of laughter which his mimic powers evoked. Another had shot a buffalo calf, and another had bagged a hartebeest. The Wokonongo related their laughable recounter with me in the woods, and were lavish in their description of the stores of honey to be found in the woods. And all this time Selim and his youthful subs were trying their sharp teeth on the meat of a young pig, which one of the hunters had shot, but which nobody else would eat because of the Mohammedan aversion to pig which they had acquired during their transformation from negro savagery to the useful docility of the Zanzibar freedman. We halted the two following days and made frequent raids on the herds of this fine country. The first day I was fairly successful again in the sport. I bagged a couple of antelopes, a kudu, a streptocereus, with fine twisting horns, and a polybuck, a milemphus a reddish-brown animal standing about three and a half feet with broad posteriors. I might have succeeded in getting dozens of animals had I any of those accurate, heavy rifles manufactured by Lancaster, Riley, or Blissard, whose every shot tells. But my weapons, save my light smoothbore, were unfit for African game. My weapons were more for men. With the Winchester rifle and the Star's carbine, I was able to hit anything within two hundred yards, but the animals, though wounded, invariably managed to escape the knife, until I was disgusted with the pea bullets. What is wanted for this country is a heavy bore. Number ten or twelve is the real bone crusher. That will drop every animal shot in its tracks, by which all fatigue and disappointment are avoided. Several times during these two days was I disappointed after most laborious stalking and creeping along the ground. Once I came suddenly upon Eland while I had a Winchester rifle in my hand, the Eland and myself mutually astonished, at not more than twenty-five yards apart. I fired at its chest, and bullet, true to its aim, sped far into the eternal parts, and the blood spouted from the wound. In a few minutes he was far away and I was too much disappointed to follow him. 
All love of the chase seemed to be dying away before these several mishaps. What were two antelopes for one day's sport to the thousands that browsed over the plain? The animals taken to camp during our three days' sport were two buffaloes, two wild boar, three hartebeest, one zebra, and one pala, besides which were shot eight guinea fowls, three florican, two fish eagles, one pelican, and one of the men caught a couple of large silurus fish. In the meantime the people had cut, sliced, and dried this bounteous store of meat for our transit through the long wilderness before us. Saturday, the 7th of October, we broke up camp, to the great regret of the meat-loving, gourmandizing Wangwana. They delegated Bombay early in the morning to speak to me, and entreat of me to stop one day longer. It was ever the case, they had always an unconquerable aversion to work when in the presence of meat. Bombay was well scolded for bearing any such request to me after two days' rest, during which time they had been filled to repletion with meat, and Bombay was by no means in the best humor. Flesh pots full of meat were far more to his taste than a constant tramping and its consequent fatigues. I saw his face settle into sulky ugliness, and his great nether lip hanging down limp, which meant, as if expressed in so many words, Well, get them to move yourself, you wicked hard man. I shall not help you. An ominous silence followed my order to the Kirangozi to sound the horn, and the usual singing and chanting were not heard. The men turned sullenly to their bells, and Asmani, the gigantic guide, Arfundi, was heard grumblingly to say he was sorry he had engaged to guide me to the Tanganyika. However, they started, though reluctantly. I stayed behind with my gun-bearers to drive the stragglers on. In about half an hour I sighted the caravan at a dead stop, with the bells thrown on the ground, and the men standing in groups conversing angrily and excitedly. Taking my double-barreled gun from Selim's shoulder, I selected a dozen charges of buckshot, and slipping two of them into the barrels, and adjusting my revolvers in order for handy work, I walked on towards them. I noticed that the men seized their guns as I advanced. When within thirty yards of the groups, I discovered the heads of two men appear above an ant hill on my left, with the barrels of their guns carelessly pointed toward the road. I halted, threw the barrel of my gun into the hollow with the left hand, and then, taking a deliberate aim at them, threatened to blow their heads off if they did not come forward to talk to me. These two men were gigantic Asmani and his sworn companion Mabruki the guides of Sheikh bin Nasib. As it was dangerous not to comply with such an order, they presently came, but, keeping my eye on Asmani, I saw him move his fingers to the trigger of his gun, and bring his gun to a ready. Again I lifted my gun, and threatened him with instant death if he did not drop his gun. Asmani came on, in a sidelong way, with a smirking smile, on his face, but in his eyes shone the lurid light of murder as plainly as ever it shone in a villain's eyes. Mabruki sneaked to my rear, deliberately putting powder in the pan of his musket, but sweeping the gun sharply around, I planted the muzzle of it at about two feet from his wicked-looking face, and ordered him to drop his gun instantly. He let it fall from his hand quickly, and giving him a vigorous poke in the breast with my gun, which sent him reeling away a few feet from me, I faced round to Asmani, and ordered him to put his gun down, accompanying it with nervous movement of my gun, pressing gently on the trigger at the same time. Never was a man nearer his death than was Asmani during those few moments. I was reluctant to shed his blood, and I was willing to try all possible means of avoiding doing so. But if I did not succeed in cowing this ruffian, authority was at an end. The truth was, they feared to proceed further on the road, and the only possible way of inducing them to move was by an overpowering force, an exercise of my power and will in this instance, even though he might pay the penalty of his disobedience with his death. 
as I was beginning to feel that Asmani had passed his last moment on earth, as he was lifting his gun to his shoulder, a form came up from behind him, and swept his gun aside with an impatient, nervous movement, and I heard Mabruki Burton say in horror-struck accents, "'Man, how dare you point your gun at the master?' Mabruki then threw himself at my feet, and endeavoured to kiss them, and entreated me not to punish him. "'It was all over now,' he said. "'There will be no more quarrelling. They will go as far as the Tanganyika, without any more noise, and inshallah, said he, we shall find the old Masunga at Ujiji. Speak, men, freedmen, shall we not? Shall we not go to the Tanganyika without any more trouble? Tell the master with one voice. Aiwala, Aiwala, Banayango, Hamuno, Maneno, Magini, which literally translated means, Yes, by God, yes, by God, my master, there are no other words, said each man loudly. "'Ask the master's pardon, man, or go thy way,' said Mabruki peremptorily to Asmani, which Asmani did, to the gratification of us all. It remained only for me to extend a general pardon to all except to Bombay and Ambari, the instigators of the mutiny, which was now happily quelled. For Bombay could have, by a word, as my captain, nipped all manifestation of bad temper at the outset, had he been so disposed. But no, Bombay was more averse to marching than the cowardliest of his fellows, not because he was cowardly, but because he loved indolence. Again the word was given to march, and each man, with astonishing alacrity, seized his load and filed off quickly out of sight. End of chapter 10, part 3